Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. I remind senators that this that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. A call. What? Oh, sorry, I missed a sentence. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? President, there are committees of lodge proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I call the clerk. Private senators' bills ordered the day number 19, offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment, fight for Australia's coastline bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Wishwilson. Thank you, uh, President. I'm very pleased to rise today and introduce the debate on this private member's bill, fighting for Australia's coastlines. PEP 11, petroleum exploration license 11. It's become a bit of a political enigma, something unprecedented in our political discourse and history. There is only one fossil fuel project I can name that both the federal, Labor and Liberal government have publicly opposed and strongly opposed. PEP 11, an oil and gas exploration project off the coast of New South Wales from Newcastle to Sydney. Why did our current Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, in November 2021, as opposition leader and Prime Minister in waiting, so emphatically and clearly say, a Labor government that I lead will rule out PEP 11? He stood with surfers, clubbies, and the community posing for photos with Stop PEP 11 t-shirts. In the lead-up to the last federal election, Anthony Albanese told voters, PEP 11 doesn't make sense from an economic, environmental or energy perspective, and even reiterated to parliament that the project should be consigned to the dustbin of history where it belongs. This is a complete no-brainer. The minister should just do his job and say no to this proposal. And then our Prime Minister at the time, Scott Morrison, stood with a number of federal election candidates on the beaches of Terrigal and also came out and strongly opposed the project. The project will not proceed on our watch, the Prime Minister said. From Newcastle through to Wollongong, my government has listened to the concerns of local members and candidates and their communities and we are putting our foot down. His candidates, all five federal election candidates, also commented, Mr Trent Zimmerman, there are few things more important than protecting our marine environment, and this is why PEP 11 has engendered such a strong reaction from the community. 
It's a right call, and I know it will be a relief for those who have been campaigning so hard against this project. Mr Dave Sharma also uh, notably said, Sydney's offshore oceans and future generations will thank us for this decision today. Mr Jason Falinski, also no longer in our parliament. I can assure all those who live along our pristine coastline that they will continue to be protected under this government for this generation and the next. And lastly, Lucy Wicks, I will not support anything that could harm our waterways and precious marine life. Yes, they said these words, uh, and the Greens completely agreed with it. And then, uh, Deputy President, again, something unprecedented and extraordinary occurred. Never before seen in our political history, we discovered that our ex-PM assigned himself secret ministries and used these powers. And as far as we're aware, the only, the only time he used these powers to override his resources minister, Mr Keith Pitt, and he killed PEP 11, or so we thought. Now, it was ironic, I suppose, from my point of view and from many people's points of view, that the Prime Minister used, at the time used such a dodgy process to do the right thing by the planet. But there you have it. So all this begs the question today. Why did both our current and ex-Prime Ministers so eagerly oppose and kill PEP 11? Was it because they cared, as their candidates so openly said, about the risks that seismic testing and oil and gas drilling pose to our oceans, coastlines and communities? I'd like to believe that was the case. I really would. But given their complete lack of concern shown towards other risky oil and gas exploration projects elsewhere around our nation, off our coastlines, I'm not so sure. And I'll address that point again in a minute. So, yeah, you guessed it. It was most likely driven by political motives, votes, not losing votes or seats, and of course, retaining power and winning government. Well, that didn't work too well for the LNP and most of those candidates who stood on the beach at Terrigal. Underlying this strong political current, of course, is a simple fact that these risky projects, especially in a time of climate emergency, are deeply unpopular. And the opposition to more fossil fuel exploration off our coastlines is politically salient. That is the message that we need to listen to here. There's a reason our ex-Prime Minister went to such extraordinary lengths to kill this project and why our current Prime Minister was first out of the blocks to publicly and emphatically oppose an oil and gas drilling project off our coastlines. Now, at this point, it's important to congratulate the community and other stakeholders who campaigned so hard and so long to stop PEP 11, who brought this risky project to such political prominence, particularly the, the Surf Rider Foundation, Save Our Coasts, Surfers for Climate, the Wilderness Society and many, many others. I thank you for raising the profile, uh, not just of PEP 11, but the profile of oil and gas drilling off our coastlines right around this nation. Without them, this sorry saga would never have hit the media or land here in Canberra on planet politics. Just a few weeks ago, we found out that PEP 11, although buried, was not dead or cremated. It's back. And yesterday in the House, our Prime Minister was asked by my excellent colleague Libby Watson-Brown to reaffirm his commitment to killing this project. He didn't. He seemingly—well, not seemingly, it was pretty obvious to me watching the video—his patronising and arrogant response to my colleague that it's up to the law to decide makes a mockery of his strong opposition and election promise to kill this project. 
There was plenty of ifs and buts there, but hey, that's not what he promised. Why did our Prime Minister make such a clear and strong pre-election statement if he was going to fall back on it being a matter of law and procedure? That was out of his hands. Did he overstep in his assessment and is now walking this back? Did he mislead the Australian people and New South Wales communities? Was he naive or poorly briefed? Does he perhaps all have it in hand, but just doesn't have the time or care enough to explain this to my colleague, the House, the communities that he stood up for and the Australian people? None of these excuses are good enough. The community wants answers. Our advice is the Albanese government can make the decision to stop this project any time, legally. That's what the New South Wales Liberal government is publicly telegraphing to. And unlike our Prime Minister, they aren't faffing about. We've all noticed. Today the Greens want to make it clear and make it even easier for our Prime Minister and his government to stop PEP 11 once and for all. This bill, the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, fighting for Australia's coastlines, if passed, would make this current and any future PEP 11 proposal illegal, in perpetuity. So even if we do stop this project, that doesn't mean in the future we can't have another proposal brought back. And we've all noticed the ferocious appetite that oil and gas companies have for finding more of the product that, when we burn it, is killing our planet. So, given that both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party so publicly and emphatically opposed PEP 11, they should vote for this bill. And of course, if they meant what they said, and I am prepared, I'm not cynical enough after 11 years in this place to not be prepared to give you the benefit of the doubt that you did mean what you said as political parties on those beaches in northern New South Wales about protecting coastlines, beaches and community from the risk of oil and gas exploration off our coasts. And that you would be happy, if you meant that, to apply this bill to the precious marine habitats off the coast of King Island in Tasmania or off the Twelve Apostles off the Otway basins. The Schlumberger TGS oil and gas exploration project plan for the Southern Ocean, for example, will be one of the biggest in our nation's history—7.7 .7 million hectares of ocean they're about to go and blast with seismic testing, hoping to find another northwest shelf-sized gas deposit off the coastlines of Tasmania and Victoria, threatening southern right whales, blue, humpback, blue whales and humpback whales, not to mention the commercial fisheries in and around that area. Not only with the risk of oil spills, but with the seismic testing that this Senate has looked at in comprehensive detail and all the risks that it brings to marine habitats. Already fishers in Lake Entrance in Victoria have suffered a reduction in whiting catches of 99 per cent after seismic testing. The same area reported a reduction of flathead catches of 71 per cent. Similarly, in Bass Strait, following a seismic survey in 2010, scallop fishers reported huge losses in catch, with the industry attributing a loss of 24,000 tonnes worth $70 million to the Tasmanian fishing community directly due to the impact of seismic testing. This bill will stop that. So I ask you again today, if it's good enough for New South Wales, surely it's complete hypocrisy to have double standards for other parts of our magnificent nation. Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia, Western Australia. If we meant what we said on those beaches in New South Wales, then we must understand that other communities around this country feel just as strongly about oil and gas projects off their coastlines. And to finish off, it's plain and simple insanity to keep exploring for the exact same product, 
knowing full well that when we burn it, that it is directly killing our oceans, as we have been lucky enough to know them in our lifetime. It's got to stop. The science tells us clearly we must leave all new fossil fuels in the ground and transition as rapidly as possible to clean energy. That's what the Conservative International Energy Agency told us in 2022. That's the year that all new fossil fuel projects must stay in the ground if we can have any chance of meeting our warming targets of one and a half degrees. And senators, we already know Australia's warmed one and a half degrees uh, on pre-industrial levels. CSIRO told us that a few months ago. And we're already seeing rapid, massive changes in our ecosystems and habitats, in our environment, extreme weather events. This is all happening already on a global temperature rise of around 1.2 degrees. So even 1.5 degrees is still a real problem, and we're well on track for much higher temperature rises around the world, and nothing will suffer more than our oceans. It's got to stop. This bill we have before us here today is a good start, and supporting this bill We'll be fighting not just for our coastlines and our marine environments and our fishing communities, but it will be supporting communities right around this country to actually transition, show leadership and do what we need to do. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, um, the government, uh, of course, doesn't support the bill uh, that's currently before the chamber. Um, and I want to come to PEP 11 uh, in, a, in a moment, but of course the coverage of the bill uh, is much broader than, um, than PEP 11. It would apply to petroleum exploration leases right across eastern uh, and southern Australia. Uh, it would have um, a, a profound effect uh, on our $90 billion uh, oil and gas sector. Uh, and there are the, the, the proposition that this government would support a blanket ban on oil and gas exploration and development uh, is uh, completely, uh, utterly unacceptable to the government. And I want to make a few comments uh, about why, uh, and then I want to come to the issue of PEP 11, which I think, and uh, respect the fact that um, Senator Wish Wilson has a number of other particular uh, potential developments in mind in terms of the, his own contribution today, but also uh, 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 other matters that he's brought to the Senate in relation to uh, some of these developments. We don't support uh, a one out approach of. Um, of uh, uh, making uh, special measures in Australia of knocking over uh, fossil fuel development or oil and gas projects uh, in Australia. Uh, and that, that's because we support the global framework. Um, that's because uh, the position of the Australian government is that uh, we, like the previous government uh, and future governments, uh, are signed up uh, to the Paris framework. Uh, that uh, means that we have to take measures in terms of our own domestic emissions uh, that other countries, other companies are responsible uh, for the emissions that are created um, through their consumption of Australian oil and gas and coal and other products. Uh, now, it's an attractive slogan. It's an attractive slogan. Uh, to uh, put to uh, people who are legitimately, legitimately, deeply concerned about the impact of dangerous climate change on our environment, on on uh, on our welfare, uh, on our security, uh, on our safety, uh, its impact, uh, which is felt very differently around the world felt most dramatically in the Pacific and Southeast Asia, where efforts to um, manage 
the impact of changing temperatures, changing climate patterns, uh, rising sea levels. Um, I've just spent some time last year in the Mekong Delta where the impact of ever rising sea levels in that flat, low delta having a profound effect on food security, uh, rural poverty and agricultural production in that delta. And, and, and Australia's, you, know, you could not think of two more different looking river systems than the Murray-Darling and the Mekong, but actually 30 years of deep agricultural research cooperation in Vietnam, an Australian industry and, and Australian government, and our history of dealing with soil salinity in the Murray-Darling Basin does actually mean that there are, um, that there are um, very important research collaborations assisting uh, their response. But it's, it's the, and, and it is legitimate, it is legitimate to argue that the scale of the global response is not sufficient uh, to meet the challenge. Uh, and, but if that's the case, if that's the case, then that is an argument for more concerted global action. That is an argument for uh, nations to comply with their obligations and argue for more. Because leadership, indeed, leadership that's been lacking for the last decade. What you don't, what, what you don't do is take one-off action. It undermines the cause of collective global action. It's at best, it's at best wrong-headed. It's at best, it's at best wrong-headed. At worst, what it does is distract people into a into a cul-de-sac of action, where the focus of a bit of free advice in terms of the environment approach here. F feel free to ignore, but but what it means is that if people are focused upon this idea that cancelling particular projects, that undermining Australia's overall response and the, and the level of community support across the community for a cohesive, concerted government action, if anybody thinks that's going to assist the, clause, the cause of global emissions reduction, I think that is entirely wrong. Undermines, undermines community support. It's big, it's big in some suburbs, but it undermines community support for action that delivers reduced emissions, lower energy costs, investment in the technology of the future, and critically, global cooperation. And, and, the, and I'm going to come to PEP 11 in a minute. Don't you worry about that. But in terms of the principle, in terms of the principle, it is utterly wrong-headed uh, to campaign, in my view, on the basis of uh, the climate response over particular projects uh, in the way that Senator Wish Wilson has described. I respect the fact that there are other reasons why local communities um, agitate around these issues, uh, particularly in areas of deep environmental significance, uh, areas where there is uh, uh, you know, real environmental or biodiversity or other values, or economic values indeed. Um, I did hear Senator Wish Wilson talk about there not being much flathead around in Tasmania. I can tell him that, uh, to my um, deep uh, surprise and gratitude. There were quite a few flathead around the south coast of New South Wales over the course of January, uh, and I caught some of them. Um, so, on, on, on that, as a matter of principle, I think that's the wrong approach. Um, it, th there should be uh, an argument for um, broader global action. No, no, no uh, quibbling with that. But the world has to take the action together. Uh, now you can adopt that approach in the way that the former Prime Minister, uh, Mr Abbott, did, which was an argument for no action, or you can say it's an argument for leadership. And I can tell you that in uh, the response uh, of uh, leaders of countries around the world, 
Australia's return to a um, sensible, cohesive, uh, active position in this debate is very welcome indeed. It's very welcome indeed. Uh, and the, the last government and the two governments before that, the governments of Mr Turnbull uh, and Mr Abbott, were pariahs uh, in the international community uh, on climate action. Uh, they isolated Australia. They, they isolated Australia in a way which didn't damage just our capacity to be effective on climate, but they damaged our economic interest. They damaged our position in the region, uh, and they damaged, as has been come very clear, our reputation uh, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, in particular. On the PEP11. Uh, project itself. Well, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm required to say uh, that there's a process still before the courts, of course. Uh, and uh, even though we're in the parliament here, there, there's, there's a requirement to be um, circumspect uh, about some of the matters that are before the courts. But, but the, the core of the problem here today is what the former Prime Minister did over the course of the last two years. Now, now I, you know, I, I do think that the position of the Greens on these questions is, uh, I've said it, is respectfully wrong-headed in terms of the principle. But you move from wrong-headed to wrong, like just wrong. Uh, the, the, the position, the, the idea that you would so pervert the processes of government, so pervert the processes of government, that a prime minister swears himself in secretly to a range of portfolios, and the only action that was undertaken, the only thing that so far we know about, that this bloke. The former member for the, or the member for Cook, it's not gone yet, not yet. Uh, the, the only thing that he actually did was this stunt, right? Because he didn't mean it, right? He he didn't mean it because what he did, he perverted the processes of government in a way that he must have known was improper, that he must have known would lead to endless court action, he must have known that it was wrong. And, 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 and he took the action in a way which undermined the stated public policy objective. If you, if you were fair income serious as a government about achieving the public policy objective that he claimed on the beach you know, with his sand between his toes in Terrigal, that he's actually cared about, trying to save those, sandbag those seats, then he would have gone to the cabinet. He would have gone to the cabinet. He would have had the courage. He would have had the courage of what remained of his convictions, the courage of what remained of Mr. Morrison's convictions, and he would have done what a sensible, proper cabinet government does, and that is have a discussion at the cabinet. Have the courage of your convictions. Make a properly founded cabinet decision. Instead, it was an improper, shonky stunt. Improper, shonky stunt. And, and well, well, where are we now? Where are we now? Where, where we always end up? Where we always ended up with Mr. Morrison? An announcement. Some crude politics that people saw straight through but a utter disaster and a legacy of more delay, more uncertainty uh, and Mr Morrison's legacy left even further in tatters. Now, until the senators opposite and their colleagues in the Liberal National Party really come to grips with how much Mr Morrison actually perverted the processes of government and what that means for their legacy, 
They haven't got a hope. They haven't got a hope. Because one of the things you have to do if you're going to be a fair income opposition instead of a pretend one is you actually have to come to grips with the legacy of your own government. And it was crook. It was crook. At the beating, desiccated heart of that miserable government lay a person who centralised the processes of government so much and hid it from his colleagues, perverted the cabinet processes so much that the government was not functional. It was a government by fiat and it was enabled by all of these people over here, all of them, uh, by the leader here, by senior cabinet ministers, by staffers, by ministers, by backbenchers, who all knew what was going on, who all knew what was going on, but never had the courage, never had the courage to stand up to the bloke and say this has got to stop. And until you come to grips with Order. that, until you come to grips with that, you're, you're not you're you're not going to be a fair income opposition. If you're if you can't come to grips with that legacy, you're not going to be able to be a fair income opposition. And on and on Pepper Levin, and on Pepper Levin. The government will follow the processes utterly scrupulously because that is the only way. That is the only way to not botch Order. this process Senator, the way the Senator, former government Senator, did. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. And look, I, uh, I rise to oppose this bill, uh, and I'm fascinated because I've just been listening to the last contribution uh, from Senator Ayres, which was all over the shop. Uh, I, was, I was hoping for a cohesive, logical debate about uh, not supporting the bill, but instead he actually ended up supporting the bill by his comments, which is uh, not very useful to me at all, but I guess you can expect nothing less of a very politicised uh, government. Um, look, my concern is, is that uh, this, this uh, legislation uh, and the Greens party are hell-bent on destroying the resources sector, um, the same sector that has paid $37 billion in salaries to Australians in the last financial year in 2022, the same sector that pays $43 billion in royalties and taxes, that pay for schools and roads and hospitals right across this nation, the same sector that makes up 11 per cent of Australia's GDP. Australia has a robust approvals process. Uh, it, we have some of the highest environmental standards in the world for our mining and resources industry, and the state and federal laws have been designed to ensure that due process is followed, that we have a logical and coherent set of steps that allow for uh, approval applications, uh, approvals, appeal processes. Uh, I would say uh, almost too lengthy because we also have some of the longest approval processes in the world. But it does provide an equal and level playing field for all projects. And I think the important thing to note is that if we start legislating for specific projects, we undermine that level playing field. Now, Senator Ayres made a comment around Australia's reputational risk. Uh, he, was, he was talking about a different topic, but I'm raising the reputational risk for investment in this country that comes from uh, this kind of legislation. Because what it says to investors, and it doesn't matter if they're investing in coal or gas or critical minerals or renewable projects or agricultural projects, it doesn't matter because what we are saying to the rest of the world is that we would be a country that could not be relied on under its approvals process, that we are too risky for investment dollars and we rely on investment dollars. So this legislation um, is, is risking the very foundation that Australia is built on of taking uh, capital, whether it be uh, domestically or overseas, whether it be from institutions or mum and dad investors, that we are becoming unreliable 
as an investment destination. And on principle, we do not support using a blunt tool of legislative in intervention to block a specific <coughs> project. And if this bill is allowed to proceed, it does set a dangerous precedent for parliamentary intervention on any project. And because we know, because the Greens have told us, that this will not be the last project. <laughs> so if this bill proceeds, it is guaranteed that the Greens will come back to introduce bills to unblock other I'm sorry, to block other resource projects and development, and then the next, and then the next. And whilst uh, the, the unintended consequence, I'm sure from the Greens, but a very predictable response to this sort of legislation is that the Greens are advocating for higher energy prices, higher cost of living, forcing manufacturing and well-paid jobs offshore, and eventually energy shortages and blackouts across the nation. We have to be clear, this is the inevitable result of this piece of legislation blocking this project and then every other project that comes behind it. So it is dangerous for Australia's way of life. It is dangerous for the income streams that we have come to know and rely on because it is those royalties and taxes of a very highly regulated sector that allows us to have the high standard of health care, the high standard of education uh, and many other government projects right across the country. So proper process from government is what I'm advocating for. Project approvals uh, must have a clear and transparent approval process. And of course, we remain committed to increase supply of gas, particularly as we are now in a current gas shortage crisis. And the introduction of the uh, price restrictions last year uh, has already resulted in, uh, in, in projects not proceeding, uh, in investment uncertainty, whether it be um, uh, import terminals or gas projects, and that is leading to gas shortages. The ACCC's most recent uh, report has again indicated that, uh, and, and uh, uh, respected commentators are making it very clear that we can expect gas shortages, energy shortages, uh, later this year. This is incredibly serious. So gas continues to remain a vital heating, energy and manufacturing resource for this country. And these risks of gas shortages and blackouts increase across the East Coast because of Labor's bad policies, rushed legislation. And it is vital that we continue to develop supply to ensure that Australians can turn on the lights, power up the stove, heat their homes in winter. So further exploration is necessary to ensure long-term gas supply. However, the gas crisis is already on our doorstep. And countless projects are now being torpedoed by Labor's destructive intervention. The government must do what they can to bring them back online. We can see that the government has no interest in properly managing the gas and cost of living crisis facing Australians. And through their policy decisions, we have seen uh, approved and viable gas projects shelved under review, further fueling both the short-term and medium-term crisis. To name just a few, Senex's Atlas expansion, Western Queensland, a proven gas field. It was forecast to supply 60 petajoules of gas to the domestic market on hold. An LNG terminal proposed for Port Kembla, New South Wales, has also been put on hold. Santos's Narrabri project, which could supply half of New South Wales's total gas supply, is also facing further challenges and delay. The Viva import terminal is at risk. The Epic Newcastle import terminal has been shelved, a terminal capable of supplying 80 per cent of New South Wales's gas demand. So I'm sure the Greens would love to introduce legislation to block all of these projects too. But these projects were critical to Australia's future gas security, particularly 
as the ACCC continues to forecast gas shortages across the East Coast in 2023 and in future years. But the government's inability to work with industry to secure solutions are becoming more and more apparent. And rather than working to develop solutions that will benefit Australians, Labor and the Greens are content with ramming through destructive legislation, stifling debate, blaming others, but most seriously, removing uh, the, uh, Australia's standing as an attractive investment house for important resources projects that we have relied upon for generations to allow Australia to be the first world country that we are. Uh, the transition that the government keeps talking about, that the Greens keep talking about, is going to be some time into the future, and it is going to be uh, uh, without a bridge. We, we have no bridge to move from the current position to what the government has legislated for in 2030. So what we have is a government that's ensuring that we're going to have shortages of gas, we will have higher energy prices, we're going to have uh, power blackouts, and we know who we can thank for that. We can thank the Albanese Labor government, its sneaky deals, its rush legislation uh, and its lack of concern for planning for the future for Australians, Australians' jobs and Australians' way of life. Thanks, Senator McDonald. Uh, Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak on, in support of this bill, and I thank Senator Wish Wilson for his leadership on this. Uh, and I thank you for this opportunity to talk about what is such an important issue to Australians across the country. Uh, the IPCC and the International Energy Agency have been clear. <laughs> The climate science is clear. We cannot afford any new fossil fuel projects. And in this place and, and, and elsewhere, you'll hear uh, that weaponised by the major parties saying that if you say we shouldn't have any new fossil fuel projects, that you are against fossil fuels, that you want to take us back to the Stone Age. <laughs> that, is, that is not correct. <laughs> what Senator Wish Wilson's bill, as I read it, is proposing is that on PEP 11, where there is broad consensus from communities affected, uh, from uh, scientists, and a very clear commitment from the now uh, Prime Minister from, uh, from the election that this will not go ahead, we should rule it out. We should stop this happening. And we should stop digging, given we're in such a big hole when it comes to climate change. We shouldn't be exploring for new fossil fuel projects at the moment. We simply cannot afford to do that. It's clear that there is strong <coughs> local opposition to this project. Um, I listened to Senator Ayres describing this sort of approach, opposing individual projects as wrong-headed. Uh, I would respectfully disagree and, and say that there are thousands of Australians across the country that, because of a failure by the major parties when it comes to a sensible, timely response to climate change, have been forced to take a project-by-project project approach of trying to stop damaging uh, projects that are going to damage the local area and, and community, but then also contribute to the, as was pointed out, global climate crisis, where we desperately need leadership. We need Australia to step up and say, OK, no new fossil fuel projects. We, it's been a big part of our economy in, in the past. But resources can and will still be a big part of it in the future. We can move into critical minerals. We can start processing iron ore here. There is a really exciting future for our resources sector. 
but not if we see the kind of climate predictions uh, that we hear from scientists, where we will be facing a mounting and spiralling uh, climate breakdown and the type of extreme weather events that we are already seeing in Australia. This, this wrong-headed approach has been taken by farmers who stood up against Whitehaven's Malls Creek coal mine uh, in uh, Laird State Forest, which went ahead <laughs> in a uh, critically endangered ecosystem. Uh, farmers who stood up against Shenhua's proposed coal mine on the Liverpool Plains, one of our best farming areas. The farmers were successful. They, st they stopped that and they celebrated that victory. We have ongoing um, pushback against Santos's uh, CSG project in the Pilliga. Farmers, uh, First Nations people, Gomoroi people, pushing against this new fossil fuel development in the largest intact dry forest, dry eucalypt forest in Australia. In 2023, given what we know about climate change, given the summer that we've just gone through, where you know, I'd hate to know how, how little time Minister Watt has had with his family, given it seems that he's just flying from one uh, extreme weather event to the next, having to talk to communities who are being impacted by climate change. This is here now, and if we're willing to listen to scientists, it's not getting any better. So we have to take decisive action on this. We can't have our cake and eat it too when it comes to the climate crisis. We can't say uh, we've got adults back in charge, as we've heard many times, and we're going to deal with this crisis. At the same time, we're going to keep exploring for, for uh, coal, oil and gas. We've got uh, Beedaloo, we've got Browse, we've got Scarborough coming online. Narrabri needs to be fast-tracked. We can't have it. And Australians <laughs> are saying we want our government, we want elected representatives to start dealing with this in a way that, that, that actually reflects the the challenge that we face. This is a huge, huge challenge. It's not going to be easy. And we need politicians leading on this. Again, I, I, just, I just want to go back to um, how important it is that decisions that are made in this place are in the best interests of Australians. The former government argued against having a duty of care to young people. I, I frankly find that, that, that mind-blowing. If, if we're not in this place to make decisions that are good for young Australians, that are good for future generations of Australians. What are, what are we here for? Every morning we talk about thinking about uh, future Australians and making decisions. New fossil fuel projects are not that. They are not that. And Australians expect more. And we've heard about reputational risk. The biggest reputational risk we face as elected representatives is what we do on the climate and biodiversity crisis. There are, there are many other challenges we face uh, and there is much attention being put on them, but future generations will judge us on our actions now. We've never known more ab about the challenge that we face and we're one of the, the last generations to be able to actually deal with it, to, to make the changes necessary to show the leadership that is necessary on a global challenge. It's happened before and we have an opportunity to do that today. I, I urge the new government, I urge you to step up and show leadership on this. Leadership is, is following through on your promises. It's 
It's ensuring that you're, you're actually looking after the people that elect you to represent. Before the election, the, the now Prime Minister, talking about PEP 11, said, and I'll quote, absolutely, we will stop PEP 11 going ahead, full stop, exclamation mark, no question, not equivocal, no ifs, no buts. That was on the Central Coast. He has a bill that will do that. He has a bill that will say to the millions of Australians that are concerned about climate change, the young people who have been protesting, the young people who took the federal government to court saying, you should be thinking about us when you make these sorts of laws, the, the kind of bill that we're debating today. You can say to them, we hear you. You shouldn't have to protest. Politicians should be looking after your futures. And we have an opportunity today to, to do just that. I thank Senator Wish Wilson for his leadership on this matter, and I will be supporting this bill. Thank you. Thanks, Senator David Pocock. I call Senator Grogan. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, it's been very interesting listening to the debate in this chamber this morning. Um, and just to be really clear, we will not be placing a blanket ban tomorrow morning on oil and gas. This is not a responsible way to govern. We have stepped out a whole range of things but where we're going. But placing a ban tomorrow morning on oil and gas is not the answer. The transition to more sustainable energy sources needs to be done carefully, needs to be done in a balanced way and needs to be done responsibly. And I think the eight months of this Labor government has shown that we are making significant progress. Significant progress after 10 long years of irresponsible action. Oil and gas is going to play a part in our future. Our transport system, turning on the lights, cooking your dinner, using the internet, all require us to have a sensible approach to the issue of oil and gas in this country. We support the international frameworks, we've committed to global emissions reductions, and we're establishing a more credible place for Australia in the world. We've been made the laughing stock for many, many years, and we are now changing that. We are now making those changes to get this country on track. The last 10 years of stagnation from the previous government have been planet-destroying at worst and irresponsible at best. We are changing that. We have made moves already in eight months, and we will continue to make those moves, but we will make them responsibly. And we will make them in the context of the global actions that have been taken by our colleagues, and we will be doing it so that we can provide sustainability, we can provide confidence that what we do is clear and transparent and has a meaningful and sensible pathway. COP15, for example, we led from the front. We campaigned for strong targets, we campaigned for clear measurements, and we, we now have a global agreement to protect 30 per cent of our land, 30 per cent of our oceans by 2030. Now, we're not looking at that as, this is it, we can, we can all go home to bed now. It is about crafting a pathway forward. It is about genuinely making a difference. We have secured a high ambition on restoring degraded land, inland water, coastal marine ecosystems. We've got good targets on reducing invasive species, recognising island sites. We've successfully advocated for placing rights and interests of First Nations people at the forefront of nature conservation when they've been ignored for so long. And large companies will be required to disclose their nature-related risks and impacts. They will be held to account. Australia has led the way on these negotiations, pushing for an ambitious agreement. But we are getting on with delivering the plans at home as well. 
and our Protect and Repair Program for the Environment has been announced, and the Minister is taking serious action to ensure that we change the way that this country is dealing with those threats that we are all so clear about and that have been articulated through this parliament and through these debates. We are implementing a stronger emissions reduction target with a clear pathway to net zero. Rewiring the nation for renewable energy will enable those renewable energy sources to tap straight into the grid and we will have cheaper, cleaner power. Our Environment Protection Agency is going to be able to enforce our laws on the ground. We've had more than a decade of challenges, more than a decade where we know that our environmental laws are broken. But we are fixing that. As I've said, in eight short months, we are fixing the problems that this country has faced for the last decade and much, much more. We need to get to net zero. We need to protect the planet. We need to do it responsibly, and we need to do it in a manner that provides clarity, clarity for business, clarity for people, people who care about the environment, people who don't. We need to provide that so everyone knows what this playing field is looking like. And over the last eight months, we have changed that playing field. Conservation organisations have welcomed these changes. Businesses welcome these changes. These are changes that everyone can see needs to be made. The opposition left the animals and the plants and the places without the protection that they need and hid the contents of the State of the Environment report. And no wonder, two years out from an election, all that would have said in releasing that report was that nothing had been done and that the country's environment was in a dire, dire state. And then with our approach to coal and gas, we aim to get to 82 per cent renewable energy by 2030. And the plans we've put in place, the detailed plans we've put in place, will get us there. And it is clear and transparent and open for anyone to look at. Projects that do go forward, new projects that do go forward, will need to meet very specific requirements, including rigorous environmental checks, which we are changing as I have stepped out. And they will also need to comply with the safeguard mechanism reforms that we are currently um, consulting on. And our approach to reducing the emissions of our biggest emitters will be addressed through those planned reforms. All big emitters should reduce their emissions. The challenge we have in getting to net zero is a challenge for all of us. And to be clear, the majority of businesses realise that this must be done so that their business can operate. This is not, as is claimed by some in this chamber, you know, business killing action. It isn't. It is about setting up Australia to be able to operate effectively, efficiently, profitably into the future. There's the reforms to the safeguard have been designed so that all facilities, whether they are existing or new, are required to reduce their emissions. New coal gas projects covered by the facilities will be required to keep their emissions below their baseline from the first year in operation, and their baselines will reduce over time, on that pathway, as I've said, to net zero by 2050. This recognises that new facilities can use the latest technology. This is not about stopping things. This is about learning how to do things differently. This is about embracing innovation. This is about changing the way we do things, not just stopping things, but actually utilising the amazing science and development industries that we have to change the way we do things, to move ourselves into a state of renewable energy, of sustainable energy, to power this country from 
the resources that are indeed renewable. So, we believe this sends a very, very strong signal to investors because we need investment. We need investors to see that Australia is an excellent place to, to come to, that Australia is a place to invest in, that we can see the future, that we have that vision and that leadership, and that our leadership says we will embrace the future and we will do it cleanly, not that we will stop doing everything that people don't like. The previous government's design on the emissions piece was seriously flawed, and emissions actually increased over time. So the detail is important, and the commitment of our industries and the commitment of our communities is really important. And we are getting there. We are consulting with people. We are getting very positive responses, even from those organisations that a couple of years ago would stand staunchly against making emissions reductions are now coming to the party. And that is because they know that their future relies on it. Their future relies on them getting on board, changing the technology that we're using, changing how business is operated, and preparing ourselves to be a leader of the future. The projects will meet both of those, the emissions reduction piece and also the environmental piece. Now, you may have noticed I haven't said the word PEP11 yet. Um, that is because looking at just one single project does not give us the outcome that we need. Looking at one single project does not change the structure and shape of this country and how we approach energy into the future. And this process, the PEP11 process, is in front of the New South Wales Court, which is its jurisdiction where it's appropriately being dealt with. We'll see how that plays out. My colleague, Senator Ayres, um, has stepped out the disaster of the past few years on PEP11. Previous government, the politics, the grandstanding, the divisive actions, which all led to the mess that we see here today. So let's not forget, at the time when the previous Prime Minister, the member for Cook, made his declarations, he wasn't just the Prime Minister, he was also the Resources Minister and a bunch of other ministries as well, as we know from that mess that he created by feeling that he was the only one fit to run any of those portfolios, given his distrust in his colleagues. But that creates huge challenges in our legal system, creates huge challenges in our parliamentary system. The secrecy and the lies are not something that you will see from the Labor government. So it's no surprise, and what we come to expect of the previous government and the Prime Minister, previous Prime Minister, was this kind of action, this kind of confusion, grandstanding, political point scoring. What we will be doing, what we are committed to doing, and we will follow through on is following due process, respecting our legal structures, respecting our parliamentary structures. That is what we will be doing as a government. And this process, the PEP 11 process, is in the hands of the New South Wales government at this point in time. And that is where it is supposed to be, and that is where it will be dealt with in the first instance. What we will be doing and what we have done in the eight months that we have been in government is providing reliable, transparent processes so everybody is clear about the future, so everybody is clear about what we are doing and how we are doing it. We will not be following the previous example of chaos and mismanagement. This debate has covered across the issues of individual and systemic approaches. I think it's pretty clear from what I've said the systemic approach is the one that will lead us into a clean and reliable future. The individualistic approach of just picking out your favourite projects, picking out the things you want to worry about on a particular day is short-sighted. Looking holistically at our oil, gas, renewable energy, environment, that is leadership, not individual calls 
on individual projects that sit in another jurisdiction. Leadership requires responsibility. Banning oil and gas, gas doesn't provide leadership, and it doesn't provide responsibility, and it doesn't provide certainty into the future. Yes, we are totally committed to net zero. Yes, we are totally committed to looking at a future that's cleaner, that's more sustainable, and that people can rely on and understand exactly what's coming into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, well, this bill should be opposed because it's only going to add uh, to cost of living pressures that all Australian families face. Uh, most of these types of bills these days have, in parentheses, some misleading statement about what the bill's about. This one says that it's uh, well, in mundane terms, offshore petroleum greenhouse gas storage amendment bill, but then in parentheses says fight for Australia's coastline bill. That should be amended if we are to be truthful to the Australian people, it should be amended to say higher petrol prices for all bill, because that's what this would lead to. I don't know about other Australians, but I've uh, done a lot of driving over the summer, and it is eye-watering every time you fill up your tank and go in and look at how much the bill is going to be. Now, I'm fortunate enough to be able to afford that, but I just cannot fathom how some struggling Australian families are affording to pay uh, just to fill up their car at the moment. It's costing more to fill up your car than it does to fill up your trolley at the grocery shop. Uh, it is an enormous bill and going to hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Uh, it would be very rare that you get to fill up your tank and you don't have to put your pin in when you swipe your card because it's always going to be under over the minimum threshold for that. It's very, very expensive. Now, how are we going to bring down petrol prices? How are we going to bring down the cost of living for Australians? Well, this bill doesn't do it. This bill definitely will not do that because it will only put uh, pressure on those petrol prices because it's going to tell us we're going to produce less oil and gas. If you want to bring the price of something down, you, you have to supply more of it. And as we, we need more oil and gas exploration in this country uh, to help bring down petrol prices for Australian families and, and also to help provide energy to the world who are suffering. Uh, under the jackboot of uh, Russian authoritarianism at the moment. The Greens have obviously not got the memo. They have not got the memo that, uh, uh, that net zero is dead, uh, that the world is walking away from the commitments uh, to restrict fossil fuel uh, use and production, and they're doing so at a rapid rate. Just this week, just this week the woke uh, British uh, uh, oil and gas company BP uh, has come out and backed away uh, from its climate commitments. Uh, BP has been famous uh, for progressively adopting over the last 10 years more and more uh, stringent commitments to walk away from oil and gas. Indeed, uh, what a company that used to be known as British Petroleum has uh, instead tried to be known, uh, get, get itself known as Beyond Petroleum uh, in the recent years. Uh, this week, this week, actually, uh, uh, BP has come out and said, oh, actually, no, it's not beyond petroleum anymore, it's back to petroleum. That's what they're doing. They're going back to petroleum, BP, uh, because as the Financial Review reports today in the headline, energy giant BP dials back climate pledge amid soaring oil profits. The article goes on to say that the BP was revising its plan to lower emissions by more than 35 per cent by the end of this decade. Its new target is now only 20 to 30 per cent cut. The company said 20 to 30 per cent. That's a very big range uh, for BP. It gives them lots of flexibility. The, the article mentions that BP, BP over the past year has made $39.8 billion of profit. $39.8 billion of profit. Shell has made $41.6 billion uh, of profit. And, and Mobil, Exxon Mobil has made $55.7 billion US dollars profit and Chevron $36.5 billion in profit. Now, I don't want to see those profits that high. I don't, I don't want to, that's, that's bad. It's bad for consumers, bad for the economy. Good luck for those companies. They've made investments. I, I think they'd be laughing all the way to their bank over their net zero commitments. They convinced the rest of the world not to, uh, uh, not to approve competitors uh, to the big oil companies. The Greens have been the greatest enablers of oil and gas profit, profits in history. Uh, because by successfully shutting down alternative sources of competition to the incumbent operators, they have helped boost their profits. But the way to get those profits down, you know, the way to get them down, not by taxing them, not by restricting oil and gas uh, uh, exploration permits, as this bill does, it's by getting and allowing smaller oil and gas companies to get in 
uh, to offshore petroleum areas and compete with these companies. That's how to get the profits down. That's how to get the prices down for consumers. Because a lot of these companies, I've dealt with them a lot. I've dealt with them a lot. They're quite happy sometimes to, uh, not publicly, but behind the scenes, support bills like these. Because I say the Greens are the enablers of the incumbent large, uh, big resource companies. They like to see some of these areas shut down because they don't want to see new and innovative and nimble smaller companies come in and compete with them uh, to supply a scarce resource like oil and gas. And that particularly goes to areas like PEP11, where it's a small uh, uh, company here that's trying to get a start. It's not BP, it's not Mobile, it's not Chevron, it's not, not Shell. Uh, and those companies are quite happy uh, to see uh, the Greens do their dirty work uh, by restricting competition in this space and therefore keeping profits, uh, their profits higher than they would otherwise be. Now, now, the article goes on to say apparently BP is still committed to net zero. Yeah, right. Okay. I'll, I'll believe that when I see it. I mean, it's very easy to make commitments 20, uh, 27 years hence, and when we know when their 2030 target comes to seven years hence, they've immediately dropped it. So we'll see what BP does in 2043 uh, on this matter. I imagine uh, that uh, if they're still making, <laughs> if they're still making $40 billion of profits a year, uh, they will quickly revise their goals and objectives. Uh, but the other area that, of course, has got the memo on this is the European Union. They are at the forefront. They are at the front lines of uh, uh, Russian aggression. Uh, uh, they had naively and ignorantly become far too reliant on, on Russian uh, oil and gas over the past decade, and the war in Ukraine has brought to a screaming halt uh, the dreams and visions of Greens parties or Greens aligned parties right across Europe to deliver on net zero emissions commitments. Over the past year, over the, past year the European Union, uh, or countries in the European Union, I should say, uh, have announced plans to build 18 new liquefied natural gas facilities. 18 new facilities. So we have, this, we have this kind of schizophrenia here where we have some, uh, some— Senator Canavan, the time for this debate has expired. The, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business order. I call the clerk. A couple of business order of the day number one. Migration order. amendment aggregate sentences bill 2023 in committee. The committee is considering the Migration Amendment Aggregate Sentences Bill 2023. Two divisions were called for after 6.30 p.m. yesterday uh, and will be held this morning. Uh, the first uh, question is that amendments uh, 1 to 3 on sheet uh, 1810, moved by Senator Lambie, be agreed. The question again. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. No. The noes have it. Is I think the noes have it. Is the division? So the Greens position in support of these amendments be uh, be noted. Uh, yes. Thank you, Senator McKim. It will be so noted in the Hansard. Uh, the next question in front of the chamber is that the amendment moved by Senator David Pocock, uh, amendment number one on sheet 1811, uh, be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Senator McKim. I'll just make the same request, please, Chair, that the Greens' position in support of these amendments be noted. Thank you, Senator McKim. It will be so noted in the Hansard. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. 
The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Migration Amendment Aggregate Sentences Bill of 2023 and agreed to it without amendments. I call the clerk. No, I don't. Um, I call the minister to move that the bill be reported. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that the uh, report of the committee be adopted. Uh, thank you. The question uh, is as moved by the minister. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Call the minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a, uh, a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 to provide for the treatment of aggregate sentences and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Higher Education Support Amendment 2022 Measures number one, Bill 2022. Second reading. In the hands of the chamber as to whether a senator. My apologies and thank you, Clark. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and for related purposes. Uh, amendments have been circulated, so for the convenience of the chamber, uh, I inform you that we are now in committee. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? Uh, there being no objection, it is so ordered. Straight to that. Okay. Uh, the question is that the bills stand as printed. Uh, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Chair. Uh, look, um, I'm. Uh, going to uh, move opposition amendments one to five on sheet 1799 um, by leave and have them taken together and in doing so speak very briefly to this relating to what this amendment actually does. Uh, there's a couple of things I do want to highlight. Um, the most important amongst them is this uh, need for a review to occur after a period of two years. That specific period of time is important because it gives, uh, enables there to be a, enough of a duration of time to be able to examine what change um, will occur behaviourally, I suppose you could say, um, once the amendment comes into effect um, in relation to doctors and nurse practitioners, whether the effect is actually taking place and we're getting the desired outcome. Uh, secondly, it asks for the review team to specifically examine whether or not the measures which are proposed for doctors and nurse practitioners should apply to other professions, which I think is important because we know that there are issues elsewhere across um, the employment world uh, where there are shortages, in particular in regional and remote areas. Um, in particular, this amendment uh, calls for an examination of other health measures, uh, mental health in particular, and of course also the education sector, but I commend the amendments to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Senator Dunningham. Uh, Senator Chisholm. 
Uh, thank you, and thank Senator Dunningham for that contribution. Um, the rural, remote and very remote doctors and nurse practitioner measures are a form of government policy that is being reintroduced from a lapse bill. Uh, the government supported an amendment in the House from the member for McKellar, which proposed the effectiveness of the policy be reviewed at three-year intervals. Uh, the coalition have proposed further amendments which provide more detail around the terms of the review, including whether the policy might be expanded in future to cover other areas uh, and with skills in need in remote, rural and very remote areas. Um, these areas would include health, mental health and education sectors. Uh, the government is prepared to support an amendment which incorporates that further detail in which maintains the structure and intent of the member for McKellar's original amendment. Uh, the government thanks the member for McKellar for her engagement on this bill uh, and will be supporting this amendment. Thank you. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'd like to speak briefly to the Coalition's amendment. Um, and it is important that government policy is subject to thorough review so that we can see what's working and what's not working. And the amendments moved by the Coalition do bolster the review amendments made by Sophie Scombs MP in the lower house. The review will encourage the government to consider whether student debt relief should be offered to students in other sectors of high skills need in rural, remote and very remote Australia, including health, mental health and education sectors. Um, I guess colleagues in here would, not be, would be no doubt that our position is that education should be universal and free and debt should be wiped off so students don't come out of higher education with massive debts. Um, I do have to say this, though, that it is a bit rich of the coalition, the coalition who has been the party of job-ready graduates, the party of funding cuts and fee hikes, the party who have treated uni students and universities like ideological enemies for over 10 years now. Now this party wants the government to give great, greater consideration to student debt relief. But I guess change for good can happen any time even from those who have attacked the higher education sector so viciously over the last some years. Uh, so as a party committed to transparency and accountability and to wiping all student debt and making education universal and free, we will support this amendment. Uh, thank you, Senator Fariki. Uh, the question is that the amendments moved by Senator Daniam uh, 1 to 5 on sheet uh, 1799 uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The question now uh, is the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The question now is that, is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Uh, those against say no. The ayes have it. Back there. The committee has considered the Higher Education Support Amendment 2022 Measures Number no. One Bill of 2022 and agreed to it with amendments. I call the minister. I move the report be adopted. Uh, question is that the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The minister. Uh, I move the bill now be read a third time. Uh, question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number three, Governor-General's opening speech address in reply. It appears that Senator Canavan has the call. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, we're done. We're done. We're uh, out of an agenda, out of uh, anything to do. Um, it's only been about 260 days since the election. And and the government's got nothing left in the tank. They're the Jacinda Ardern government now. They've got nothing left in the tank. Fortunately, of course, uh, I should explain. I should explain to people listening or in the gallery that we're now back to what's called the address in reply. This is the address. This is the debate about the address that was provided by the Governor General 
uh, back in July last year. So seven odd months ago, the Governor General came here, outlined the government's agenda, and there's a little bit of a debate afterwards from us about that about that speech uh, that occurs. Now, normally we'll we'll do a little bit of that in the two or three weeks after the new Parliament opens up, uh, as the government gets, especially a new government, gets its legislative agenda together. But it's pretty rare for us to come back to it seven months later, because you'd think there'd be other things going on. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, it must. I suppose we can only hazard a guess here that the new Labor government doesn't think there is anything that needs fixing in our country right now, because they have no legislation before us. They have nothing for us uh, to debate or talk about. We've got to go back to this time filler. Uh, this is like being at school where the teacher runs out of things to do. She'll put on a documentary or something just to buy time till the bell goes. That's what's happening here. We're just filling time. We're still getting paid, by the way, by you guys up there. You're still paying us. But the government's got nothing for us to do. I mean, I've got things. I've got more bills than the government seems to have. I've got bills I put in this week. Uh, I've got bills to end vaccine mandates to give people their jobs back. Ridiculous unscientific mandates that still exist. Uh, I've got a bill to legalise nuclear energy. Let's debate that. Bring that on. Let's bring that bill on and actually debate about how we can lower energy prices for Australians and guarantee manufacturing jobs. But no, the government has no agenda. They must think there's nothing out there that needs to be fixed. Well, I don't know what they have been spending their summers doing in the government, but uh, over, over the summer I've been home. I've spent a lot of time in central Queensland. I've spent a lot of time driving around the country too. The various things I needed to do, and, and speaking to people, there's a lot of people hurting right now. It's very, very tough uh, with interest rates surging. People's mortgage repayments have, have often, if they're an average mortgage, they're looking at $1,000 more a month. Uh, petrol prices are high. Grocery prices continue and seemingly are, are not slowing down and continuing to increase. Today we learned box prices are going up. Cement, concrete is all going up. That's going to feed into construction costs, everything that happens and is built in this country. It's really tough for people. And why don't we have some legislation here to debate to help people with the cost of living? Why don't we have that right now? As I say, to get nuclear energy going, help power prices come down. Do something. Let's have a debate about that. Uh, but instead, instead, we're filling time. The government is spinning wheels. They don't know what to do. Now, I think at the next sitting period, this might be re 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 rectified. There's some bills uh, in committees at the moment. The, bill, the government has a bill. Uh, to, to weaponise, weaponise uh, a thing called the safeguard mechanism. They're going to create a big new tax on the Australian people. So, as I said, I think the biggest issue for people right now is living costs. It's just helping people survive day to day, keep them in their home, uh, uh, keep, keep the banks at, at bay uh, and away from knocking on the door. That's what we should be debating. But instead, instead the government is going to bring forward, probably in the next sitting week, uh, a bill to impose a huge new tax. Uh, on Australians and the Australian economy, they want to make 215 businesses in Australia, some of the uh, most uh, the, the businesses that create the most jobs and wealth for our country. They want to create a tax because these 215 businesses have to pay a multi-billion-dollar bill uh, to reduce their carbon emissions, while the rest of the world just builds coal mines and power stations and LNG terminals in Europe. Uh, and we're going to make our businesses pay, jobs be lost, and ultimately Australian consumers pay for those higher costs. Of those 215 businesses, two of them are our last two oil refineries. I think we should try and keep our oil refineries in this country. In, for, in fact, the former coalition government helped keep them alive uh, during the COVID crisis, which was uh, almost existential for those oil refineries. But we helped them, we provided them support to keep that capacity here in Australia so we could continue uh, to provide an essential product to Australian business and families. Instead, instead the government's come in, new government's come in, they're going to impose a tax on our last two oil refineries, the one in Lytton, north of, oh, sorry, east of Brisbane, and uh, the other in Geelong. They're going to put a tax on those two refineries. That's going to flow through to your petrol prices. So if you think they're already high and you think they're high enough, the Labor government doesn't think they're high enough. The Labor government wants to put petrol prices higher through this big new tax. This big new tax on the 215 businesses, it includes, it includes Qantas and Virgin. Qantas and Virgin, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, are on uh, the list of the 215 businesses, they're going to have to pay a tax. So if anyone's had to fly recently, geez, they, those prices are high. Uh, they certainly haven't come back to their pre-COVID levels. They're very, very high uh, to fly around the country or the world. That's going to be higher because they have to pay the tax. And what is Qantas Convergent going to do? Of course, they're going to pass that on to you. They're going to pass that on uh, to consumers. That's going to make it even tougher 
uh, for Australian families in this country. And, and of those 215 businesses, the public transit authorities in, in New South Wales and Victoria are also on the list. Uh, they're on the list because they're all the bus network, they use diesel. Uh, some electric buses out there, but they still use a lot of diesel. And they're, and they're, now, they're now in the gun of Labor's big new carbon tax. They're going to have to pay the tax. That means higher uh, fares on public transport as well uh, for Australian families. I just hope, I hope here, I read today in the paper that the New South Wales Labor's political director has had to give a speech to the Labor caucus this week. Uh, his name escapes me at the moment, but he has had to come in to the Labor caucus this week and remind Labor's members of parliament that what they should be focusing on is the cost of living. Why do they need that reminder? Wouldn't they be out there talking to people? Wouldn't you? <laughs> Wouldn't you? But instead, because well, he's had to remind you, he's had to remind you because all I've seen from this government over the last few months is things like the voice, uh, issues like climate change. Uh, they seem obsessed by absolute distractions that don't go uh, to the realities that Australian families are facing right now. That's why you've had to have your director come in and remind you all that, hey, hey, maybe we should talk a little bit less about the voice. Most people don't know what that is. Most people think it's a reality TV show. Talk a little bit less about that. Maybe we should talk about Australian families. Maybe we should, maybe we should talk a little bit less uh, about our uh, naive ambitions to somehow change the temperature of the globe and, and focus on how we can make families' budgets work. Because obviously the government is not focused on that right now, given that they have not any piece of legislation here for us to debate. Not a single piece of legislation is live and active right now before this Australian family. As I say, myself and other senators on the coalition side, we have bills to go. We have bills ready to go. Let's bring those on so we can do something for the Australian people for our wages right now, rather than spin our wheels, which the government is doing in the Senate at the moment. Senator Polly. On the 21st of May 2022, Australians voted for a better future, a future of reform to create a fairer Australia, an Australia which builds people up and supports families. A stronger future for all Australians can get it so they can get ahead and so that they can have opportunities for all. However, before I talk more about Labor's plan for a better and fairer Australia, what we have achieved thus far within the first nine months of government, I must speak what should be unspeakable. The man who broke the Liberal Party's heart, the former Prime Minister Scott Morrison, and those opposite should hang their heads in shame. The former government will be remembered for the lengths that they would go to trash our institutions and conventions for their own selfish political means. To try and trash our democracy and abuse relationships between the government of the day and the people of Australia, <coughs> the Australian media and the Australian public service. I think Australians all breathed a sigh of relief on election night when the government was defeated. The former PM was effectively running a shadow government that his ministers and government MPs and senators did not know about let alone the people of Australia. But some people, including those opposite, would have heard rumours. They would have known what was happening. Mr Morrison had turned into a national joke, and rightly so. He was a Prime Minister who couldn't keep his word, let alone a promise. Australia is a proud liberal democracy which rightly upholds the highest standards of Westminster tradition. Now, these principles and conventions were mercilessly ignored by Mr Morrison during his prime ministership. We continue to witness more proof that Australia deserves so much more than Mr Morrison in book after book since the time he was in office. While in office, he undermined our democracy trashed the principles of responsible government. He centralised power and he knowingly concealed the truth from the media and the Australian people. This is a dark chapter in our country's history. There are no other words to describe this. Now out of office, Mr Morrison is trying to spin his way out of decisions he made willingly. But history will not forget him, and I think his recent performance at the Royal Commission into the robo-debt was ample evidence that this man should never have been trusted with the leadership of the Liberal Party, let alone being Prime Minister of this country. 
If we as a country do not ensure open and transparent government and restore trust in our public institutions, the people of Australia will become even more disillusioned with our sacred our sacred democracy. Those people on the other side are laughing, but these are the same people that could have put the brakes on Scott Morrison. They could have put the brakes on him. They could have spoken up. But what they have done is they allowed the Prime Minister to continue on, to try and spin his way out of every issue and every resolution that he made to deceive the Australian people. Mr Morrison really did think, and I'm sure continues to think, that he can still walk between raindrops. The legacy of the Morrison government will surely be represented by Mr Morrison's traits and all the lies of the former Prime Minister told. Mr Morrison was a man with no leadership credentials, no principles and no integrity. The problem was that those on the other side never listened to the former Minister for Tourism when she sacked Scott Morrison because he failed in that responsibility. He was untrustworthy and what she did was make sure that Tourism Australia was protected from the, the man who considered himself to be the marketing guru, a man who would never ever apologise for any mistakes that he made, a man who would do anything for power and do anything to keep it. And I'm surprised my colleagues on the other side of the chamber are very happy and laughing at the fact that he deceived them. If you can sit in this chamber and say that it was OK that he took on other ministerial positions without actually Senator, Senator Polly, having the authority Polly, to do that. Senator Dunning. All right. um, Senator Polly is misleading the chamber by suggesting we're laughing and happy. We're amused that she is five minutes Sen into a 15-minute speech and has said nothing Sen about Labor's Sen plan Senator for this Dunning. country. Is obsessed with Scott Morrison. Senator Dunning, there is no point of order, and I'm quite enjoying listening to Senator Polly, and I'd like to hear, be able to hear her in silence. Senator Polly, continue on this brilliant speech. You're a very good deputy president. Our country deserves so much better, and that's why the Australian people voted Mr Morrison and the Liberals out because they were incompetent, it was a chaotic and unprincipled government. They voted you out of office. I know it still hurts being in opposition, but you'll get used to opposition, believe me. A government of inaction on policy reform, but heavy on incompetence and division. A government with ministerial scandals one after another. One after another. Now let's recount what happened during their term in government. Let's talk about the robo debt. Let's talk about those people who took their lives because of their policy action. Let's talk about the sports rorts. Let's talk about the community grants rorts, the car park rorts. A government <coughs> that was a steward to the crisis in aged care and any meaningful action on climate change. The cost of living was left to fester, and many of those opposite just stood by and allowed that to happen. We know that our jobs, Australian jobs, went offshore. We know wages were left to stagnate, and in many circles, dehumanising women and girls was a product of his government. Mr Morrison, when he said he didn't hold a hose, I have to say to you, that has been one of the most repeated comments that I've heard in relation to Mr Morrison. That's why he got defeated, because he would not take any responsibility. He was a bulldozer, that he would do whatever he had to do to stay Prime Minister and keep control of the Liberal Party. I can assure you, as an Albanese Labor government, we will never, ever undermine our democracy. We will only try to strengthen it. So after a decade of incompetence, Labor has started to clean up the Liberal Nationals mess. After almost a decade in office in my home state of Tasmania, we will be and we already have demonstrated they are better off with an Albanese Labor government. Tasmania will get a fair go once more. We and I and my community are looking forward to when the Albanese Labor government, uh, as we've already committed in the October budget, when our election commitments were made in my state of Tasmania, we will deliver on them. Commitments to create 
secure local jobs, to ease the cost of living, a commitment to better health outcomes and access to palliative care, cheaper childcare, better access to TAFE and training, better quality aged care and disability care, jobs in hydrogen and local manufacturing. And what did we have this week? We had those in that other place under Mr Dutton have voted against bringing manufacturing back to this country. He voted against Australian jobs. That's what those people on the other side, that's who they represent. Big end of town, not interested in moving the economy and growing the manufacturing industry. You have learnt nothing at all during COVID. And the crisis that we face by not having the capacity to manufacture the things that will keep our economy going because they allow jobs to go offshore. From day one, the Albanese Labor government has started the job of action and important reform. We've moved away from the wasteful 10 years in practice of the former government. We have ended policy paralysis in this country and we will reform our country for the better, to create a better future for all Australians. These are significant issues facing our country, including addressing the cost of living, secure employment, housing stress. What did they do for 10 years in housing? Why is homelessness one of the biggest social issues that we've been combating? We have been left with all the time bombs that you guys left behind. <coughs> Why is it that the growing cohort of homeless in this country are women over 55? Because for 10 years you guys did absolutely nothing. We are not ashamed of what we're doing, the social agenda that we're bringing to this par parliament. We want Australians to be able to have access to GPs and good health care, and we will always fight for more jobs in this country and bringing manufacturing back to Australian shores. The Albanese government is trying to put forward. We're moving forward, and we're doing what we can as we do it methodically, putting pressure on the cost of living to make sure that Australians are supported during what is a global phenomenon after the COVID epidemic and also with what's happening in Ukraine. So those on the other side are very fond of trying to rewrite history when they come into this chamber. But the reality and the facts speak for themselves. We supported the Fair Works decision to raise a minimum wage by $40 a week. What did those opposite do when they were in government? Nothing. They allowed wages to stagnate. That's what they did, and they're sitting over there very proud of their record. Order. They're proud of their record. Well, we supported a wage increase for aged care workers. Aged care workers are some of the most uh, under-resourced, under-respected, underpaid workers they were in this country. We've addressed that because you failed when you were in government for 10 <coughs> years to, to address that issue. This government is committed to keeping unemployment low, boosting productivity and ensuring Australia can provide locally and made supply chains as we go forward with the changing world that we live now while, unfortunately, Europe is facing the hardship and the difficulties of war in Ukraine. So what does the future hold and what have we achieved in the first nine months in office? In 2023, so many of our reforms will become reality. Cheaper medicines took effect on 1 January. Cheaper childcare will benefit 1.2 million families from 1 July. 180,000 fee-free TAFE places which we know over the last decade, not only at the federal Senators government but online, in the yeah. home state of Tasmania, the Alec, Liberals yeah. have always tried to defund and run TAFE into the ground. That's why we have a skill shortage in this country, because they don't want to support workers, they don't want to support training and skills and having jobs and manufacturing back in Australia. Work will begin on new renewable energy projects that will create jobs, boost communities and make sure Australia has a secure, reliable energy supply. And I, I'm glad that there's been no interjections from my Liberal Senate colleagues because they should know how important this is to their state and my home state of Tasmania. But every Australian will have the opportunity 
to celebrate the privilege we have to share this continent with the world's oldest continuous culture and to vote for a constitutionally enshrined voice to parliament. We know there is more work to be done. We are staying focused on building an economy that works for people, not the other way around. Our New Year's resolution is the same principle that has driven us since we were elected. Don't waste one day. Make the most of every day. We have achieved so much in nine months. Cheaper childcare for millions of Australian families, cheaper medicines, an increase to the minimum wage, six months of paid parental leave, net zero by 2050, paid domestic and family violence leave. These are critical issues to the Australian community. This is about the Australian people. Better protection for threatened species, flood relief and disaster ready fund. That's so important. We're having fires, we're having floods, flood after flood, and they impact not only on those individual families but the entire community. They need to be supported. That's what the Albanese government has done. That's why our flood relief and disaster ready fund has been crucial. And I'd like to hear make uh, comment and congratulate. Uh, Minister Watt on his contribution since coming to government that has been driving that relief. And it's fantastic to actually have someone now in that area of responsibility that gets it. He gets it and he's getting on with the job. He's not wasting one day. We will legislate for a national anti-corruption commission, unlike those for 10 years who did nothing and have tried to block that legislation going through and not being willing to sit down and have proper consultation and dialogue with us as a government of the day now. But we will always fight for more secure jobs and better pay. 2023, we'll keep up, we will keep up the good work. We will continue to build the nation so that every Australian has the opportunity in life to get ahead and to succeed. That's what makes up Labor members of parliament and Labor senators. It's the values which has driven me every single day that I've been in the chamber to be in the Senate and why I first joined the Labor Party as a very young person, because I believe in the values. I believe that we Senator should walk Pauline, together, not alone. Has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, and in rising today, to speak on um, the Governor-General's address to this place nine months ago. I do want to associate myself with the comments of Senator Canavan um, regarding how surprised I was uh, for it to be Thursday of the first sitting week back of the year and the government has already run out of things to talk about. Uh, the reason that we have the address and reply is so that we always have something to come back and talk to when we don't have anything else to talk about, when we've run out of legislation. Uh, and so that's why we're on this debate today. Um, and it certainly seems fitting, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, because we know that this government is very big on rhetoric and very small on substance. And that's why we are here on the third sitting day back of the year with nothing else to talk about. Because they have apparently uh, not got much of an agenda that they want to take through this place. Um, but speaking of <coughs> big on rhetoric and small on substance, it would be remiss of me uh, to stand here uh, and contribute to this debate today and not make reference to um, my Tasmanian colleague, Senator Polly's contribution, uh, where she spent about 10 minutes obsessing about the previous government uh, and only a small amount of her speech actually talking about what her government um, is seeking to deliver. And I think it's all very um, symbolic um, and symptomatic of the fact that this government uh, isn't delivering for Australians, that this government doesn't know how to deliver for Australians, um, and you know, the, the fact that they are obsessing about what happened uh, in months past rather than focusing on what they want to deliver for the future it should be pretty disappointing, I think, for anybody uh, listening into this debate today. Um, in compiling my remarks for this debate on the Governor-General's address today, it was interesting to look over the address now some months down the track and look at what the government was indicating its priorities were back in um, July when the parliament first reconvened, um, what those priorities would be then 
um, and consider what it has actually done in the intervening nine months. One of the main areas of focus for the government, according to the Governor-General's address, was the cost of living. And this is certainly the top concern of, of many people, many Australians, and particularly many people in my home state of Tasmania. It seems like every time you go to the supermarket, there's been another big price hike on a staple grocery item. The cost of basic essentials like fruit and vegetables, uh, breakfast cereals, meat are all costing families more and more, eating into family budgets. And of course, we know that the rising cost of electricity bills are forecast to continue rising dramatically. These are costs that families can't uh, avoid. We, we can't live with the lights off. We can't not eat food. So it is absolutely appropriate that tackling the cost of living should be a top priority of this government. And I assumed that that was why it was mentioned in the Governor General's address, in uh, um, address to this chamber. Yet one of the first actions of this Labor government was to ditch its own promise to bring power prices. De power bills rather down by $275. In the election campaign, Mr Albanese said that under Labor's plan, electricity <laughs> prices will fall from 2022 levels by $275 for households by 2025. $275 off your power bill is undeniably a very attractive proposition for many voters who are dealing with very tight household budgets and other rising costs. Um, that promise to Australians to reduce their power prices by hundreds of dollars in this term of government would have been, I think, incredibly influential uh, in assisting the Labor Party to win government. Uh, they mentioned this commitment something like 97 times during the election campaign. But just a couple of weeks after the election, Labor ditched the $275 power price cut promise, and we haven't heard much about it since. It's very strange that a government supposedly devoted to reducing the cost of living—like I said, the Governor-General mentioned it in his address to this place—made its first move to walk away from a promise to the Australian people to reduce their power bills in this term of government. And since then, we've seen the government's own budget forecasting astronomical price increases for electricity. And of course, all of these price increases are occurring in circumstances where interest rates have risen month after month after month, and indeed we had another, month, uh, another uh, interest rate rise um, for this month on Tuesday. Inflation remains high. All these promises that we repeatedly heard from Labor in the election campaign that your real wages would go up if you voted Labor weren't true either. In opposition, Labor promised Australians that the cost of living will be lower if they are elected. In government, it's their job to deliver on that promise, not to walk away from it and claim that it's no longer possible. There are, of course, global events occurring all the time which increase cost of living pressures for Australians. I absolutely recognise that. Yet these pressures could not have been said to have been unknown or unforeseeable when Labor went around the country in March, April and May last year promising that they would reduce the cost of living, promising 97 times that they would reduce Australians' power bills by $200-odd. It will not be acceptable for Australians for this government to make excuses and claim it is all beyond their control. Their promise to cut the cost of living was unambiguous and without caveat. The governor's address outlined a range of serious and pressing challenges. Cost of living, as I've discussed, low wages growth, pressure in health and aged care, global tensions, an economy in need of cheaper energy. And in the governor's address, it said the government is determined to tackle these challenges in the spirit of unity and togetherness as well as urgency. It does not want to waste a single day. These were the words and the commitment of the government. And yet, nine months down the track, Families around Australia are waking up, families bearing the brunt of skyrocketing costs of living, inflation, low wages growth, energy prices out of control. The Prime Minister's office was busy planting stories with the media about how he was going to make a speech accusing Australians of starting a culture war. Is this really what your priorities are? But this is the reality of the Labor government that we have. They said they weren't going to waste a day tackling the cost of living. But in reality, they aren't going to waste a day on spin and media tactics to try and distract attention away from the real problems facing Australians. And frankly, nothing summed this up better um, of what the government's real agenda was than the press conference that the Prime Minister held with an American basketballer six months ago. Was that what the government calls not wasting a day on tackling the challenges facing Australia in the spirit of unity and togetherness? Having a stunt media event with a basketball player to talk about uh, a local issue. It was instructive in the governor's address to look at the major issues for Australia, which barely rated a mention. 
Responsible budget management is going to be the key to the future of Australia, but in that address we got little more than a few lines of rhetoric. So it was no surprise at all when the government's first budget kicked that can down the road on all of the difficult decisions that need to be made. And, and goodness me, I'm looking forward to what might be in the budget in May because maybe there will be some answers for the Australian people. The government said that it would be prioritising spending that achieves the greatest economic benefit in the most efficient way. That is a promise that we in the opposition will be scrutinising very closely when the government hands down its budgets in the future and makes announcements. It is a promise that will be put to the test in the upcoming budget in May. Given what we've already seen from the government, it will be no surprise at all to see that promise, like so many others, being broken. Another area which barely rated half a sentence in the address was cyber security, but we have seen so much evidence over the last six months that many of the threats Australians are facing and will continue to face will occur online in the cyber realm. Millions of Australians have been victims of major hacking and ransomware attacks. This is not only the domain of major international crime gangs but also foreign governments. And we know the state-sponsored actors most active in cybercrime and malicious cyber activity are also the states who are destabilising the international order in other ways. Regimes like Russia, China, North Korea, Iran. We know for a fact that Australians and Australian organisations are being targeted by cyber actors affiliated with those states online. Just as we need to be able to defend ourselves in the physical world from nations which seek to use force to, to their advantage, so too do we need to be able to defend ourselves in the cyber world. And again, it was disappointing to not see that mentioned more highly in the Governor-General's address. It's not just cyber warfare and hacking that Australians need to be concerned about, though. It is deeply disturbing to many of us in this parliament that foreign-owned tech behemoths have so much influence over the minds and the welfare and the personal data of Australian children and teenagers. We are in an unfortunate period of history where we have allowed so much of our culture to be built around platforms which we know cause depression and anxiety in children and teenagers, particularly young girls. We know that these social platforms facilitate and transmit huge amounts of child sex abuse material. We know that they promote inappropriate sexualised content to young children and teenagers. And we know that these platforms allow adults with evil intent to follow, monitor and make contact with children without parents having oversight of who is speaking to their children. All of this is happening openly. It's not a secret or a revelation. At what point do we ask ourselves how this enormous amount of social harm is justified while these tech uh, platforms continue to be celebrated and promoted? I believe that the welfare of our youngest generations is being severely put at risk by social media behemoths. Yet rather than demanding action on these issues of child abuse and harm, these platforms and governments seem more interested in censoring political discussion and debate. Many experts, and I'm sure many of us here in this parliament, are extremely concerned about the welfare of future generations who, on the current trajectory, are going to be raised on a constant diet of social media fads, unrealistic and dangerous expectations and sexualised content. Uh, just finally, Mr Acting Deputy President, in my um, portfolio area as the Shadow Assistant Minister for Foreign Affairs, um, I would like to briefly touch on those el relevant elements of the Governor-General's address. In an increasingly insecure and unstable global environment, our relationships with our neighbours and partners around the world is more important than ever. The Governor-General's address rightly highlights the importance of the historic AUKUS agreement and the strengthening of our alliance with the United Kingdom and the United States. And we look forward to the imminent announcements of progress on AUKUS and our submarine capabilities, which we expect from the government very soon. The Governor's address refers accurately to an international environment far less certain than any other time in recent memory. It's important that the government continues to keep the Australian public informed and engaged about the reality of this situation. It is ultimately the Australian public which will pay hundreds of billions of dollars over the coming decades to defend our nation. And the public is entitled to be told the reality of why that expenditure and why that effort is essential. It is widely acknowledged by our allies and like-minded nations that Australia, under the former government, led the world in standing up to deliberate and sustained coercion by the Chinese Communist Party regime. That is something that uh, I am proud of to have been a government to, um, to achieve that aim, and I'm sure many of my colleagues are likewise proud. 
It is noteworthy that despite Australia having led the world in this area, this new government has made a point of repeatedly criticising the efforts of the previous government in regard to China policy. A core part of the reason we led the world was because we were honest and we were upfront with the public about the level of coercion Australia was experiencing. We must not fall back into a pattern of being timid to publicly discuss this coercion and other egregious breaches of international order, including human rights violations. For some time now, the demand of the Chinese government has been that Australia rein in open discussion of our concerns, not just at a government level, but also in the media and in the parliament. But Australia is an open democracy, and the government are accountable to the parliament and to the people. We are all entitled to openness and transparency. In fact, it is transparency itself which makes coercion by any foreign regime much harder to carry out. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Green. <clears throat> Thank you, President. Um, I rise to make a contribution in response to the address by the Governor General at the commencement of this 47th Parliament. And I'm really pleased to do so today. And while it has been a little while now since His Ex Excellency has addressed this Parliament, I'm grateful for the opportunity to reflect on those sentiments at the start of this parliamentary term. I have the benefit of six months of government, though, through which to reflect and remark on the address that was made. And while I was updating my remarks before this sitting of parliament, it occurred to me how um, pleased, it was, uh, pleased I was to see how consistent the themes of aspirations of His Excellency's address were with the reality of what our government has already achieved in the past six months. The Governor-General spoke about our ambition for a future made in Australia, where we invest in Australian workers, skills, supply chains and sovereignty through the National Reconstruction Fund. And I'm pleased to say that this legislation has been introduced into parliament, and despite what those opposite have said about their opposition, we are committed to bringing manufacturing back home. He spoke about the investment in Australia's infrastructure and something that has been a cornerstone of our first budget. Much of our government's work will be on restoring not only the reputation of our infrastructure department, ending the rorts and the waste and the colour-coded spreadsheets, but ensuring that our regions have the investment that they need for the future. The Governor-General also spoke about our government's commitment to climate action. And although there are many things that um, differentiate us from the previous government, our ambition on climate action has been the most stark. That's because, like most Australians, we recognise both the urgency and the opportunity that comes with taking action on climate change. Last year, Climate Change and Energy Minister Chris Bowen made Australia's first annual statement on climate change. In it, he laid out the urgency of action that is required. He said, Our country was devastated by the black summer bushfires just a few years ago. But as frightening as that bushfire season was, the absence of action will see temperatures and conditions of that year become the norm by the 2040s and become a good year by the 2060s. Our government is prepared to act to stem the tide of that forecast. We are prepared to listen to the science, to implement change, to deliver policies that create good jobs and to listen to what the Australian people voted for. I'm proud that one of our first actions in government was the support by, with many in this parliament was to pass the Climate Change Act. This legislation finally sets medium and long-term emissions reduction targets. With the passage of this legislation in our first 100 days, we provided, finally, certainty and stability to industry, to businesses and to the community that was missing for almost a decade in government. It means business, industry and investors can plan for our future prosperity with a new level of certainty and confidence. We took a careful and collaborative approach to determining our target because that's the kind of government we are and that's the kind of economy we are striving to create. This certainty delivers massive opportunity for progress in our economy and for our nation. 
Our Powering Australia plan is already making headway on aligning our climate ambitions with our economic goals. Last week, Minister Bowen announced a global partnership for investment in green hydrogen with Germany and the Netherlands. These partnerships are just a drop in the ocean of the work done by our government to re-engage internationally on climate. From COP27, the Quad to the G20, and our work with our Pacific family, we have resurrected Australia's international leadership on climate, one, of, one that was left for dead for over a decade. On a community and household level, work has already begun on 400 community batteries, which are part of the Albanese Labor government's commitment to complement our climate ambitions with our cost of living commitments. Our government is moving quickly to clean up the mess left by the previous government's failure to deliver an electric vehicle strategy. When we came to government last year, Australia's electric car sales were five times below the international average, at just 2 per cent of total sales. Our government has already passed on tax cuts to businesses who make the decision to invest in electric fleets. We have also partnered with the NRMA to develop our national electric vehicle charging network, making sure there's a, vast, a fast charger once every 150 kilometres on the average of Australian highways. Of course, as a government asking the Australian people to walk with us on this economy-wide transformation, we are committed to demonstrating commitment and integrity of our own. We are working with all arms of government to meet our commitment of net zero by 2030. We also know that in order to make good on our climate targets empowering Australia, we need infrastructure to be fit for purpose. Our electricity system is one of the biggest emitters, and if we reach our climate ambition, we need an electricity system to accommodate more renewables from 30 to 82 per cent of the grid in the next eight years. That is a difficult target to meet when we have had 10 years of inaction under the previous government. Our rewiring the nation policy will ensure our transmission infrastructure is up to the task, with its investment costed in our first budget. All of this nation building means good, meaningful jobs now and into the future. Through Powering Australia, our government is committed to creating 600,000 jobs, with five out of every six of those jobs being in the regions. Future generations will benefit from 10,000 new energy apprentices, and I look forward to seeing many of them in my backyard in regional Queensland. Now, as a regional Queenslander, I know how much anxiety and aspiration was built into debates about climate change and energy over the last decade. And hopefully, hopefully some of that divisiveness has now changed. We feel a lot in regional Queensland. It's a daily discussion. But regional communities like mine have always been the centrepiece to Australia's energy security and industrial prosperity. Regional Australia worked hard for the good fortune that the entire nation enjoyed over decades. We have rightly earned our place as a centrepiece of its future opportunities. Regional Australia is at the core of our plan to become a renewable energy superpower. Our communities will be central to our efforts to rebuild our manufacturing industry, underpinned by reliable and affordable energy. Regional Australia will lead the innovation and effort to re-establish our global industrial leadership. These commitments aren't just nice things to say or untested aspirations. They are already underway. We have hit the ground running and we are committed to delivering on our promises. I know this firsthand because a few weeks ago I was in Townsville with the Prime Minister and we announced $150 million is already earmarked for a green hydrogen project in Townsville. It's why Gladstone is one of the first places listed as a future location for regional hydrogen hubs in last week's joint announcement with the Netherlands. Australia's regions are hives of resources, skills and expertise. There is no better example of that than throughout central, north and far north Queensland communities that are so ready, who have been waiting for leadership, who finally have it and can't wait to get started. 
Australia is also fortunate to learn from the insights of, and expertise of First Nation communities and our natural environment. In my role as Senator for Queensland and the Special Envoy for the Great Barrier Reef, I speak directly with First Nations rangers, community leaders and traditional owners. It is their intimate knowledge of our country and of our natural environment that will ensure the success of our collective efforts on climate. This is why our Labor government is proud to work directly with communities to develop our very first First Nations clean energy strategy. It's why we're investing in the unique expertise and perspective of the Torres Strait, a beautiful part of Queensland, by developing the Torres Strait Climate Centre of Excellence. I'm lucky to have spent quite a bit of time in this place and to see firsthand the intimacy with which these communities understand the unique waterways in which they live. The water is a way of life in the Torres Strait. Working in respectful partnership with Torres Strait Islanders is one of our most promising strategies to protect the land, most importantly, the water that we all love, especially the Great Barrier Reef. I'm proud to have played my part in Australia's climate efforts in my role as Special Envoy for the Great Barrier Reef. Not only is the reef one of the seven wonders of the natural world, but it is a vital part of Australia's economic prosperity. 64,000 jobs rely on the reef, and those families and businesses are front of mind in all the work I do. I only wish that those families and those businesses and those jobs were at the front and centre of the mind of those opposite. The Albanese Labor government has already invested $1.2 billion in protecting the Great Barrier Reef and making sure it can be enjoyed for generations to come. When you consider the scale of communities and businesses and industries that are impacted by climate uncertainty, the inaction of the previous government becomes all the more shocking. This negligence is no better demonstrated than in our manufacturing industry. Manufacturers have been telling us for years that they need reliable, cheap energy to keep their doors open. With a sturdy climate ambition and clarity on safeguard mechanisms, our government is giving them exactly that, and it's paying dividends. Just recently, Minister Bowen opened and expanded the facility at Tindo Solar. Their growth shows that we have always had the skills and expertise to make our future energy needs here but we are just required the right economic conditions to make it happen. Certainty on energy, complemented by sound investment through our National Reconstruction Fund, means we are finally on the way for a future made in Australia. While I know I've painted a picture of optimism and opportunity, there are some, places who, some in this place who have spent their time in the 47th Parliament already trying to derail it. While there are some who let the perfect be the enemy of the good, there are those who don't even strive for good in the first place. The shameful record of those opposite on climate action didn't end on the May 29. Not even the election could change their minds. Not enough of those opposite do anything on climate for nine years. They followed it up by putting every obstacle they could muster to stop us from doing anything in government. Well, not enough that voters sent a clear message that they wanted to end the climate culture wars. Those opposite continued to roll out the same old, boring, scare tactics. Not enough that they came into this place and repeatedly whipped up hysteria about renewable energy. They follow it by arguing for the most expensive and slow form of power, the most expensive form of power, the hardest to deliver um, to the market, nuclear power. What I will give them when it comes to their one-pronged energy plan is that they will continue to be consistent with their conduct from their days in government. Purp propose something divisive, expensive and ineffective, provide no detail or where it will go or how it will work, and hope that everyone forgets that the flop of their plan they were flogging for months before. Those opposite will tell you that this challenge ahead of us is a zero-sum game that if you make progress on climate, you lose something that you enjoy. That could not be further from the truth. We won't lose what we love about the weekend just because we can make it easier to buy an electric vehicle. Investment in renewables won't be the end of good, rewarding, renewable regional jobs. 
The opposition have tried for too long to pull the wool over our eyes when it comes to what we know we have to lose if we don't act on climate change. In fact, inaction, lack of investment, ignoring the challenge is what will cost us the most. Our silver lining is the duality of our future if we get this right. Labor's future with a serious climate agenda is a thriving regional industry. It is a safe planet. It is a healthy, vibrant reef, a booming tourism industry, its electric vehicles, a weekend spent amongst our unique and pristine landscapes, its renewable energy, affordable, reliable power at home, all of the things that can be true at once, but only, only if we act with urgency. Uh, Australia has 15, so much to gain. Uh, Senator Green, you'll be in continuation. <clears throat> Are there any motion, notices of motion to be given for another day? <coughs> uh, Senator Hanson Young, are you seeking the call on motions for another day? Um, I seek that general business notice of motion at number 153 and 154 be taken together as well. No, I'm not doing. Oh, yes, I am. I was asking for notices to be. Uh, so we're looking for intentions to withdraw. I had. Thank Your you. Name whispered to me. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I seek to withdraw business of the Senate notice number one. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. That's done. We we'll now move to uh, business of the Senate. Oh, sorry. I'll now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone? Oh, selection of bills. I believe we're up to. Yes. Sorry, I've jumped ahead. Uh, so I'm calling Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I present the first report of, the, of 2023 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Report be adopted. So the question is, uh, Senator McKim. Uh, thanks very much, President. Um, we, uh, the Australian Greens, have an amendment to uh, the report, and just for clarity, it's a revised amendment that's been circulated. Um, recently, and for the benefit of the chamber, uh, if I could just make it very clear that this uh, is in relation to the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill 2023, the National Housing Supply and Affordability Council Bill 2023, and the Treasury Laws Amendment Housing Measures No. 1 Bill 2023, which the report proposes be referred immediately to the Economics Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by the 22nd of March. Our amendment is simply an amendment to the date. And it's proposing to change the reporting date from the 22nd of March until the 22nd of April. My understanding uh, is that this is not going to be um, supported by government. And I, I want to make the point here that this package of bills is um, the government's keystone response to a massive housing crisis that exists in this country. We have a situation, uh, particularly for renters, where if you're lucky enough to be able to find a place to rent, you are paying exorbitant rents in this country. We've got the Reserve Bank jacking up interest rates and smashing not only renters but mortgage holders. People are really doing it tough at the moment, and the government's response is a wholly inadequate response to the rental and housing crisis in this country. And that's why the government wants a quick and dirty inquiry into its legislation, because it doesn't want the absolute inadequacy of their legislative response exposed. And the Greens want a longer inquiry because we know there are significant improvements that could be made to the government's legislation, mm -hmm. but the government, very instructively here today, is not going to support the Greens call for a longer inquiry, and the reason they're not going to do that is because they know very well that their response to a massive housing crisis for renters and mortgage holders in this country is not going to be satisfactorily addressed by the bills that they are proposing and the, and the broader package of responses that the government is proposing. We know these bills can be significantly improved. We want a proper inquiry so that we can hear from a range of people out in the sector, from people who are doing it tough in the rental market at the moment, so we can hear from them about what they actually really need from government to address this significant crisis in our community. 
Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that the motion to amend, as moved by Senator McKim, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. the doors. So the question is that um, the amendment to the selection of bills committee moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I remind senators the use of mobile phones in the chamber is prohibited. Uh, Senator McKim, you, if you are teller for the ayes, and Senator Askew, you are teller for the noes.
order, there being 11 ayes and 36 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. So the question is now that the selection of bills committee report uh, unamended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired or postponed to, to rearrange the business? Senator Gallagher. Oh, thank you. I move that general business notice of motion number— Oh, no. It's, sorry. Oh. beg your pardon. That was to my bad. Is there any placing of business? Oh, it is placing. Beg it. Sorry. Please. Sorry. Um, I move that general okay. business notice of motion number 155 be considered during general business today. Uh, so the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Uh, President, Senator Hanson Young has given notice of intention to withdraw business of the Senate notice number one, which has the effect of postponing that notice to the next day of sitting. And committees have lodged extension notification, notifications as shown at item eight of today's order of business. Thank you. I remind senators that question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. The question is um, that no. And I'll remind senators there was a deferred vote from yesterday. So yesterday a division was deferred relating to a motion moved by Senators Lambie and McKim proposing the disallowance of the superannuation industry supervision amendment annual members meeting notices regulation of 2022. I understand it suits the convenience of the Senate to hold that division now. If there's no objection, I shall, put the, I shall put the question that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I, believe, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that the motion moved by Senators Lambie and McKim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 42 ayes and 21 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business and will move to uh, business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number two be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Pocock. I move the motion. So the question is that business of the Senate notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator David Pocock, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business. Notice of motion number 148, standing in the name of Senator Steelejohn. President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 148 relating to an order of production of documents um, in relation to the Australian deployment in Iraq be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Steelejohn. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number one. Oh, Senator Gallagher. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Thank you. Governor. The government will not be supporting this motion for the same reasons given in relation to an almost identical motion by Senator Steele John earlier this week. The Labor Party placed its views on these matters on the public record 20 years ago. While the Greens may wish to engage in historic accounting, the more important foreign policy priority that this government faces is the fact we live in the most difficult strategic circumstances since World War II. The government is focused on utilising all the means at our disposal through investing in our strategic and diplomatic capabilities to keep Australians safe. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Uh, so the question is that general business notice of motion number 148, standing in the name of Senator Steele John, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 148, standing in the name of Senator Steele John, be agreed to order. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 13 ayes and 43 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 149, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith. Is that you, Senator Askew? Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Dean Smith, I ask that general business notice of motion number 149 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 149, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith, and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. No. Uh, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We'll now move to general business. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 150 and 151, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, I ask that uh, oh, motion you, 150. Thank you, pardon, Senator, Senator um, Wish Wilson. Would you please resume your seat? Senator Gallagher. I actually was just going to jump because I thought you were just getting your papers together. But I just want to say, could we record the no, uh, our opposition to motion number 149? Yes, certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Please continue, Senator Wish Wilson. I ask that motions 150 and 151 be taken as formal. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 150 to 151 be taken as formal. Is there an objection to that? There being none, I call Senator Wish Wilson. I move the motions, President. So the question is that general business notice of motions number 150 and 151, as moved by Senator Wish Wilson, be taken, uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Um, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that General Business Notice of Motion Number 150 and 151, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 42 ayes and 21 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. We we'll now move to uh, notice of motion number 153, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Here you go. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I ask that general business notice of notices of motion at number 153 and 154 be taken together as formal motions. Uh, is there any objection to that? There being none, I call Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. I move the motions. So the question is that general business notice of motions. Oh, sorry, Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I think if motions number 153 and 154 have been moved together, um, we will need to vote separately on those motions. Thank you. So the question is. Yes. Okay. So I'm putting the questions separately. So start with 153. I will, I will ask that motion 153 be moved as formal. So the question is that the motion as, mo as moved by Senator Hanson Young, 153, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Yes. No. Division required. Ring the bells for. Four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 153, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 42 ayes and 21 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. We now move to general business notice of motion number 154, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Senator Waters or Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, thank you um, Madam President. I now ask that notice of motion number 154 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Thank you. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 154, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 156, standing in the name of Senator Hume. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Hume, I ask that general business notice of motion number 156 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator Askew. I move the motion. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Thank Minister. you. We'll, uh, we'll be opposing this motion, um, and I would urge the Senate. Uh, we released the B pause, the last B pause after the last budget, in a sign of transparency and accountability. That information was made public. What the Senate's now asking for is that we release our operational rules for how we're putting our budget together before our budget is put together. And I am saying that is unreasonable. We did what the Senate asked last time and released them after the budget. I think that's fair and reasonable. But asking me to release the guidelines that we're, we have in place whilst our budget is being put together is clearly a document that's in the deliberative stages and subject to Cabinet and ERC consideration. And I would note that those opposite never did anything like this when they were in government. They would never have released anything to do with the budget. Uh, and now you've got a new standard. Not only we have to do it before the budget's handed out, please, Senate, like be reasonable if we're trying to be more accountable and transparent. Uh, thank you, Senator Gallagher. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 156, standing in the name of Senator Hume, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Order. I lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 156, standing in the name of Senator Hume, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 40 ayes and 21 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Just before we move on, I remind all advisers that once the count is called, you are not to move from your seats. Are there any committee memberships? There are none. Are there messages from the House? The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Export Control Amendment Streamlining Administrative Processes Bill 2022 and Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill 2022. And I'll call the Minister. Minister. Um, I move that these bills may proceed without formalities and be taken together and be now read a first time. Okay, the question is uh, that the bills proceed without formalities, may be taken together and now be read a first time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. There was only one voice then, maybe. Eyes ha I think the ayes have it. Uh, I'll put the question again. Uh, all those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Export Control Amendment Streamlining Administrative Processes Bill 2022, Therapeutic Goods Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill 2022. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted? I move that the debate be now adjourned and the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. Uh, the question is that the debate now be adjourned and that the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Okay. Uh, a message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding a resolution agreed to by that House relating to the appointment of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the National Anti-Corruption Commission. Minister. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion to, to concur with the resolution of the House of Representatives. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the Senate concurs with the resolution of the House of Representatives relating to the appointment of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the National Anti-Corruption Commission. Okay. The question is that the Senate concurs with the resolution. Ah, Senator Subic. Yes, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to make a short contribution. Uh, you don't need to seek leave, right. Senator Schubert. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Greens, we can indicate we support and broadly support the terms of reference that have been um, uh, sent to us in the message from the other place. There is one area that we'd seek to have some clarification from the government on, 
Uh, the terms of reference permit the committee to appoint subcommittees to determine any aspect of the committee's jurisdiction. That's a fairly standard provision in, in committees that are established, particularly joint committees that are established, and it allows the work of the committee to continue um, with smaller quorums, a quorum of two, for example, with a subcommittee. Um, the concern that the Greens have, and which has been um, discussed with other parties in the chamber, is that that includes, with this NAC Oversight Committee, the ability to establish a subcommittee to do some work, uh, some of the statutory functions of the NAC Oversight Committee. And, and the, 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 cons the, the, the function that gives us greatest concern is the statutory power and the statutory function to concur with or to reject the proposed commissioners and deputy commissioners and inspectors of the committee. Uh, Madam Deputy President, you will recall that there was much discussion in the course of the NAC debate uh, about whether or not a non-government majority should have um, a say and a determinative say in um, agreeing or disagreeing with the government's nominee for the for the commissioner of the NAC of, of the NAC. Um, we, we eventually resolved that and supported the bill in its current form. Uh, but that was in circumstances where we had clear statements from the government uh, that the appointment of the NAC commissioner uh, would be engaged in in a good faith process and there would be um, the, the active seeking of consensus amongst the committee uh, for the appointment um, of the NAC commissioner deputy commissioners and the like. Uh, unfortunately, the terms of reference read, um, plainly read, permit that, that function of the committee, the concurrence or otherwise, with the government's proposed appointed commissioner, allows that to be delegated to a subcommittee of just three members and therefore would remove the need for the consensus amongst the committee, the political consensus amongst the committee that the government said, and I accept their good faith position, the government said was implicit in their model um, for the oversight committee. So there are a number of ways this could have been resolved. Sarah? Yep, there are a number of ways this could have been resolved. Um, one obvious way, of course, would have been to amend the terms of reference, to expressly exclude from the delegable um, power to a subcommittee to expressly, to expressly exclude that, um, that statutory function. This can probably be clarified by a brief statement from the government indicating they have no intention to do that and it will be a function for the whole committee. And I look forward to hearing the minister's position on this. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. And I thank Senator Shoebridge for that um, extended um, uh, remarks uh, to assist the government um, in this instance. Uh, I can advise the chamber that it is uh, the view of the government that the committee as a whole makes decisions and it works um, very much like other committees do, uh, where the committee members as a whole makes decisions and, and those decisions are acted upon. Well, S Senator on, Shubin, on all points relating the to the role of that committee, on all points. Okay, thank you. If there are no other speakers on this motion, I'll put the motion. And the motion is that the Senate concurs with the resolution of the House of Representatives relating to the appointment of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the National Anti-Corruption Commission. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. One more message. Oh, one more message. Thank you. Uh, the President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Higher Education Support Amendment, Australia's Economic Accelerator, Bill 2022, for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and for related purposes. Minister. 
I move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansart. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The motion is that the bill now be read a second time. All those in favour say aye. Uh, Minister, you've got. Oh yes, in accordance with standing or, or no, that's not me. Yes, that's right. We don't put the question. Okay. In accordance, this is actually for me, Minister. Uh, in accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned until March the 6th, 2023. Clark. Okay. Uh, it now being 12:15, we will go to item 14, and that is the attendance by a minister in relation to the 2022-23 budget. Pursuant to that order, I call on Minister Watt to provide an explanation. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I refer to the notice of motion from Senator Mackenzie, agreed by the Senate of 26 October 2022, for the order for the production of documents, Order 55. The Senator's request relates to correspondence between the Commonwealth and state and territory governments. The government claims public interest immunity over documents relating to the Senator's request on the ground that disclosure of such documents would cause prejudice to the relations between the Commonwealth and the states. Specifically, disclosure would harm the Commonwealth's ongoing relationship with the state government on this and future infrastructure funding arrangements. And I might just say, in anticipation of Senator Mackenzie's response, given her responses over the last couple of days to similar matters, uh, the approach the government is taking on this matter is no different to the approach taken by the former government when these sorts of circumstances arrived, uh, arose. Uh, and I think it is highly ironic that Senator Mackenzie, of all people, should be talking about transparency of funding. Thank you, Minister. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, and I rise once again to take note of the Minister's pathetic response to a request from the Senate, not the opposition, not me as a shadow minister, uh, but a request of the Senate, of this chamber, when senators of variety of political persuasions join together to say they want to understand the decisions of the federal budget, the arrangements that the Commonwealth has with state, uh, various state and territory governments around infrastructure funding, the cuts and delays that have typified the infrastructure funding in the latest budget. And all the Senate was asking was to give us the details because that's what this chamber is all about. It is actually about holding the executive government to account. And that is all we were seeking to do. And once again, the Labor Party has taken the lazy approach to accountability and transparency and has popped in and said, yeah, we know the Senate has ordered us to do this. But it's going to damage and prejudice relations with state and territory governments. Now, what I find incredible was one of the promises that the now government made prior to the election was that things would be better for the, with them, with the relationships with states and territories. Because let's face it, they're all Labor governments. They're all in the same tent, and the argument they put was that they would have be able to get along better with state and territory governments. And now they stand here saying they can't even release the details of correspondence about billions of dollars of Commonwealth taxpayer funds on infrastructure projects uh, with the states and territories because it will prejudice those relationships. Well, I would hate to think if, if Albanese and Palaszczuk's relationship is going to be prejudiced by fessing up to the cuts and delays and agreements they've made on the projects in Queensland, then we're all in trouble. If Premier McGowan, the Labor Premier in WA's relationship with the Labor Prime Minister Albanese is going to be prejudiced uh, because they're going to suddenly um, admit to the things that are on the public records in terms of cuts and delays in the Western Australian uh, infrastructure funding, well, you know, call me he. Premier Malinowskis, another Labor Premier. I very much doubt 
being open and releasing the correspondence between the South Australian gov Labor government and the federal Labor government around the cuts and delays to South Australian infrastructure programs that are all on the public record thanks to the budget will prejudice that relationship. Well, I think we've got a few problems. And similarly, Daniel Andrews, the newly elected Labor Premier in my home state of Victoria, and Labor Albanese government's prejudicing of relationships uh, if they actually fessed up and said, you know what, we did agree to give you $2.2 billion with no, uh, with no oversight, no Infrastructure Australia examination of the veracity of the suburban rail loop, and we'll cut those projects and programs that support rural and regional communities and the communities of Lilydale and Nari Warren and Berwick. And I was on the ground with Aaron Violi and Jason Woods only the other week looking at the cuts that this government has agreed between the Victorian State Labor government and the Commonwealth Labor government to critical projects on the ground uh, in suburbs and regions in my home state. It is a complete disrespect of the Senate and of accountability and transparency that this government said they would bring. It's absolutely appalling, but it's not surprising. We, on the 26th of October last year, the Senate required that the minister representing the Prime Minister, the minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government table the correspondence between the Prime Minister and the minister to any premier, chief minister, treasurer or any minister of the state regarding requests for or approval of Australian government funding for projects or programs in their October budget. Now, the Assistant Minister to the Prime Minister, uh, Patrick Gorman, made a claim of public interest immunity on the basis it would damage relations between the Commonwealth and state. Um, further disclosure of the information would harm the ongoing relationship with state government. And then on the 23rd of November, the Senate said, you know what, Assistant Minister to the Prime Minister, not good enough. We do not accept that public interest immunity claim. And then Catherine King, the Infrastructure Minister on the 28th of November last year maintained the same public interest immunity that had been rejected by the Senate. The thing is, when you make these public interest immunity claims around prejudicing the relationship between the Commonwealth or a state and territory, you've actually got to check with the states and territories if they have a problem with it. Yeah. You can't assume, uh, speak for states and territories and assume that they agree with you. You will find that out soon enough as government. You cannot um, you know, assume that you have their approval or their disapproval. And I would be asking the Prime Minister, the minister responsible, to actually come back to the Senate and put before us the fact that have they actually written to these chief ministers and premiers to ask if they mind, because we're talking about projects in the budget that are public. What have you got to hide? The amount of money, the projects that are being approved, the ones that have been cut, the ones that have been delayed, that's all public. That's all public. And it had to have been agreed with state and territory um, first ministers because they're the ones that build them. They're the ones that are actually in charge of uh, how that, those billions of dollars are being spent in their jurisdictions. So it begs the question, what have you got to hide Labor? And we've just sat through the formal uh, motion section of our agenda and seen the Greens, the Crossbench, the National Party, the Liberal Party all sit and vote for openness and transparency here, here. about the tabling of documents relating to key government decisions. And the minister, what, comes in here and critiques uh, you know, the opposition for this, for our voting record? Well, I tell you what, it wasn't much different to our voting record when we were in government. We backed, we backed the OPD claims when we were in government against our own government ministers. I'd like to see the same level of commitment to integrity and transparency and accountability and the role of the Senate from this executive. But it's all a bit Labor, isn't it? 
the, the culture, the little hush hush, right. backroom deals, nothing backroom to see voice. here, nothing to see here. The minister, when he made his public interest immunity claim, also uh, referred to um, you know, when they were in government and tactics used uh, by previous government. And you know what the Labor Party said uh, about any said tactics? They told us all how it'd be so much different under them. Yeah. How it'd be so much different under them. Yeah. Under them that, that, that governments should be providing the, the um, documents. Um, ministers can actually take it on notice, and the role of the Senate should be respected. Mm -hmm. Well, I would. Senator Gallagher on the 26th of February 2020 said, "This chamber has significant powers available to it to hold government to account, but in order to do that, all non-government senators have to stand together and work together." Yeah. Happened today. Look forward. Look forward to those documents arriving from the relevant minister in response to Senator Hanson Young's no, OPD request. This disregard for the Senate, said Senator Gallagher, that is being perpetuated, I think, quite knowingly by this government, must be responded to. You have to uh, be gobsmacked at the level of hypocrisy. Not only is this government backflipping on yes and no pamphlets for the referendum, backflipping on diesel fuel rebates, they are completely turning themselves 180 degrees on what they said they would do uh, when they were in opposition, and it is uh, very, very concerning. The problem for the minister and the executive and the government is their own secretary in Senate estimates talked about the letters between state uh, first ministers and the Commonwealth around the funding uh, cuts and delays and agreements on infrastructure projects, admitted that he wanted to put them up on the department website once he received them. If the secretary doesn't think there's anything to hide, I don't know why the minister Senator McKenzie, does. your time has expired. Senator McGrath. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I don't think I've ever seen anyone in this chamber move as fast as Senator Watt did just before. He scuttled out of this chamber like a rat up a drain pipe. I think he had. I think he was still pausing his, his contributions McGrath, and he was out the door. We have a point of order, Minister. <laughs> a point of order. Um, I'm sure it's against the standing orders to be. To be um, to talk about when a senator enters or leaves the chamber. Um, I, Minister, if that's your point of order, um, I believe uh, that that is has been routinely raised on both sides of the chamber. If that's your point of order, I don't find that there is a point of order. I ask him to um, withdraw his um, description of um, the minister. With that, uh, thank you, Senator McGrath. <laughs> Senator McKenzie, um, I'll s the minister, when he was in here, made a personal reflection of me. It is a personal reflection that previous presidents have actually ruled on, and I am, you know, pass it's passing strange that the minister feels that he needs to resort to personal attacks. Than actually deal with the matter before the Senate, which uh, is Senator the McKenzie, Labor Party's refusal to be open Senator and transparent. Senator McKenzie, if this is a point of order, the minister raised the point of order. Senator McGrath has withdrawn, and uh, I would call on Senator McGrath. Because what is fascinating, um, Acting Deputy President, is that the minister spent 55 seconds, not even a minute, 55 seconds, 55 seconds avoiding scrutiny. And of course, I would not want to breach standing orders by pointing out the, uh, the correlation between the minister's departure from, from this particular chamber and its resemblance to a, a rodent um, escalating up, up a drain pipe, because that would be against standing orders, Se and I have not Se done Senator that. McGrath, Senator McGrath, you are testing my patience. I would not want to test um, your patience. You, you've already withdrawn uh, that comment once. Uh, and, and I made and a point that I was not uh, alluding to that. But what is interesting, Acting Deputy President, is that we have a Labor Party who, before the election, did this great conga line dance, to quote one of their former leaders, around Australia, talking about the importance of transparency and accountability. But since the election, 
Similar to their promise about reducing power bills by $275, by the way, they have not mentioned transparency or accountability. And indeed, it's sort of like this, this, this negative black hole where certain words go into the Labor Party uh, lexicon and then just disappear. It's like, a, like a, uh, a negative dictionary. So the words aren't in the dictionary, there's just a white space there. So we have a Labor Party in power who, before the election, said, yes, we want increased transparency, increased accountability, but they get into power and they, go, and they, they sniff those, those leather chairs of power and, and, and they allude to the, the pheromones that are floating around the place and they decide, this is brilliant. We can avoid any scrutiny. We've got billions of dollars of taxpayers' money, not, not, not just tens of thousands or, or tens of millions or hundreds of millions. We've got billions and billions and billions of dollars. And we're going to use it as our, as our slush fund, and we're going to go around Australia. And guess what? We're not going to be accountable for it. So in this chamber, this House of Review tries to, not tries to, but does pass resolutions and says to the executive of, of this country that we want some accountability. We want to know how and where and why this money is being spent. We want, some, we want these documents. So what does what the, the Labor Party, the giant light on the hill that talks about transparent accountability, what's it a light on a hill? It's a bonfire of, of accountability, a bonfire of, of transparency that this, this so-called accountable government is anything but. And so what we've seen this week is the Senate at its best. Where you've had everybody from, from, from the Greens, the Coalition, to, to, to other crossbenchers come together to say to the executive, we want to know something that's going on here. We're elected. We're elected by the people of Australia. So, so, so you, you, you people, you ministers, you know, deliver on your promises. Show some accountability. This is what this chamber has done, but not just this week, in previous weeks. And what we've seen since the election is, is the Labor Party government become a, a closed shop on, on, on accountability and transparency. And, and that, that is, that is, it is shameful. It is hypocritical. And it is disappointing. It is so disappointing that, that the Labor Party would treat this chamber with such disrespect, but also treat the taxpayers of Australia with such disrespect. Because what we are talking about here is the expenditure of public funds. And when we talk about public funds, we're talking about money that comes from taxpayers. Now, I know there are some in this chamber, particularly those on, on the left side of, of, of the economic pendulum, who believe that there are things called ma magic, ma magic money trees, um, that, that money comes out of you know, a cash machine and you know, little pixies fill it up each day. But it comes from taxpayers. It comes from people who, who work, who start and run businesses, who employ people. It comes from people who want to go and work for people who run businesses. It comes from the workers of Australia. But oh no 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 no, we don't want we don't want any accountability there, nah. Because this is now one giant slush fund being run by the Labor Party, and it is so embarrassing. It's so embarrassing, acting deputy president, when the ministers come in here, and and poor Minister Watt, who did spend so much time before the election, attacking the previous government now comes in here and spends less than a minute, such as the, the disrespect that the Labor Party holds for this chamber and for the resolutions passed by this chamber, spends less than a minute. You know, we've got Minuteman what? Sorry, Minuteman minute, minute Minister. Uh, minute man, minute man minister. Minute man minister. 55 minute seconds. Man. How shameful is that? So shameful that people disrespect the taxpayers of Australia, to disrespect, disrespect the resolutions of this chamber, disrespect the role of this chamber, disrespect what we're here for. We're all here for what is good for Australia, what is good to make Australia a better place. 
And part of making Australia a better place, Acting Deputy President, is to ensure that public funds are appropriately spent and to ensure that the executive is held to account. And what we have seen since the election is this chamber pass what is called, for those who might be listen listening at home, uh, orders for the production of documents, OPDs. And what we've seen is order after order get passed by this chamber, and then sadly, day after day, hour after hour, that the Labor government then fail to comply with, with those orders, fails to, to supply those documents, fails to, to uphold standards of accountability and transparency. And that, that, that is tragic. That, that is tragic. Because the arrogance of this government, this arrogance of this government who come into this chamber and treat it with such disrespect. And that is a damning indictment on a government that is not even at its first year's mark, that, that not even at a 365-day mark will spend 55 seconds saying to this chamber, you are not important to us. The resolutions of this chamber are not important to us. And that, and that is wrong. That is wrong. Because it sets, it sets the standards for how, what this government will, will fail to achieve over the coming years. And we'll see what happens in estimates next week. And we're sure that in estimates next week uh, we'll have the great and the good um, representing the Labor Party sitting at the ministerial table. You know, great ministers like, like Minister, Assistant Minister um, uh, Brown over there, um, who I hope, I hope we will, will, will go beyond the very low standards set by some of her colleagues in terms of being able to answer questions and provide the documents. Because this is above party politics. This is above the, 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 the yaboo politics that you do sometimes see in this chamber, which is part of a vibrant a democracy. This, at its core, at its very, very core, is about this chamber living up to its promise as a chamber of review, as a chamber that can hold the executive, executive to account. Because that is what this chamber does, and that when it does it, that is what this chamber is at its best. But sadly, the other side of that coin, the other side of that coin is we've got a government at its worst, a government who will not only not provide the documents that this chamber has ordered, it's not like a polite request. It actually is an order of the chamber, by the way. You know, the Prime Minister talks about good manners. Well, good manners, Prime Minister, would start with you instructing your ministers to comply with orders of this chamber. The Prime Minister says, oh, we want a nicer, kinder type of politics. Well, comply with the orders of this chamber. Instead, the Labor Party ministers snub their noses at this chamber. They snub their noses at the people of Australia. They snub their noses at the taxpayers of Australia. They snub their noses at what this chamber does. And that is shameful. It is a shameful indictment on the modern Labor Party of how they treat the government of Australia as nothing but a, a plaything for them and their union mates as something in where they ensure that what they get up to, they want to do in the deep, dark, secret corners. No, be accountable, be transparent, be, be the promise that you said you would be. Do what you said you would do, but no, you're not. You've just, you've just, just, you're just not very good. And actually, you're not beyond not very good. You're Senator rubbish. McGrath, be your better. Your time has expired. Senator Scar, are you oh, seeking the you. call on the same matter? Yes. yes. Senator Scarf. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And it is always a privilege. It is always a privilege and a deep honour to follow my good friend Senator McGrath <laughs> from the wonderful state of Queensland. And I'd like to I'd like to associate myself with all of the remarks that Senator McGrath made during his contribution to this debate, including his reference to various types of marsupials or animals and plumbing. Now what people need to understand in relation to this debate and, and those members of the gallery, what we are talking about here is that this chamber, a majority of this chamber, and, and the coalition can't achieve a majority in this chamber in its own right, no. but the coalition, in addition to crossbench senators, independents, crossbench senators and the Greens, all of us, a majority in this chamber, passed a resolution 
requiring the government to produce documents. So a majority of this chamber, across all of the parties and independents who aren't in government, supported a motion that the government produce documents to this chamber. And everyone sitting in this chamber has an obligation to discharge our duties to each of our states as a House of Review. And we want to see the correspondence in relation to the budget relating to major infrastructure projects, the correspondence between the federal government and each of the states. That's the background to this debate. That is the background to this debate. And in order to discharge our duty as a House of Review, a check, a check on the power of the executive, we need access to those documents. And a majority of senators determined that. And the response, the 55-second response, 55 seconds. That's all we got in terms of a response from a majority of the senators in this chamber requesting those documents. The 55-second response was no, because it might damage relationships between the federal government and the state government. OK, well, let's look at that. Now, if you're going to use that as a reason, I say, I say at the very least, you've got to pick up this thing called a phone and ring the state governments and ask them if they have an objection. Isn't that, isn't that you, you do your best you do your best to fulfill the request of the Senate. So the first thing you do is pick up one of these things called a phone and actually ask, do you have any objection if we provide these documents? Now if then the state government, the relevant state government objected, then come back to this chamber and tell us whether or not each of the state governments rejected that request. And then each of those state governments has to be responsible to their constituents as to why they rejected that request. That's how the system should work. But there's no transparency in relation to either a the documents because they refuse to provide them, the government refuses to provide them, or b the process. What was the process? Maybe you didn't ask the question because you weren't sure what the answer would be. Maybe the state governments would have said yes. And then you wouldn't be able to raise the argument that it might damage the relationship between the federal government and the state government. So don't ask a question if you don't know what the answer is going to be. We had exactly the same, exactly the same issue arise earlier this week with respect to the redevelopment, proposed redevelopment of the Gabba Cricket Ground in my home state of Queensland and the potential e impact on East Brisbane State School, a state school that has been in existence since 1899. And my, my state government in Queensland, the Palaszczuk Labor government, is talking about a redevelopment of the GABA. It was a $1 billion redevelopment. It's become a $2.5 billion redevelopment, which would provide a staggering 8,000 extra seats—8,000 extra seats for $2.5 billion. And that school community—and community, I've spoken to people who have gone to that school, and I took my good friend, the opposition. Uh, spokesperson, Senator Rustin, uh, on a tour of that school, beautiful school. They want to know the future of their school. What's going to happen to their school? And they've got a right to answers in relation to those questions. They have a right to know. And yet all we get, all we get is a blanket refusal and not even bothering to pick up the phone and ask the state governments whether or not they would object. Because if at least you did that, then the people of Queensland could rightly go to the Queensland state government and say, well, why are you objecting to that? We have a right to know. In conclusion, I'd, I'd also like to say we always know, we always know when we've hit the mark with Minister Watt, when he, uh, he goes from dealing with the substance to the point and makes personal reflections on those on this side of the chamber. And I just want to say about my friend and colleague Senator McKenzie, I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone could, have could have discharged their obligations to this place with as much decency and honour as Senator McKenzie did during the course of the last parliament. Mm -hmm. I think she met every single standard that should be expected of a, of a minister in the Westminster system, and uh, she should be applauded for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, uh, I thank uh, Madam Acting Deputy President for the opportunity to make those remarks. Uh, thank you. Uh I'll just take some advice from the clerk. We, we still have time for the debate. Yes, so Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. 
Well, just as a little bit of a, a, a maybe a history lesson or a lesson around how this chamber operates and how this parliament operates, public interest immunity, as defined on our own parliamentary um, website, um, is under the doctrine of public interest immunity, historically described as crown privilege. The executive government may seek to claim immunity from requests or orders by a court or by a parliament for the production of documents on grounds that public disclosure of the documents in question would be prejudicial to the public interest. Now that all seems pretty sensible to me. But the Not big problem that we've got is that we seem to have at that point deviated significantly from the process. <laughs> the claim made by the minister when he came in here briefly before was that it would prejudice relations between the Commonwealth and the states. And uh, following on from uh, the contribution from uh, Senator Scar, I'll read to you what that actually entails. The information concerned belongs to the states as well as the Commonwealth and therefore should not be disclosed without uh, seeking the approval of the states. The obvious response to this is that the agreement of the states to disclose the information should be sought before the government That's refuses right. to provide the information and must be given the opportunity to give reasons why such an objection should be sustained. So what we've got here right now um, is a government who has just gone, we have public interest immunity ability, we're going to apply it, we'll just forget about all the process that sits in between it. And as rightly pointed out by Senator Scar, a conversation with the South, with the South Australian government yesterday, with the Queensland government yesterday and every government in Australia today on the grounds of this particular claim would actually have enabled this government to have followed an appropriate process. That's right. You do not care about process. You right. do not care about it. And quite clearly, even a convention as important as public interest immunity in this place is completely disregarded. And it's also interesting to note that you cannot claim public interest immunity, and this is actually by a doctrine from the Clerk of the Senate, Harry Evans, one of your guys, who said advice order, to government. Order, Senator Rustin, <laughs> uh, the, the use of the term you is now oh, becoming very okay, frequent. I, I, so I, I I'll just apologise. <laughs> I'm sure you're I'm aware sorry, of the order. I apologise so very sincerely. I will be more respectful. Thank you, um, Senator yeah, Rustin. So the advice was actually received um, by, you, from, from Harry Evans. But um, it says that advice to the government is not exempt um, through public interest immunity, but it also says that working documents are not exempt from public um, interest. Uh, sorry, are exempt from public interest immunity. Um, and so, therefore, what we would seek for those opposite to come back and the minister to come back into this room is come back and tell us what conversations you've had with the state and territories and what That's objections right. have That's been right. put forward by them, why these documents can't be released, and also come back into this place and provide us with any information um, that is outside of the scope of that claim as by the guidelines that are defined by the previous clerk of this place. But it's embarrassing. It's really embarrassing. There's no reasons why you can't release much of this information. Seconds. Firstly, the tables outlined, the, um, outlined the list of funded projects were disclosed to the Senate seconds, in the ARAC right? committee on the 2nd of December by the minister. That's right. Speaking for the minister, the department secretary, Mr Betts, advised the minister conceded that the states and territories had adequate time to consider the budget funding tables. These tables are now also listed on the Federal Financial Relations it's website for anyone to per peruse. Now, how in the world could the government justify a public interest immunity to schedules contained in letters where the schedules have already been disclosed? <laughs> so this leaves the tabling of the cover letters themselves between the Prime Minister and the Minister in the States and Territories. So what we have been told is true. These letters should not be controversial and there should be no reason to withhold them from the Senate. There should be no reason for the states to be sensitive about the contents of those letters. We are talking about letters that have been discussed and disclosed <laughs> by Mr Betts, the Secretary of the Department of Iraq, in Senate estimates. You guys are running a protection record. Thank you, Pee. Senator Rustin. The question is that uh, the motion to take note moved by Senator McKenzie be agreed to. Uh, all those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Government business, order of the day number three, Governor-General's opening speech, resumption of the adjourned debate on the motion for the address and reply. Senator Cox. Thank you. Uh, Acting Deputy President, now I know it's some time uh, ago and as others in this place have mentioned since uh, this uh, item was, um, uh, the Governor-General actually gave his address. And in that address, the Governor-General stated that the government is committed to engaging closely and respectfully with 
First Nations people and the Australian community more broadly, in particular ahead of the upcoming referendum. Uh, it shouldn't actually take an item of the government's agenda to treat First Nations people in this country with respect. This respect should not be limited to a referendum process, and First Nations people should be treated with respect from the day our land was actually invaded and every day since then. And yet, First Nations people are continuing to fight for their land and their sea country, for the protection of their cultural heritage, and in particular, for their human rights in this country. And unfortunately, much of this has already been destroyed. We see this particularly at Mirajuga and Strukan Gorge, and the development projects such as the Barossa, the Beedaloo, Scarborough and the Narrabri gas fields. The list actually goes on and on and is quite extensive. And time and time again we've seen cultural heritage for traditional owners tossed aside in the name of corporate interests. Murujuga contains the largest and oldest collection of rock art in the world. And as of this week, it has been referred to the UNESCO World Heritage Protection uh, Committee. And yet, this government will not commit to stopping the expansion of projects on the Burrup Peninsula that continue to destroy this ancient cultural heritage. They have, in fact, continued to help fast track Pluto 3 and 4, the acid rain that rains down from the emissions, destroying this wonderful rock art and, in fact, impacting on the song lines of the Seven Sisters in this area. And traditional owners originally refused permission to have these rocks relocated on multiple occasions, and in particular the Circle of Elders, making it clear that their preference was actually for this rock art to remain undisturbed and intact, and only agreeing to the removal of this, those rocks that contain that rock art once they were advised that this, in fact, wasn't possible or even an option for that to remain intact. Nothing about this process at Murujuga respects the principles of free, prior and informed consent. It is coercion, it is manipulation and it has continued through a 40 year old, let me repeat that, 40 year old BIMIA agreement by the state and the traditional owners in that area. And this agreement allows industry to run rampant there. And traditional owners to, you know, have a little say on the side and be consulted with. But in fact nothing in this is about consent in that agreement. And it clearly does not outline their consent. Um, in relation to the removal of those rocks, what's happening with Pluto 3 and 4 and the expansion of the Woodside project there. The uh, traditional owners clearly did not consent and reluctantly, after much discussion with the state government, federal governments, in fact the campaign on Save Our Songlines has submitted their Section 10 protest to this uh, removal of rocks, both here, uh, where the fossil fuel industry grows right before their very eyes, but also for the Perdamon fertiliser urea plant uh, site. So let's move to the Tiwi Islands. The traditional owners challenged NOPSEMA, who is the independent regulator and Santos over their lack of consultation. Now, lack of consultation is putting that really, really nicely for the Barossa gas project. And guess what? They won. And they won because there were two emails and an unanswered phone call because that was all that Santos thought. The tra traditional owners from the Manupi clan, one clan group of eight, deserved as part of consultation now tell me, fellow colleagues in this chamber, does that sound like respectful engagement to you, for people whose land it is? And this case has in fact set a precedence, a legal precedence now, to put fossil fuel companies in this country on notice, and so it should. And so it should. This has sector-wide implications 
And I congratulate the Manupi people of the Tiwi Islands, their traditional owners, for taking a stand against industry. And in fact, they are the cultural giants. They are the people that deserve to be consulted, deserve to provide their consent for what is happening on their land and sea country. Now, these sites are not just important for traditional owners, they're important to all of us. First Nations people or not in this country. This is our collective history, it is our culture, and we should be all proud of this. We should be all eager to protect it. And it's unacceptable that time and time again, First Nations people were being forced to give up. In fact, they're made to stand by as bystanders and watch people rip the soul out of our country and destroy our water, and we are left standing there as innocent bystanders, unable to say anything, because cultural heritage is for sale in this country and it's for somebody else's profit. Time and time again, we've heard that cultural heritage laws in this country are too weak and they must be strengthened. And the government now must walk the talk because at this moment, they're doing what this government did before and before and before. Successive governments' legacy that they leave behind, which is about taking advantage of these weak laws, and it's at the expense of traditional owners in this country, and it's at the expense of First Nations cultural heritage in this country. Now, you may ask, what is the solution to that? Well, the solution is very simple. It's adopting all three elements of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, plus stronger cultural heritage laws and other legislative changes like the ratification of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. These all play a pivotal and important role in protecting our cultural heritage, and I will keep fighting for all of them to be included. Now, the quote that the Governor-General mentioned during his speech is that this government will invest in First Nations management of land and waters, humbly recognising the skills and knowledges gained over tens of thousands of years. Great statement, but once again, we must centre and we must make sure that the respect for First Nations science, which should have already been done from day one, is actually actioned, is done, is there. It's not allowed to be moved and taken away. And if our deep connection to our water and our land and our precise methods of maintaining our vast and diverse lands that have been supported and not systemically destroyed by people who came here after that, we could be living, in fact, in a very different nation now. But once again, we have to fight for hundreds of years just to have our ancient knowledges both acknowledged, respected, but also taken seriously. Now, I really look forward to seeing the government's genuine investment in First Nations science as the Australian Greens portfolio holder for science. And the government treating it on equal footing as they do with Western science in this country. One is no better than the other, and there are systems for deep understanding in which the world we live. We, as the traditional owners and custodians of this country, have been carrying it for it for tens of thousands of years. It is well beyond time that we strengthen and make stronger legislative standards surrounding First Nations cultural heritage and allowing First Nations people to take a self-determined role to care for their own land and water. We may not be able to recover what we've lost, but by God, we could absolutely protect what is still left. But we have to act now. And it is, in fact, why I am here in this place. And I will continue to raise my voice, to continue to hold this government to account, just as we've heard from uh, members of the opposition, uh, the Greens will continue to talk about the issues that are important because we don't want this referendum to be a farce. We don't want this process 
to not deliver any of the important things that I've just referred to and that the Governor General came into this place and talked about when we all started here last year. We want a process that is fulsome, that is going to deliver outcomes for First Nations people in this country, because we can't just keep hearing the rhetoric that people keep talking about this as it's over there. This is an issue that needs to be centred in this place, and it is now time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. I call Senator Walsh. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I too rise to speak in response to the Governor General's address uh, at the opening of uh, this 47th Parliament. Uh, and given the importance of uh, the ongoing process of reconciliation uh, in that address uh, and to our own government's agenda, uh, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today uh, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and I also want to extend my respect to the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people, the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work in my home state of Victoria. Uh, and I remind the chamber that it was the Rudd Labor government uh, back in 2008 that invited traditional owners to first hold such a welcome to country uh, ceremony as we are so often now uh, accustomed to participating uh, in here in this parliament. Uh, and on that very same day, uh, it was the Rudd Labor government that delivered the national apology um, to First Nations people. Um, both were important steps in the long march towards reconciliation. And under the Albanese Labor government, we will take another significant step towards reconciliation by implementing the Uluru Statement from the heart in full. It's a statement that invites us to walk alongside First Nations people uh, in a movement for a better future, a future that calls for a voice for treaty and truth. Uh, and this year, a referendum on the voice will occur, uh, and it's about two things, recognition and consultation. The voice will empower First Nations people because for too long, decisions have been made about First Nations communities and not with them. And I'm proud that in my home state of Victoria, the Andrews Labor government uh, is well underway in our own treaty and truth-telling process. The Australian people will have the opportunity to embrace the invitation of the Uluru Statement from the heart under our government, a process that we can all engage with as we move forward together. Um, the federal election back in May last year um, offered Australians a real choice, uh, and it was a choice between more of the same uh, from those opposite um, or a change of direction with an Albanese Labor government, a Labor government committed to delivering a better future for all Australians. Uh, and back, th back then, the people made their choice, uh, and we are getting on with delivering that future. We're tackling the big challenges that we face uh, with the mix of urgency uh, and steadiness characteristic of our team. We're taking real action on climate change. We're repairing our international reputation and strengthening relationships with our Pacific family. Um, we're getting on with the job of rebuilding Australian manufacturing by establishing the National Reconstruction Fund. We're strengthening our Medicare system to ensure access for all. We're putting transparency, integrity and compassion back into politics uh, and facing the cost of living crisis and the inflation pressure head on. Um, in my first speech, I spoke about the jobs crisis that we face in this country. Uh, I spoke about a crisis of low and stagnant wages and rising job insecurity, uh, a crisis that the former government not only refused to address but celebrated as a deliberate design feature of their economic plan. 
Uh, and as I said back then, we needed to change direction, and we have. I said at the time uh, that we needed governments to get back in the driver's seat and back to work. And I'm proud that the Albanese Labor government is doing just that. We've put good, secure jobs at the centre of our plan for a better future. We've put determination to deliver at the heart of our government, starting with successfully advocating for a real pay rise for Australia's lowest paid workers. Uh, and in doing this, we brought together unions, employers, community groups and governments to map the path forward to deliver secure, well-paid jobs and strong, sustainable wages growth, allowing Australians to not only keep their heads above water, but to actually thrive and flourish. We know that the Australians who sent us here are counting on us. So we're bringing our connection with Australian workers and the struggles they face right onto the floor of this parliament. We're bringing their stories and their determination for a better life to the heart of our government. Stories of hope to earn enough to be free from worry. Stories of need for more security to buy a home and plan for the future. Stories of belief that in Australia, of all countries, a fair day's work for a fair day's pay is never too much to ask. And we will always stand up for the women workers of Australia. And we will always stand up for women to be safe at work and at home and everywhere. It's why we legislated 10 paid days of domestic and family violence leave, uh, as I had the privilege to speak about in the chamber yesterday, after what I can only describe uh, as a truly remarkable and inspirational speech from uh, my colleague uh, representing the Northern Territory, uh, Malandiri McCarthy, um, about the challenges of uh, family violence uh, in her community. Um, because we want to stand up for women being safe everywhere, um, paid domestic and family violence leave is in place in this country today, uh, and it's a policy that will save lives. Because we want to stand up for the women of Australia, um, we put gender equality uh, at the heart of our industrial relations system. We've made it an objective of the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill uh, that passed the parliament last year. Um, it's why we've introduced uh, just now in this sitting the Workplace Gender Equality Bill spearheaded by uh, the Minister for Women and Finance, Minister Gallagher. Um, we will not ignore the women of Australia. We have never ignored their pain or their protests. Uh, and we have not shut them out of our own party. Uh, indeed, we are proudly a government with 52 per cent of women on our benches, uh, and we are here to listen to the women of Australia, and we will. We will also fight for good, secure jobs in manufacturing, uh, as we are doing right now um, with the passage of the National Reconstruction uh, Fund Bill through the parliament. Uh, and my home state of Victoria is the heartland of Australian manufacturing, uh, and it's something that we Victorians are really proud of. Victorians and all Australians want us to make more of what we need right here at home. Australians want to be proud that we can stand on our own two feet, and they want a government that invests in industry, industry that can deliver the quality jobs of the future, jobs that Australians can count on. So I'm proud uh, to be here as part of an Albanese Labor government that has hit the ground running, that's prioritised rebuilding Australian manufacturing. Uh, and the contrast couldn't be clearer uh, with the previous government when it comes to Australia's manufacturing industries and our sovereign capability. The previous government pushed the car industry off a cliff. They failed to seize the opportunity of an Australian-made path to emissions reductions, and they failed to prioritise Australian medical manufacturers even during the pandemic crisis. They sat back while thousands of manufacturing jobs were lost every year. Our government's vision for a better future is one that is made right here in Australia. 
uh, and uh, our flagship legislation to achieve that uh, is the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund. Uh, what we know on the government benches uh, is that this reform will support our communities by creating good, secure jobs that are well paid in our manufacturing industries. Uh, and at the same time, we will be able to diversify and grow our economy and ensure our supply chains and our sovereign capability. By putting Australian manufacturers first, we'll ensure that our path towards net zero emissions is one that actually creates Australian jobs. Because there is a global race on to seize the opportunities of a renewable energy future. But we all remember how the former government felt about races. Instead of putting Australia at the front of this global race, they wasted nearly a decade. Uh, the former government was just too divided to agree on the science of climate change and the solutions that we need to put in place to embrace a renewable energy future. They were too busy fighting each other to step up and lead, uh, and instead they've left us behind the rest of the pack. Um, but what we know as the Albanese Labor government is that our country and our region are facing the worst of this climate emergency. We know that Australia has the chance to become a renewable energy superpower, and we know that Australians, more than anything, just want us to get on with it. They want an end to the climate wars, and it's why we legislated our emission reduction targets of 43 per cent by 2030 uh, and net zero by 2050. Um, and it's why we're getting on with creating new jobs in the industries of the future, industries like wind, solar and battery manufacturing, um, with announcements on uh, a focus on the battery industry made by uh, Minister Husic um, just this week. Um, these are jobs that are important in my home state of Victoria, where we're building offshore wind in Gippsland uh, in partnership with the Victorian state government. The Albanese government has a plan to deliver more jobs, more opportunities and more economic growth for our country, while we also play our part to act on the world's climate emergency. We're also getting on with the job of delivering meaningful investments that maximise economic impact and meet community needs. We understand that cost of living is hitting Australians hard. Uh, and our economic plan is a direct and a deliberate response to the challenges facing the economy, uh, most notably cost of living. And that's why one of the very first acts of this government was to successfully argue for the minimum wage to keep pace with inflation, an outcome which helped around 2.7 million Australians keep their heads above water. Our October budget focused on cost of living relief that didn't put any extra pressure on inflation, uh, and that was the critical objective of our October budget. Uh, and that approach, um, that calm and sensible approach, was noted by ratings agencies. Uh, in affirming our AAA credit rating, they actually pointed to the fact that our budget did not add to inflation pressure as a factor in their decision making. We are delivering more affordable housing, including through the new National Housing Accord. We're making childcare cheaper and expanding paid parental leave. We're delivering 180,000 fee-free TAFE places in 2023. We're making medicines cheaper. We are the first government ever to reduce the PBS co-payment. Uh, and this will mean that the maximum Australians will have to pay for essential medicines on the PBS is $30 saving around $300 a year for the average person uh, and ensuring that no one has to miss filling a script because they just can't afford the medications they need. Pensions, allowances, rent assistance, all increasing in line with inflation. Uh, we've also brought in the new pensioner work bonus so older Australians can keep more of what they earn without affecting their pension. Uh, and we're proud to be getting wages moving again. Over the past three years, we have taken the time to listen to Australians. 
uh, and we've been able to bring the stories of Australians right to the heart of our new government. We've heard their stories of hope for a better future. We've heard their stories of need for more security in their jobs and in their lives. Uh, we've heard the belief of Australians that we can be better together, and we share that belief, and we're fighting for it. We have a hope for a better future for our next generation. Uh, we know people need security to plan their lives, uh, and we know that together we can build a more caring society and one that is strong and diverse and builds people up, not leaves them behind. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, it's just been uh, over half a year since the Australian people elected uh, the Albanese Labor government with a vision for a better future. And we've not wasted a single moment, as uh, other senators would have heard also from the comments from my uh, uh, good friend and, and senator for the state of Victoria. But we've, the government has also successfully argued uh, as one of the very first um, acts coming into office uh, for a significant uh, increase to the minimum wage, which was over 5 per cent. Now, after almost a decade uh, of the former Liberal and National government deliberately keeping wages low. As pressures on global supply chains right around the world and increased interest rates continue to put upward pressure on cost of living, this was an integral part uh, of ensuring that wage increases ensured that the purchasing power uh, of everyday Australians, mainly our lowest paid workers, did not slip backwards. For too long, the federal government uh, hadn't been in the Fair Work Commission arguing on the side of workers to receive their fair share. In fact, uh, they'd been happy to see wages fall in real terms, famously describing low wage growth as a deliberate design feature of their economic architecture. The real wages of uh, essential workers, uh, you know, th those who were in the retail stalls, uh, uh, those working in hospitality, the cleaners, our nurses, all those workers on the front line during COVID uh, who were working uh, long hours to making sure that we all were managed to get to the supermarket, get our food, uh, get our um, masks, you know, work uh, tirelessly throughout the night to ensure that we were kept safe. Uh, really uh, got us through the, the pandemic, the worst of that pandemic, and unfortunately their wage has been slipping for many, many years under the coalition government. Uh, but now these workers finally have a government that is on their side and is going into the independent umpire arguing on their behalf for increased wages. Uh, a Labor government arguing for decent wage increases that keep with the cost of living and is already bearing the fruit with the Fair Work Commission's most recent decision. And this is on top of obviously the, the government's uh, calls, uh, commitment to increase wages for those in the aged care sector and other sectors that have been underfunded for many, many years. Of course, wages aren't the only thing working people are worried about, and we are all concerned about the retirement outcomes. And the most essential ingredient for a successful retirement is a healthy superannuation balance. Now, the Liberals uh, have always been on the wrong side of the super debate, uh, sadly. Uh, they have undermined super by endlessly delaying uh, increases in the superannuation uh, guarantee and, and using it as a, as a fix for their own political problems, their own uh, problems uh, internally within the coalition. But in contrast, uh, Federal Labor believes in a very strong super system, one that actually works for members delivers uh, positive returns on behalf of working Australians. Now, we know that super plays an important role in our economy uh, and is essential to ensuring that positive retirement outcomes for working families. So it was very positive to see uh, a permanent increase in the superannuation guarantee from 10 per cent to 10.5 per cent. And what does this mean? It means that for the average worker, they'll see around an extra $15,000 when they come to retire, a very significant increase for millions of Australians. Another major focus of our government has been repairing and improving our international relationships. You know, it was only three days after the federal election that the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, was representing Australia at the Quad Leaders Summit, asserting our commitment to liberal democratic values and a free, open and resilient Indo-Pacific, uh, especially with uh, you know, the issues that we've had to deal with over the last uh, little while, uh, 
with respect to uh, China and other issues. But we do recognise the fact that it is in the mutual interests of nations that are committed to democracy to collaborate in multinational uh, and multilateral bodies like the Quad. And it was very important to see the Prime Minister uh, represent our country at that meeting. Now, our involvement in these bodies does not in any way dilute or compromise Australian values. Rather, it engages in the international community, and that, that is the way that I see that it is responsibly to assert and protect our values that we have fought so hard for in the region. I have been particularly pleased to make contributions to these efforts as the newly elected chair of the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee, and I am very passionate about ensuring our values are protected and asserted on the world stage. And I do look forward to continuing to work with all my colleagues on the committee in Australia's national interest. Um, you know, Australia has had a proud history of standing up uh, within our own uh, or in terms of the international uh, backyard, uh, particularly with the, the threats of, of China and, and the issues around the Taiwan Strait, uh, but also closer to home in the Pacific, actually re-engaging with our Pacific uh, island friends uh, and actually putting out a hand and seeking what support that we can offer them uh, during these last uh, couple of troubling times uh, over the, the, the course of COVID and assisting uh, our Pacific neighbours where possible. Uh, I think it's been uh, f fair to say that uh, we've been greeted with open arms and uh, a change of attitude towards how they see Australia on the international stage. But we've got to get right to work on repairing those relationships, both not just through direct engagement but also policy, policy shifts that are in the interests of both Australia and our Pacific family. Now, our international efforts do go beyond the Indo-Pacific. The Prime Minister Albanese uh, attended the NATO summit and also took up uh, President Zelensky's uh, offer to visit Ukraine. There, the Prime Minister witnessed firsthand the devastating impact of Russia's illegal invasion and announced additional military support, including more Bushmasters, made in my home state in Victoria, uh, down in Bendigo. Just as we did in opposition, our government condemns Russia's invasion and will continue to support the Ukrainian defence effort. We are also following through on our election commitment for stronger action on climate change, investing in new technologies and legislating a sensible target to ensure that we do meet um, not just business uh, and, and community expectations, but the expectations uh, right across the world. Um, business have been desperate for almost a decade to have some certainty as well. Certainty to ensure that they can also invest in your technologies to tackle climate change and create jobs, high paying jobs in this country. It was clear that the country needed a change in climate policy direction and the National Farmers Federation and the Business Council of Australia have both welcomed our Powering Australia plan. This desire for change was clearly evident in the election result back in May of last year. Now, Labor's plan for economic opportunities across regional Australia acknowledges the contribution that farmers are already making towards our climate goals. And I do hope that all senators recognise the urgent need for policy certainty in this space and support the Albanese government's efforts to reduce our emissions and create these new jobs, with a particular focus in the regions. It is very important that we do support our regions. The consequences of the coalition's policy failures in this area have never been more obvious than in the energy crisis that hit Australia in early June of last year. Our ageing transmission grid simply could not get renewable energy growing in abundance and reducing in price every day to where it needs to be today, especially with the uptake of new uh, technologies and cars, uh, particularly with vehicles uh, that are using EV, uh, vehicles using electricity. It is important that we start to upgrade our electrical grid right across the country to ensure that we can supply that bandwidth of energy that's needed. The Liberals and Nationals were also uh, not very good at announcing uh, their energy policies, and if they did, they got a lot of practice uh, about changing their minds at many, many occasions. But their dismal failure came to delivery. I mean, they announced a lot of uh, ideas, but when it came to delivery, there was nothing more than a media release. And I'll give one example, uh, Acting Deputy President. It was the $1 billion of energy projects 
that were never generated power that never generated power, power at all and over and oversaw 4 gigawatts of power leaving the energy market while well, only 1 gigawatt actually came online so we ultimately had a deficit of around 3 gigawatts but we're getting a, but we are getting on with the job and fixing this mess it's clear clear than um, than ever that our plan to upgrade energy grid is essential and senators should recognise this and support the government in its efforts to clean up this mess. Um, also, late last, uh, early of last year, I did speak uh, and spend a bit of time in the Senate talking about how Australia also needs to rebuild its domestic manufacturing capabilities, uh, something that I think has been neglected for some time. Um, the global uncertainty certainly uh, put on the table and dominated the headlines for some time, but it certainly put on the table and uh, exposed our, our supply chains that were lacking, uh, lacking investment, lacking uh, vision, uh, and really f you could actually feel the impact, especially when people were rushing to go to the supermarkets in order to get goods and services. But despite the devastating impact that was felt around the nation during COVID, there would also been mo uh, moments of great opportunity. And, and one part of our economy where the greatest opportunity has been experienced was agriculture. And I've spoken quite a bit about uh, agriculture and the resilience of the ag industry in this place. Australia's agriculture industry adapted uh, above expectations um, and against arbitrary you know, tariffs and restrictions on goods that we saw from overseas, uh, such as beef, wine and barley, producers have shown time and time again a strong ability to diversify their export destinations and establish routes in new markets. And I really do want to take my hat off to all those that were involved. But the other side of the ag equation, the inputs that are required to produce all the goods that we are exporting, is not nearly as diversified and not received nearly as much attention from the previous government. And you know, I think there are attempts here to uh, at least try and rectify some of those. Um, not trying to lay blame squarely at the last government, but I do think that just 99%, uh, Senator Scar. But um, you know, I think there are genuine attempts to. Uh, rectify but also try and train our business community that you know we shouldn't always be investing just in one country because it is important that we have not all our eggs in the one basket but it's about also encouraging uh, that mindset thinking you know 10 steps ahead just in case there is unfortunately another pandemic or another disaster in the future but it is important that there is support there by government um, the Department of Agriculture, uh, when they did their most recent snapshot of the industry, showed that Australian Ag accounted for 11 per cent of all our goods and services that were exported, including value-adding processes. Uh, ag, forestry and fisheries contributed about 12 per cent to GDP, and that was around $150 billion every single year. So Ag has always been part of our national history and a very uh, strong source of prosperity, given its importance to our economy generally. But Australian businesses have already been feeling the impact of the global supply chain disruptions amid a perfect storm of factors. From COVID, we had uh, increased consumer spending, we had labour shortages, we had climate-related uh, disasters. And then on top of that, China ended up banning um, urea, which just actually made the problem a lot worse. And as we know, urea is a very important uh, ingredient, um, and I think there was at the time uh, some media around how that would have impacted on AdBlue, an additive that is used in, in the fuels for a lot of our trucks. And without our trucks moving this country, quite frankly, Australia does stop. Our truck is doing a fantastic job, and I just want to pay tribute to all of those, any of those that are listening on, on the ABC radio. I just hope they're doing a great job, especially those up in northern Western Australia at the moment, who are no doubt transporting quite a bit of goods between Perth and Darwin, and God knows where else they're coming from, but good on them for the hard work that they do. So there were, there were moves to reduce the re, re, uh, urea exports, which did expose how resilient sections of the Australian economy were on the global supply chain. And that was just one example of where the previous government was left scrambling to find alternative sources. But I think it's fair to say that uh, you know, we have all learnt in this place uh, our lessons, and there is genuine attempts to ensure that such issues are not um, or don't occur, but at least be minimised. We've got to make sure that we do start to minimise our risks in this country when it comes to our global supply chains. The pandemic also demonstrated that Australia must proactively take steps to secure its supply of key economic inputs. 
and this will require scaling up domestic manufacturing. And this is why the Albanese government is working very hard with industry to develop capabilities that we need to ensure that Australia's supply chains remain resilient. Uh, this should not be mistaken for a foreign policy that will see Australia withdraw from the international community. Our country has and always will be a trading nation. But it is prudent that as a trading nation we take steps to secure all aspects of our supply chain, including necessary inputs and where these inputs can be made here, they should so do. And it is important that we back in our manufacturing sector because it is so important that we retain the jobs, the number of jobs that support our regional communities right across Australia. And Australia must be a country that makes things here. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, realise uh, I'll be coming up against the hard marker on the conclusion of this debate in about 90 seconds, so I'll, I'll save uh, the, the, the bulk of my message uh, that I've got on the budget reply till, uh, till I get the opportunity to return back to this debate. I just want to make this one point. There's an old proverb that says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And this government over here, when they were in opposition, took to the Australian people a whole bunch of things, promised a lot, and what we're seeing is that they are not delivering. Firstly, on energy, on energy prices. They said over 90 times, the Prime Minister himself said, that Australians will see a reduction of their electricity bills by $275. Yet we have not, we've seen them abandon that. We've seen them abandon that, and they're not pursuing it whatsoever. The second one, where hope deferred is certainly making the heart sick, is in some of our regional communities, in particular in my home state of Western Australia, where you've got towns like Laverton, Leonora, the goldfields, you know, Kalgoorlie, uh, up in the East Kimberley, where you've had the cashless debit card. And they took to the Australian people this abolition of the cashless debit card, promising that it was going to actually resolve problems, but all we've seen is ex exasperated the domestic violence, the abuse that's going on in these towns, and it's happened on your watch because of your pursuit of inner-city uh, inner ideology that is getting in the way of practical solutions for communities like what the cashless debit Order. card was. Order. Senator O'Sullivan, um, you will be in continuation. It being 1.30, I move to Senator's statements, and I call Senator Cash. Yeah. Thank you. There is a crisis unfolding in the Western Australian goldfields towns of Leonora and Laverton that the Albanese government is directly responsible for and, quite frankly, should be absolutely ashamed of. These towns are being ravaged by alcohol-fuelled violence and dysfunction as a direct result of government policy failure. By withdrawing the cashless debit card from these communities, the Albanese government has left women and children in grave danger. Laverton Shire President Patrick Hill told me and the media this this week. The kids are not getting fed, the women get bashed up, and it's going back to the way it was. Mr Hill himself told me yesterday that some residents and visitors from other communities are lining up for opening time at the local bottle shop, buying bottles of spirits, by the carton and drinking them like Coke. Drinking them like Coke. They recently found 23 spirit bottles on a local oval after one session. The only pub in the town, the Desert Inn Hotel, after discussions with police, voluntarily imposed alcohol restrictions this week to combat the public unrest in the town. The disgraceful thing about all of this is that the Albanese government was warned by this community and those on the ground right there last year that this would be the result if they abolished the cashless debit card. Those on the ground in those communities begged the Albanese government, please don't do it. They told them this was the only thing that had made a real difference in the town. It meant the kids were being fed and women did not have to live in fear. But as we know, the Albanese government didn't listen to them at the time and they aren't listening now. This is a total abrogation of responsibility. The Albanese government should admit to abolishing the cashless debit card that it was wrong, restore it and stand up for these Thank communities. You. Senator Cash, Senator Ayres. Uh, thank you. I'd rise to speak today about the Youth Advisory Council at Nambucca Heads High School. Rural and regional communities 
are too often forgotten about, overlooked or dismissed in the public debate, particularly young people who live in those communities. Last week I travelled to Nambaka to meet with the council. A diverse range of local kids uh, in year 11 and 12 who are supported by Becoming You, a place-based youth outreach organisation run by Uniting. The council is the first of its kind in the Nambucca Valley. While I was there, I asked these young men and women, what is the one thing that you really think needs to change in Nambucca? And they said for them the answer was resounding, transport, extremely overcrowded school buses. Three kids to a seat, students crammed up and down the aisles and school bags scattered everywhere. And for them it's not just a five minute trip, for many it's at least an hour long bus ride to and from their rural homes. This is a daily reality for young people in that region just to get to school, let alone to travel uh, between towns on the weekend. These young people also want to have a say in the events that the town holds and the way it is planned so that other young people can engage in their community the same way that they have. They met, trained and rehearsed and went to the local council, the Mbucca Valley Council, and spoke up. It was a daunting experience for young people, but they are very impressive young people with very fine leadership qualities, absolutely committed to their community. Uh, I'd urge the local council to listen to these young people uh, and their colleagues in the state parliament as well, to listen to these young people, resolve the issues. Finally, I thank the students and their community connector, Isabel, and the principal of Nambucca Heads High, Dot Panaretis, for welcoming, from welcoming me to the school. We can learn a lot Order. from these young people. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Shoebridge. I have today given notice of the Governor-General Amendment, Cessation of Allowances in the Public Interest Bill 2023. The bill creates a power for the removal of access to lucrative entitlements by former governors-general where they are found to have engaged in serious misconduct. The ability to remove entitlements in cases of proven serious misconduct exists for all similar officers, whether MPs, judges or senior public officials. The need for this has been highlighted this week as former Governor-General Peter Hollingworth has finally faced an Anglican church inquiry into serious allegations of his mishandling of child sexual abuse claims. Child abuse survivor Beth Henrich spoke about my former colleague Rachel Seawitt's efforts to make this change, saying, I feel if he had any integrity, he would have said, I won't be accepting the Governor-General's pension. Steve Fisher, a survivor and current CEO of Beyond Abuse, gave me these words to share with the chamber today. Ever since Hollingworth resigned in disgrace and we found out he was getting a generous gift from the taxpayer, victim survivors have felt that it was completely wrong. It does not pass the pub test. It doesn't resonate. And that's not just with the survivors, but the general public who look at this and think, what a rot. Steve says further, when the Governor-General Act was introduced and this wasn't included, I'm sure it was an oversight. Survivors are so grateful for this move today. Thank you to Steve and so many other survivors for your courage and ongoing advocacy. While I deliver these words, though, Governor-General Hollingsworth continues to take and take from the public. In just the five years from 2016 to 2021, the former Governor-General took over $3 million in payments and entitlements all for an 18-month-long job that he resigned from in disgrace. As Steve said, that doesn't pass the pub test. So now it's time for this bill to pass the test of politics and become law. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Senator Antic. It's become apparent that sending your child to a South Australian public school might be the worst thing you could ever do to them. Now, we all know that the education system has been thoroughly captured by progressives and those who benefit from big state ideology. But every now and then it's helpful to be reminded of what a con with a concrete example of how insane some of this stuff has become. It's come to my attention that a public school in Adelaide has developed a point system rewarding students for their woke actions, and I've got the document to prove it. Under this woke social credit system, five points are awarded to a student who's seen to be, and I quote, apologising and correcting themselves or someone else for using incorrect pronouns, or challenging racial and sexual or homophobic language or actions, and even authentically using an acknowledgement of country before a presentation in class. Now, remember, it's got to be authentic. None of these half-hearted welcomes to country for these schools. Now, in a public school, students spend around six 
hours a day with an activist curriculum which coaches them into gender dysphoria, hatred of white people, excessive self-awareness about their so-called privilege. Now, if your child in South Australia decides they want to switch genders thanks to a video they saw on TikTok, the school may even encourage them to pursue the path of puberty blockers against your wishes. That's in the SA Department of Education's own documents. And to top it off, this particular school penalises non-compliance with this social credit system. It's clear our public education system no longer ed educates children but brainwashes them in the hope of shaping them into activists. The Marxists are moving into the next stage of their craven operation. They're doubling down on capturing our children and developing the next generation of child woke soldiers. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I rise today to speak about a program that you and I recently uh, took part on, and it was the um, participating in the International Visitor Leadership Program through the United States Department of State, uh, along with a number of our other colleagues, uh, not just in this place but also in the other place. The program was an opportunity to meet with uh, political, academic and advocacy leaders in the US, particularly those who have an interest in the relationship between our two countries. Uh, we flew into Washington, D.C. mid-January, and we spent uh, the bulk of the week uh, you know, talking to and looking at um, and understanding, I should say, the, the important uh, international symbols for democracy and freedom. Uh, we also managed to talk to uh, these uh, political and academic leaders about our engagement and the United States' engagement in the Indo-Pacific region and the impact of China that it is playing right now. Over the course of the week, we received briefings from U.S. departments on several policy issues. Of course, AUKUS was a very major focus, as it represents a significant collaboration between our two great countries. We also discussed other policy areas, including manufacturing, energy and climate, which is a major focus for both the Biden administration and the Albanese Labor government. I particularly uh, appreciated uh, the tour that we did of Congress, um, seeing some of the differences and similarities between our uh, chambers and our democratic systems, but it was also fascinating to be able to walk the corridors of the Pentagon and also mark our respects to where the, the downing of the aeroplane hit on the side of the Pentagon as well. I want to say thank you very much to our Ambassador Arthur Sinodinas for hosting us at the Australian Embassy, as well as Ambassador Mitch Firefield, Australia's representative to the United Nations, for taking time to explain about the role and the important work that Australia does on the world stage. And again, thank you to the US Embassy here in Canberra for organising the tour and the program. Order. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Bragg. Thanks very much. Uh, yesterday I released a pamphlet which sets out a liberal conservative outlook on why the voice of parliament is a good idea. And I've long been of the view that it is a good idea because it would help empower communities to make good decisions about their own people. And it would also aid the country getting to joint decision making. And I think a lot of the debate has been around uh, getting advice to Canberra, and I think that is important. It's important that this chamber and this parliament is able to get better informed advice. But we also want to be able to work with communities. And when I go into communities in Western New South Wales and talk to people, they do want to have more capacity to make judgments about practical things in their community. So I think that is a very good idea, a, a very fair notion, and something that we should be working towards. Uh, it's also important at this point, though, to make it known that this referendum, if it is to be successful, will need a large proportion of Liberal national voters to vote yes throughout Australia. And I believe for that to happen, it is very important uh, that the outstanding legal issues that have been raised in various quarters are addressed, are addressed and are able to give people comfort that this is going to be a change which is going to be a safe change for Australia, a change that will help Indigenous people, a change that will help the country but also a change that is safe for our constitution and safe for our system of government. Uh, finally, can I just say I think it is important that there is some more information to be provided because for those of us that want this to, to work and for those of us that want a win, uh, we need to be able to explain how this is going to help close the gap on the ground in communities. And that's why I believe that it is very important that more information is forthcoming in coming months. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Macdonald. 
Last week, I was informed that Cloncurry, Ingham and Tully would be the sites of the latest Westpac branch closures. Now, I acknowledge that times have changed and there are fewer people going into branches for transactions they previously would need to speak to a teller about. And I also want to acknowledge the partnership between Westpac and Australia Post to allow customers to do their banking, their Westpac banking, over the Australia Post counter. However, what the closures don't acknowledge is that profits generated by the bank from regional businesses, from agriculture, mining, tourism and others, are not then reinvested back to those regions. It is critical that forcing people to do their banking and other government services online means that they must also have access to a reliable, fast internet connection and better phone coverage. These services must be improved in those three towns and others right across regional Australia. These branch closures will also be felt keenly in the regions as bank staff would volunteer at community events and also provide a pathway for regional young people to have a career in the banking industry. Now, I understand people's concerns with these closures because it can be frustrating trying to explain a situation to somebody over a phone or via a website chat function. Local staff at a branch meant finance decisions and lending were done with first-hand knowledge of people's personal circumstances and the realities of life in regional places. But having these branches in town also acknowledged the economic significance of regional areas and, as I mentioned, to provide opportunities for young people to start a career close to home. So I'm grateful to Senator Matt Canavan and the Regional and Rural Affairs and Transport Committee for taking on another Senate inquiry into branch closures. And I encourage anyone who has concerns to make a submission, and I'll be posting a link on my website. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd firstly just like to begin by acknowledging uh, the statement by Senator Bragg and thank him uh, for his courage in being able to come forward uh, from the Liberal Party and show his support uh, for the voice uh, in terms of the referendum and in the hope that there will be a yes vote to see the voice enshrined in the constitution. Uh, thank you, Senator Bragg. We certainly hear what you're saying in terms of the comments that you've made, uh, but we are also very uh, welcome of your stance here in the Senate and in the, uh, in the Liberal Party. Madam Acting Deputy President, I would also like to just uh, pay my deepest respects and sympathy uh, on behalf of the people of the Northern Territory uh, to the people who are suffering terribly in Turkey and Syria. We've seen the news, we've seen uh, the incredible rescue efforts. Uh, we know that over 11,000 people so far have uh, had their lives taken in terms of uh, the earthquake, the 7.8 Richter scale uh, over there. And I am very pleased, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, to know that the Australian government is providing an initial $10 million in humanitarian assistance to those affected by the devastating earthquakes that have struck Turkey and Syria. But my thoughts also go out to those families here in Australia who are waiting uh, for news of their loved ones. Uh, it is a terribly difficult time. And I know that uh, also in the Northern Territory that there are families uh, no doubt uh, wondering what's happening and looking back to Turkey and Syria. So just wanted to put on the record uh, our thoughts are with uh, the families both here in Australia and in Turkey and Syria. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Ormond Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, many times in this chamber I've gotten to my feet to talk about the chronic underfunding of our public schools. Well, in the last few weeks, students right around the country have gone back to school and in a cost of living crisis, parents and carers have had to grapple with the increasing out-of-pocket costs that they are having to contribute for their students, particularly in a public school. Things like uniforms, technology, excursions and lunches all put a dent in the family budget, but increasingly parents and carers, as well as teachers, are having to fund the shortfall for the equipment and resources that our students need in our public schools. I assisted the staff at Rosebury, Queensland in Gladstone 
who every year have a service where they provide free materials for students who are returning back to school and whose families can't afford them. And increasingly, the number of people who are seeking that service is getting larger. And I was really shocked to see the number of things on those students' book lists that are things that our public schools should be providing. Photocopy paper, hand sanitizer. They are things that our public education system should be providing and parents and carers shouldn't be making up the shortfall. The latest Productivity Commission report on government services shows that the total per student funding from federal, state and territory governments to the public school sector rose 17 per cent from 2012 to 2021. But during that same period, governments increased their total funding to private schools by 27 per cent. In the context of funding agreements where at the moment private schools, most of them, Order, are getting Senator over. Payne. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today the government introduced legislation into the other place to establish the Housing Australia Future Fund, the HAF. Uh, that fund aims to add 30,000 new homes to the supply of social and affordable housing stock over the next five years. But over the next three years, the National Rental Affordability Scheme, which was capped at 38,000 social and affordable homes, will be wound up. Unmet social and affordable housing needs stand at 650,000 homes, and by 2041 it is forecast that almost one million Australian households will be in housing stress. This is clearly a massive issue that we're facing, and while the HAF is very welcome, I'm deeply, deeply concerned that the measures currently being proposed, whilst a big improvement on what was there previously, don't go anywhere near far enough. And this concern has been echoed by housing peak bodies around the country. The crisis we are currently facing in housing is about to get a whole lot worse. At the same time as NRAS is winding up, one-fifth of home loans, or around 800,000 households, are about to fall off a fixed-rate mortgage cliff. Permanent migration is increasing from 160 to 195,000, and international students are returning. These aren't bad things, but they are a confluence on, ex of, on extreme pressures on an already deeply stressed housing ecosystem. Rental vacancy rates are at historic lows, while rental prices, price increases are at historic highs. We need to do better. We can do better, and I hope that, that when the legislation comes to this place, we act together to do just that. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Today I rise to address the WA State Government's abject failure to invest in critically important state infrastructure at the Henderson Marine Precinct. As a Senator for WA and also as Minister for Defence, I am proud to have championed and supported uh, this critically uh, important sovereign capability for our nation. However, the ability of our shipbuilding industry in Australia, and particularly at Henderson, to realise its full and growing potential is now seriously constrained by the lack of action by the state government, by the McGowan government. Now, these issues are well known and well documented. For over five years, I have been working with the state government to identify these issues and to put together a plan to upgrade the facilities. In, 27, sorry, in 20, 2017, I facilitated negotiations and discussions between the Defence uh, Industry Minister then, Christopher Pine, and Paul Papalia, the Defence Industries Minister in Western Australia. We agreed then, by a series of letters, what was needed to be done. The coalition government since then has lived up to its end of the bargain. Uh, we invested over $1.5 billion into the Henderson area and also Garden Island. Uh, we have also promised four, nearly $4.5 billion into the building of a game-changing dry dock at Henderson. Alarmingly, both the state and federal Labor governments have gone completely silent on the future of this project. And that should be of concern not only to Western Australians, 
but also to all Australians that this important sovereign capability, having a dry dock and a defence marine precinct in Henderson on our west coast, is now in jeopardy. So I call on it is not too late, five wasted years, but we commissioned the report, we know what needs to be Order, done, Senator and it's now Reynolds. up to the Senator Senator government White. to get it. Senator White. Uh, recently I had the pleasure of meeting with John Gemmell and Pete Smith, uh, the CEO and president of the Clean Ocean Foundation. The Clean Ocean Foundation is a fantastic environmental charity formed in 2000 by families, fishermen and surfers who were concerned by the high level of pollution at the morning peninsula surf beaches such as Gunnamatta. The Foundation campaigns to limit pollution uh, in our oceans and restore ocean health through its conservation work. I was interested to learn about the Foundation's campaign to promote and establish, re uh, and establish recycled water initiatives in Australia. I would guess that most Australians consider desalination to be best practice in water cleaning and conservation, but this is not necessarily the case. In fact, for every one litre of potable water produced through desalination, two litres of polluted water are generated as a byproduct. This polluted water is dumped into our oceans and contributes to a range of environmental pressures on marine ecosystems. Uh, Australia's reefs, beaches and fisheries uh, all suffer when our oceans are not clean. This then affects the sustainability of our economy, our agriculture industry and worsens drought. Tourists do not want to swim in dirty water or visit a dying reef. Australians do not want to eat polluted fish. Our agriculture industry needs water to irrigate our crops, that's for sure. Having served on the board of Greater Western Water, I'm no stranger to best practice water policy. Recycled water systems are by far the most sustainable option available to us. Unlike desalination, recycled water does not produce harmful waste outflows that end up polluting our oceans. The water uh, that goes into a recycle system stays in that system. And Although La Nina uh, has given us more water than we know what to do, do with, our system is very fragile. We can make better choices. The challenge for the Clean Ocean Fund and others is to convince the public and governments that recycled water is the future. That is something I'm glad to say I support. Thank you, Senator White. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I listened really closely to the debate this morning about my colleague Senator Wish Wilson's private senator's bill to stop the PEP 11 project, which would allow for the expansion of oil and gas exploration. And my mood swung between being totally outraged that Labor and Liberal senators alike were arguing for the supporting the expansion of oil and gas mining and use, outraged by that, and then really, really sad, but then finally fired up to keep campaigning. Outraged because I just don't understand what don't the people in this chamber understand about the fact that we are in a climate crisis, that if we keep on not just using oil, coal and gas, but expanding the production, the burning, the mining, the export of it, that we are headed for three, if not four, degrees of warming across the planet. And what, what don't these people understand about what that means? for the increase in severity of floods, of fires, of sea level rise, of coastal erosion, of food availability, of skyrocketing food prices. What don't they understand? That we are on track, even under the government's 43 per cent climate um, target, to be headed for three or four degrees of warming. We are in a climate crisis. We cannot afford to be continuing to burn and continue particularly new oil and gas projects. And so I was really, really sad that here in 2023 we are still arguing about this. Why can't we acknowledge that we're in a climate crisis? We all need to be working together to make improvements so that we've got a healthy future. But finally I was fired up and I was inspired by knowing that there are millions and millions of people across Australia, across the world, who are fighting for a healthy future for us all and to be properly tackling our climate crisis. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. You might think it's just a phone call. Someone will pick up eventually. It's nothing to worry about. But it's so much more than that. Imagine being scared you couldn't feed your kids next week, or because you couldn't get through to someone on the phone. That's the situation for some of the most vulnerable people in our country right now. Their calls to Centrelink are falling on deaf ears, quite literally, because no one's picking up. Issues with Centrelink wait times aren't new. 
I saw them with my clients when I worked in employment services. I helped to fix them when I was in Jackie's office manager. Now that I'm a senator, those calls haven't stopped. In the past few weeks alone, I've had several constituents contact my office. One constituent put in a claim for a carer's payment. Fourteen weeks later, they'd heard nothing. And in that time, they'd used up long service leave, severance pay and their savings just to try and get by. Another constituent was calling to resolve an issue with family tax benefits. They tried calling for seven hours and had no success. Another person told my office they'd been trying to call Centrelink on and off for three weeks straight and hadn't made it through to a real person. They'd be on hold for 40 minutes, then get cut off. They'd call back, be on hold for 30 more minutes and then be cut off again. A new article by SBS News earlier this week said that some people are calling up to 15 times, 17 times, and still not getting anywhere. I don't blame the staff at Centrelink. They're doing their best with the resources they have, but it's just not enough. I've been helping people with these issues for over 18 years, and things haven't changed. They're just getting worse. We talk about overhauling Medicare, reforming aged care. All of these things need fixing, but so does Centrelink. There are systemic issues with Centrelink processes, and phone calls are just the tip of the iceberg. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Senator Pratt. Sydney World Pride is almost upon us of 2023, and as the excitement and momentum grows, I stand to acknowledge the hard work of the Sydney gay and lesbian Mardi Gras, who was successful in securing Sydney as the host city, bringing World Pride to the Southern Hemisphere for the first time is a fabulous achievement. The festival has been curated with wonderful care, with a broad and diverse program from input from communities from right around the world, with a particular focus on the Asia-Pacific region. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to learn together and share uh, with LGBTIQ plus communities from all over the world, communities who are often forgotten and marginalised or silenced, with, uh, among many human rights abuses subjected upon them. The Australian government's role in promoting LGBTIQA human rights will be an important uh, theme at the, at the World Pride. Importantly, we have an opportunity to hear from the oldest living culture in the world, Australia's First Nations people, who will highlight their interests also at the conference. I'm particularly looking forward to the Human Rights Conference and thank Equality Australia for their hard work. We are excited to embark on this new chapter and it's a great thank you, contribution Senator Pratt. Your time to time has expired. We'll now move to question time and I call Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Watt. An audit through questions on notice revealed almost 1,000 units of surveillance equipment provided by Chinese government-linked companies, Hikvision and Dawa, are installed across more than 250 Commonwealth sites. I welcome Defence Minister Richard Miles' comments today that they will be removed from his department. Minister, is the government concerned about this national security risk at other departments and agencies? Uh, Minister Watt. Thanks. Uh, thank you, President. Um, and thank you, Senator Patterson, for the question. Uh, I have seen the media coverage regarding this issue uh, in, in the last couple of days, and what I can advise the Chamber is that the Attorney General has requested advice on whether a government-wide ban is required to, to address protective security risks. Uh, of course, the Albanese government takes national security seriously, and we will always act in the national interest. Uh, some of, you may have seen Senator Patterson, uh, the Defence Minister, Mr Miles, uh, has made public commentary to the effect that the government is doing an assessment of all the technology for surveillance within the defence state and where those particular cameras are found, then they're going to be removed. So there is an issue here and we're going to deal with it. So I think the government has been very clear in taking responsibility for addressing this issue. Uh, I can also advise that the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and its portfolio agencies do not have any installed devices manufactured by the companies concerned. Uh, DFAT, Austrade and Tourism Australia retain some legacy uh, Hikvision or Dahua manufactured CCTV systems in non-sensitive areas, and these are not connected to the internet or agency IT networks. Of course, 
it is worth making the point that these cameras were installed not under the Albanese government but under a coalition federal government. Uh, so it is good that Senator Patterson is now taking an interest in this issue, an issue that neither he nor anyone else in the former government saw as uh, worthy of investigation at the time. Uh, but unlike the coalition government, uh, this government is taking action and, as I say, the Attorney-General has requested advice on whether a government-wide ban is required to address protective security risks. Uh, as Senator Patterson knows, having asked those questions on notice, departments and agencies have provided answers to them. Thank you, Senator Watts. Senator Patterson, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Minister. When asked last year, the Department of Home Affairs said they did not know whether other government departments and agencies had these devices installed. Will the government now direct Home Affairs to conduct a formal audit of all Australian government sites to determine our exposure to these devices? Thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Um, well, Pat Senator Patterson, I think I've already answered that question by saying that the Attorney General has requested advice on whether a government wide ban is required to address protective security risks. So, of course, being government wide, uh, that does involve every part of this government and every agency, including the ones that you referred to. But again, I ask the question, why is Senator Patterson only asking about these issues now when he's on the opposition benches? Why didn't Senator Patterson uh, or anyone, why didn't Senator Rustin, why didn't Senator Cash, why didn't Senator Payne, why didn't Senator Hume, why didn't Senator Dunningham, why didn't Senator Henderson and why didn't Senator Patterson, among others, Senator McKenzie, think that this was an issue important enough when they were actually in government having these cameras installed? That was fine, uh, but now, after the event, uh, it's worthy of asking questions. These are serious matters, I have no doubt about it, and that's exactly why the Albanese government is taking action, unlike the former Morrison, Turnbull, Abbott and whoever else there was government. Thank you, Minister Watts. Uh, Senator Patterson, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, in November last year, two of our closest security partners, the United States and the United Kingdom, announced they were effectively banning the devices from government premises. Will the Australian government follow and direct government departments and agencies beyond defence to remove these devices? Senator, thank you, Senator Patterson. Minister Watt. Uh, well, again, for the third time, uh, the government, through the Attorney General, has requested advice on whether a government wide ban is required uh, to address protective security risks. Uh, if that advice says that that is necessary, then I have no doubt that we will take that action. Uh, but yet again, again, for the third time, why were these matters not serious enough for the former government to do something about them when they actually had the opportunity to do so, when these cameras were actually being installed? Uh, it's all very well to be wise after the event and ask questions about things that happened when you were in government, but I would suggest that the time to actually do something about it is when you're in government making the decisions to install the cameras rather than trying to call into question a government which is taking serious action on this, just as we're taking serious action on national security in general. Thank you. Uh, Minister Watt. Senator Grogan. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Gallagher. Um, can the minister outline how the policies of the Albanese Labor government will assist people, Australian households, to manage the cost of living? <clears throat> minister. Thank you, President. And I thank Senator Grogan for her question and for her focus on cost of living uh, pressures for Australians, including those from the good state of South Australia, where uh, who uh, she represents. Thank you. Very, very Indeed. State. Sitting next to another proud South Australian. Can I begin by acknowledging that the decision by the Reserve Bank this week to raise interest rates uh, will have quite will have become as quite unwelcome news to households across Australia. Whether you're a mortgage holder or a renter, news of the interest rate rise that knowingly that it will cause extra stress on household budgets. The government has been working day in and day out since being elected to look at ways to bring sensible and responsible and affordable cost of living relief to Australian households. And whilst we can't control what the Reserve Bank does with respect to interest rates, we can be a government that focuses on those measures designed to make life easier and look at ways uh, being focused to put downward pressure on some of those cost of living increases which we have uh, been seeing. What is in our control are measures to support and subsidise Australians in buying things that are essential. We're supporting everyday Australians through policies like our cheaper medicines, which came into um, being on the 1st of January. 
Importantly, our cheaper childcare, which for over a million Australian households um, will make childcare more affordable, and of course, reducing the increases on energy bills that those opposite opposed in December last year. Our cheaper childcare reforms were really important reforms, uh, Madam President, about making it more affordable for families, but also that it's good economic policy. In turn, the um, extra resourcing and investment into childcare supports greater workforce participation, especially by women. But we've also got our fee-free TAFE policy, so we're investing Thank in you skills. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Thank you. Um, I wonder if the minister could um, give us some further detail on how the cheaper childcare uh, measures could assist with the cost of living. Minister. Uh, thank you, thank you, President, and yes, I can. And I thank Senator Grogan for the question. The cheaper childcare plan will, co will cut the cost of early childhood education and care for more than a million Australian families, 1.26 million Australian families. A plan, of course, that we know the no coalition over there, the opposition opposed no. during the no. election. No. Say no to everything. No. That's what you're known for. Say no to everything. The no coalition over there. Say no. No to energy bill price relief. Order, couldn't agree with that. Order, couldn't down. agree with any. Couldn't agree with one and a half billion dollars going to e order. ease the prices of those energy increases. Could you? No. No. More jobs for Australians. No. More investment in manufacturing. No. No. Childcare. No. Just a big no from you guys. Well, we're getting on with the job. Investing in childcare. Uh, for families earning $120,000, it Thank will you, mean Minister. a saving of $1,700. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. That was very, very informative. I know that's going to make a significant difference to the people of South Australia and across the country. Um, could you outline what other plans that the Albanese Labor government has to reduce the cost of living? Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, I can assure the Senate that every day that we come to work, we are focused on easing cost of living pressures on yeah, Australian yeah. households, yeah, yeah. of making the sensible and responsible policy responses where we can to show spending restraint in the budget so that we don't add to inflation, that we deal with the supply chain issues, that we deal with the visa backlog that we inherited. I don't know. I don't even think you guys were awake in the last year of government when you were in there, because certainly all the work we inherited, you must have been asleep at the table. Or, maybe let the former Prime Minister do all the jobs. Remember that? He did have all the jobs. Or you guys go to sleep. I'll not do any of the jobs that I've just taken off you. We inherited the visa backlog, the skill shortages, the lack of investment in TAFE. These are the areas that we are focused on. We're addressing them one by one, cleaning up the mess of a government that had been there way too long. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fishers and Forestry, Senator Watt. I refer to the report to the government by the Grattan Institute, Fueling Budget Repair, How to Reform Fuel Taxes for Business, which recommends reducing the fuel tax credit for off-road use. Does the minister acknowledge the importance of the diesel fuel rebate to Australia's heavy vehicle industry, farmers, fishers, forestry operators and the resources sectors? which are all producing the food, fibre and minerals needed to support the national economy? And can he provide an assurance to the agriculture sector in particular that the government will rule out any changes to the diesel fuel rebate? Good question. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator McKenzie. The short answer to your questions is yes and yes. The longer version is that yes. Uh, I do recognise the importance of this, uh, this uh, payment and uh, re rebate for farmers. Uh, it is an important way uh, for farmers to manage their budgets. Uh, and for that reason, I can confirm that this government has no intention whatsoever uh, of getting rid of it. I recognise that the Grattan Institute has made that uh, suggestion, uh, but we have categorically ruled it out, both myself and the Prime Minister. And may I, point, may I recommend Senator McKenzie to my Twitter feed? Uh, a very worthwhile resource where people interested in agriculture can find all sorts of information. Uh, and I direct Senator McKenzie in particular to a tweet that I did not today, not yesterday, not the day before, but on Monday, 
uh, in response to, Senate, to David Littleproud, Mr Littleproud's comments on this matter, and my tweet says, quote, another day, another baseless scare campaign from David Littleproud. Changes to the fuel tax credit are not on the government's agenda. We're not ending the weekend, we're not ending the backyard barbecue, and we're not ending this either. Poor David. Uh, I guess I should probably add on this occasion, poor Senator Mackenzie. Um, the information has been out there in the public domain for four days, uh, where I ruled it out. The Prime Minister has ruled it out. I've also done ABC Capricornia, a, a radio station I recommend you uh, listen to as well, Senator Mackenzie, and all of your colleagues. Uh, so I have ruled it out repeatedly. Uh, but if you haven't caught up with that fact, maybe you're a little bit behind the times. It's not happening. It never was happening. It was a David Littleproud idea. And guess what? Yet again, he's wrong. And, uh, Senator White, I do remind you when you're referring to people in the other place to use their correct titles. Uh, Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. It will come to no surprise, as Senator Watt, that his Twitter feed is not something I wake up and uh, what, read every single morning. Uh, and I, too, give a huge shout out to uh, the ABC in Capricornia. My supplementary one, I refer to the reliance of Australia's fishing fleet on the fuel tax credit scheme and their vessels to catch no well, I don't I'm not sure that was I had a minute to ask there I want the fishing industry's fuel um, credits also Our time thank guaranteed. you Senator McKenzie Minister Watt Thank you uh, president uh, and in my experience usually when you're in a hole you stop digging uh, I have made it clear now through Twitter through ABC Capricornia, through other media outlets, through answering a question in the Senate chamber, uh, that touching the diesel fuel rebate is not on this government's agenda. We are not considering it. We are not working on it. And that applies to farmers, to fishers, to foresters, to anyone else who takes advantage of this. Uh, so uh, that is not on our agenda. And again, this has been a matter of public record for three or four days. Uh, so I'm a little concerned that Senator Mackenzie and her team aren't keeping up to date with what announcements and commitments the government has made and instead choose to perpetuate these scare campaigns day after day. I'll tell you one other thing about fishers and about farmers. They have welcomed the cooperative approach from the Albanese government in dealing with them, and I have lost count of the number of farm groups, fisher groups and other groups who have, who have made the point that they welcome a government that's actually collaborating with them, listening to them and not lecturing them. Thank you, them. Minister. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Mackenzie, second supplementary. Thank you. The viability of many agricultural economies is enhanced by the contribution of the mining industry which directly employs over 285,000 skilled workers. Given the importance of the resources industries, will the minister provide an assurance to, that the government will retain the fuel tax credit scheme in its current form for the, resource, no, for the resources industry? Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, well, I'm not the minister representing the Minister for Resources, but I'm happy to uh, refer you to my previous answer to your previous question, the one before that as well, uh, my tweets, my ABC radio interviews and all of my other interviews where I've said um, that we are not considering this matter uh, and as many times as you might like to say so um, in whatever Minister way. Watt, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Thank you on relevance, uh, Madam President. The minister, in his previous answer to uh, my first you, supplementary talk about I listened very carefully. I'd ask you to resume industry. your seat. You've You've pointed me to relevance, and the minister is being relevant. Please continue. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Uh, the, we are not considering any changes to the diesel fuel rebate in, as it applies to any industry whatsoever. Uh, and I'm afraid uh, that this will go down in the big rubbish bin that is overflowing with National Party scare campaigns, along with a $100 lamb roast around signing the methane pledge was going to end the ba backyard barbecue. We were going to end the weekend. Uh, what else? Have we, what else? Were we, why, we were going to wipe out Wyala. I'm pretty sure it's still on the map, Senator Grogan. You were there recently. Um, there must be some more that I've forgotten. The National Party are constantly full of it, and country people have worked them out. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My questions to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, last week the IMF, who it has to be said are one of the chief agents of neoliberalism around the planet, suggested that Labor's stage three tax cuts should be reassessed. Here in Australia, everyone to the left of Malcolm Turnbull thinks that the stage three tax cuts should be ditched. Should be ditched, Minister. 
Minister, does your government really believe that Labor's stage three tax cuts are good policy? Do you really believe that a quarter of a trillion dollars in tax cuts that overwhelmingly benefit the top end of town is preferable to putting dental and mental health into Medicare, making childcare free and wiping out student debt? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, and I uh, thank Senator McKim for the question and his ongoing interest in this portfolio space. Uh, I recognise, and I think we all recognise in this chamber, that there are different views around the stage three tax cuts. But our policy and our position on those tax cuts hasn't changed. Our priority, when it comes to tax reform, is the tax reform we outlined in the October budget, which is around ensuring multinationals pay their fair share of tax here on, in Australia. Uh, we also acknowledge that those tax cuts aren't scheduled to come in, and I think, till 2024. Uh, and we are focused on the near-term challenges in the economy, including how we ease cost of living pressures on households. They are the, uh, challenge, the, the inflation challenge and dealing with the associated cost of living um, impacts that, that it's having is our main focus in terms of the economic portfolio. But you raise a broader question as well around uh, the budget and pressures on the budget. And there is no doubt that the economic and budget vandals that sit opposite us had left the budget in such a terrible state. Well, I'm not going to let you get away. I'm not going to let you get away with this view. I'm not. I'm not. Zombie measures, terminating measures, the pork barrelling and the failure to deal with the big pressures on the budget that happen on your watch that we have been left to resolve. We need to manage, and we are the fiscal responsible managers of the budget. And people will see, as we go through the detail of what we inherited, just what vandals you were, uh, looking out and saying we're managing everything while sweeping it all under the carpet, pork barrelling to friends, failing to fund Fair things McGrath. properly, and having them all fall off a funding cliff in June this year. That's the legacy you leave, and that's the challenge that we are dealing with in the budget. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, you mentioned inflation in your answer, and the Treasurer said this week, and I quote, Labor has a plan for inflation. The RBA is forecasting that inflation will be above their target band when the stage three tax cuts come into effect next year. Isn't it the case that the stage three tax cuts are grossly inflationary? Is putting another $9,000 a year into the pockets of billionaires part of your government's plan to address inflation? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Well, the Treasury, of course, forecasts um, in the budget uh, our, their view, their Treasury forecasts for inflation uh, over the forward estimates, which will include uh, the stage three tax cuts when they come into operation. And you can see what the Treasury forecasts there in terms of inflation, and it's forecasting that f inflation will uh, track back towards norm more normal bands over uh, the more normal range over the next 18 months. Um, the um, Senator McKim also said we, uh, the Treasurer had outlined a plan for inflation, and we do. We're, we do have a plan for inflation. It's a three-point plan, cost of living relief, where we can sensibly and meaningfully make a difference without adding to inflation, which is our childcare, our relief for energy bills, our investments in cheaper medicines, to deal with the supply chain issues, which is workforce and skills, and to show budget and spending restraint in May. They are the, that is the plan that we have and it, that we are implementing. Thank you, Minister. Se um, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. Minister, most Australians know that you only supported the stage three tax cuts to neutralise the issue to win the election. Isn't it the case that your position now boils down to not doing the right thing because you promised in your own self-interest <laughs> to do the wrong thing? Minister, how's Labor's political cowardice helping the millions of Australians who are struggling with rents, mortgage rises, the cost of living crisis, and who will get pennies on Thank a dollar you, out of stage Your three competitive. Order. Order. Order.
Minister. There was a lot in that, President. Uh, there was a lot, and I give credit to you, Senator McKim, for managing to squash that into 30 seconds. We covered a whole range of issues then. I, I do not accept the points uh, made, uh, the negative reflections on our motivations around self-interest. Uh, we wanted to change the government. We managed to change the government, uh, and we think that is good for the country. We think that is good for the country in the fact that we are now able to implement all of the policies that we took, our positive policies around climate uh, and dealing with those issues that you've, you've been interested and involved in for some time. Uh, but we are uh, in government. We are dealing with the inflation challenge. We're dealing with some significant budget pressures. We've got to focus on households, cost of living, easing cost of living pressures where we can, where it doesn't add to inflation and doesn't make the job of the Reserve Bank harder. This is the job that the Treasurer and I do every day, day in, day out, and we'll continue Thank to you, do Minister, so. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Dodson. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, uh, Senator Watt. In my home state of Western Australia, we have seen flooding in the Kimberley and fires down south. Can the Minister please provide an update on what support the Commonwealth is providing to communities impacted during this high-risk weather season? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and can I thank uh, Senator Dodson for his question and also his fine leadership uh, in the Kimberley uh, throughout these devastating floods. And I do recognise that there are a number of senators and members across all sides of politics who have played a very important role, and I thank all of them as well. Before directly addressing uh, Senator Dodson's question, I'd also like to just give a quick update on the deployment of Australian personnel to Turkey. Tomorrow it is expected that a deployment of 72 personnel from New South Wales Fire and Rescue DFAT and the National Emergency Management Agency will depart for Turkey, where they will then be tasked by local authorities in supporting search and rescue efforts. These urban search and rescue personnel have internationally recognised skills, and I'm sure they will provide much needed support in the ongoing efforts across the impacted communities. I'd like to thank those personnel for this incredible undertaking, and I'm sure I speak for everyone here when I wish them well for a safe return. In the meantime, the Albanese government is continuing to work closely with the Western Australian government to support the ongoing recovery in the Kimberley following the recent devastating flooding. Two NEMA officers have been deployed to two locations in Western Australia to work in the Western Australian Department's offices in Perth and with the local council in Derby, West Kimberley. NEMA is also working closely with the National Indigenous Australians Agency to identify recovery needs at the community level. Of course, there are a large number of First Nations people who have been dramatically affected by these uh, events, and the Albanese government believes it is essential that traditional owners are part of the conversation on how we support the Kimberley communities and to make sure the recovery happens the way those communities want and need. Again, I'd like to thank Senator Dodson for his ongoing engagement with myself, my office and all of those communities around their recovery needs in the Kimberley. I was on the ground with Senator Dodson and the Prime Minister in Fitzroy Cossing in early January, and I've seen the power of work being done. In total, more than $2.5 million in Commonwealth disaster assistance has been provided to around 3,200 people in affected communities in Western Australia today, and there's a range thank of joint you, support still available. Thank you, Minister Watt. The time has expired. Senator Dodson, first supplementary. Uh, last year, nearly every state and territory in Australia was impacted by natural disasters. Can the minister please outline what this government is doing to ensure communities that have been impacted are getting the support they need? Minister. Thanks, thanks President, and thanks again, Senator Dodson. I'm very pleased to say that under the Albanese Labor government, no matter what your postcode, no matter what electorate you live in, if you've been hit by a natural disaster, you will receive support. Since May, our, in our after our election, our government has provided $1.6 billion in direct payments to natural disaster impacted communities across Australia through the various recovery payments available. It is a sobering fact that $1.5 billion of this $1.6 billion has been delivered to residents of the state of New South Wales. We recognise that New South Wales communities have faced devastating and compounding flooding events over the last 12 months, and we recognise that it's our responsibility as the federal government to show up in a crisis and keep showing up to help. 
What we don't recognise is whether those communities voted Labor, Liberal or National. And that's why, regardless of politics, we've continued to provide disaster funding into the hundreds of millions of dollars to very safe National Party seats because those people need help. That is the right thing to do and that is exactly what we will keep doing. Yeah, and thank you, Minister. Senator Dodson, second supplementary. Uh, is the Minister aware of any examples when government was not insured, communities impacted by natural disasters were delivered the support that they needed. Minister. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Dodson. Unfortunately, just this week, we have seen that not all governments follow the apolitical approach of the Albanese government in supporting communities impacted by natural disasters. I was appalled to read reports that former New South Wales Deputy Premier and New South Wales Nationals Party leader John Barillaro redirected funding away from certain communities that were devastated by the Black Summer bushfires. And why do you think funding was ripped away from them by the former Nationals leader in New South Wales? For one reason and one reason alone, and that's because they were held in state seats held by Labor members. It seems the rotting disease that was in epidemic proportions under the federal Liberals and Nationals also spread its way to New South Wales. What is it with the Nationals and rotting public funds? Because we, knew, we know the federal Nationals have lots of form on this. Let's forget about sports rorts for a moment. Let's forget about regional rorts. It even happened with disaster funding as well. Who will ever forget that in the Northern Rivers, federal national seats got funding and Labor seats didn't? That is a disgraceful way to occur and it will never uh, happen under you, our Minister. government. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering this question has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. Uh, thank, um, Senator Tyrrell, please resume your seat. I have Senator Tyrrell on her feet. As I've reminded this place before, the crossbench get limited opportunities for questions, and to continue talking as she stood was rude and disrespectful. Please listen with respectful silence. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, President. I appreciate it. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Minister Gallagher. Minister, last year this parliament passed the Aged Care Amendment Implementing Care Reform Act. 2022. This act primarily responds to recommendations made by the Royal Commission into aged care on nursing. This act will be fully in effect from 1 July 2023. This week it was reported in the examiner back in Tassie that there was an aged care resident in Tasmania who spent the whole night bleeding. The rusted nurse took unplanned leave and the only nurse available was on call about two hours away. Will the legislation we passed last year ensure tragedies, tragedies like this won't happen again? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Tyrrell for the question and for her um, focus on health um, and aged care in uh, her state of Tasmania. Um, I haven't seen that news report, Senator Tyrrell, but uh, I think uh, those stories have been far too common in aged care, which is why uh, we took the policy to the election that we did around implementing uh, nurses 24-7 into aged care facilities and increasing the care minutes. Um, I think uh, the, the health on responding to some of the health challenges in aged care uh, has been very difficult um, for uh, providers where nurses have not been available. Uh, and I know that the aged care minister, in fact I met with her yesterday on aged care matters, um, has been absolutely focused on making sure that we can um, that the nurse care, the nursing 24/7, uh, is implemented. That we are looking at workforce shortages where they are and how we deal with those, um, and working with providers. Because the aim is that people who live in residential aged care have access 24/7 to nursing care, which is something that they haven't had, uh, particularly in small um, and regional areas. Um, I. I spent some time working in aged care and visited a number of aged care facilities, uh, and those aged care staff do an incredible job caring for people, often with very complex health conditions. Sometimes uh, residential aged care facilities are actually more like a subacute hospital than an aged care than your traditional thinking of what an aged care facility would be because of the complexity of the residents who, who are living there. So um, my answer to you, Senator Tyrrell, is that is the aim of the policy um, uh, to make sure that people's health needs, residents' health needs, are addressed and we have access to that professional service twenty four seven. The time's expired. Senator Tyrrell, first supplementary. I hear that and I appreciate that. But 
the facility that's in question um, has been assessed by the Commonwealth and has met the aged care quality standards. How can the standards be up to scratch when they allow people to lie in bed for hours bleeding from wounds that nobody treats? This person was actually sent to hospital the next morning when people came on shift. So the situation was, it wasn't just a little scratch. So we just want things to be right and we hear that it's a problem that needs to be fixed, but you know, we're here, we're the grown-ups in the room, which I've heard. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I, I thank uh, Senator Tyrrell for the uh, question, I, and I agree it, it wasn't a scratch. Uh, and this has been part of the issue, particularly overnight, even on weekends, with uh, residents of aged care deteriorating to the point that they end up acutely unwell uh, when they are transferred to hospital or if they are able to be transferred uh, there uh, before they, they decline. Uh, that is the aim of the 24 7 um, nursing requirement. I know the Minister for Aged Care has been working, indeed, even with the Minister for Immigration on how we deal with some of the significant workforce challenges that are presented. Uh, part of it is dealing with um, some of the legacy issues we've inherited, inclu including fixing some of the other workforce shortages which we'll be doing through the aged care uh, wages increase. And any suggestion that the 24-7 registered nurse requirement won't be enforced uh, is false. It will be enforced, and providers are aware of that in their discussions uh, with the Minister for Thank Aged Minister. Care. Your time has expired. Senator Tyrrell, second supplementary. President. Tasmanian papers and papers around the country are full of horrible cases of neglect. People are coming to our offices in particular. That's who I'm speaking for. The Jackie Lambie Network has been calling for an urgent audit into all aged care homes in Tasmania. Can you help facilitate that? Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Tyrrell for the question, and I'll certainly relay uh, that to the Minister for Aged Care. She, uh, as you know, we have other measures underway to improve the quality uh, of aged care, including the new star ratings for residential aged care to provide older people and their families with transparency on quality. Um, we've got the extension of the Serious Incident Response Scheme to home care, a new conduct, code of conduct for approved providers, aged care workers and governing persons from the 1st of December. Uh, I'm not saying this is easy and it will fix some of the quality issues overnight. It won't, but uh, these are important reforms uh, that send the very strong message uh, that Australians expect quality aged care to be provided to elderly Aust Australians, that the government has a role in supporting that. We, we will be doing that with our investments in the aged care workforce and our investments in 24-7 nursing care, and we'll work with providers to continue to improve it. Thank you, Minister. It's Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Wong. I refer to yesterday's Twitter announcement by Ms Plibersek that she will block Central Queensland Coal's application to operate a coal mine 130 kilometres from Rockhampton. Minister, how many people would have been employed at the mine and what would its economic impact have been for Queensland and Australia if it had been approved? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Um, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and I thank the Senator for uh, the question, uh, and I understand from uh, reports that this is uh, a coal mine uh, that Mr. Palmer has some interest in uh, from the media reports. Uh, and I understand that yesterday uh, Ms. Plibersek, as the relevant minister, made a decision in relation to this mine. Uh, the minister is obviously uh, uh, entitled uh, or empowered under the legislation, which has been in place uh, for many years. Uh, my, my, my recollection is there were changes to it uh, made by Mr Senator Hill when he was environment minister in a coalition government. Uh, the minister is required to decide uh, every project on a case-by-case, -case, as she is required to do by law. Uh, I understand from public statements, uh, and I assume there was um, uh, a, a, an appropriate documentation release, uh, that she has not approved the project because the risks to the Great Barrier Reef, freshwater creeks and groundwater are too great. Uh, the, the uh, Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. Uh, thank you. Relevance. We know the background of the question I've asked specifically about employment and economic impact on Queensland. Uh, thank you. Minister, uh, Senator Macdonald, you also referred to, to, to the Twitter feed, I think, of the minister. 
Minister Wong. I'm very happy to talk about You're Queensland the jobs, and, the, que and the, re the Great Barrier Reef contributes approximately six billion dollars to the Australian economy. Sixty-four thousand jobs, Wong. but they're clearly not jobs Senator you want to Wong, ask about, are they? Please resume your seat, Minister, uh, Senator Macdonald. I appreciate you don't like high-vis jobs, Senator Wong. My question uh, is Senator about McDonald, Senator how McDonald. many people. Senator Macdonald, when you stand, if you have a point of order. Please say it's a point of order. That's not a point of order. Thank you. Minister Wong, please continue. Oh, well, I certainly enjoyed Senator Canavan wearing high vis around his backyard, <laughs> that very dangerous backyard, while he's putting up his, his clothesline. And, um, Senator, Minister you talk Wong. about high vis jobs. Well, you make Minister the interjection, Wong. I'll respond. Minister, I'll respond. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Scar, I already have Senator Macdonald on her feet. I will go to her and then, if necessary, I will come to you. Order. Order, Senator Macdonald. Uh, point of order is relevance and respecting the chamber in the process of answering the question asked. Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. I will remind the minister of your question. Oh, sorry. Do you want me to sit down? I have reminded the minister of your question, Senator Macdonald. Minister, happy to uh, respond to the senator because I wasn't the one who did that. So if she's going to do that, you're going to get a response. Yeah. Aren't you? You're going to get a response. Uh, the, the minister has obviously considered Senator Macdonald. The, the, the minister has obviously considered the impacts uh, on the environment and the and employment. And um, Senator Macdonald, order, order. I have a senator on her feet waiting to ask a question. Senator Macdonald. Minister, what is the government's alternative plan and solution to replace all of the lost energy production, the jobs, the direct and indirect investment that would otherwise have been generated across Queensland and the nation if this mine had been approved? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Wong. Uh, 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 Senator uh, uh, Wong, uh, please resume your seat. Order. Senator Senator Watt, I have a senator on his feet. Order. Order across the chamber. Senator Scar. President, uh, Senator Watt made uh, a reflection, uh, impugned the motive, impugned the motive of, of Senator Macdonald with respect to asking questions. He referred, he, he said, you're still asking questions for Clive. That impugns the motive of the senator. He should uh, withdraw. Senator Scar, he should withdraw. Order, order, order. Uh, Senator Rustin, I've called order at least three times and you continue to shout out. That is disrespectful. I'm, I did not hear the interjections because there were interjections across the chamber. I'm sure if I ask Senator Watt to reflect on what he said, and not repeat the offence, he will withdraw in the interests of the chamber. I withdraw. Thank you. Senator, uh, I think we, I called the minister to answer your question, Senator Macdonald. Well, I, I want to talk, I'm very happy to be asked about jobs, and I, I would make the point that, uh, first, uh, in relation to this, this mine, uh, well, sorry, I was asked about energy first. I'm advised that this was an export-only mine, so obviously there's no energy into our energy grid. Oh. Secondly, I'd also, also know, in addition to the 64,000 jobs, which were obviously weighing, I assume, on the minister's mind, I would note also that the government is serious about ensuring uh, that we invest in industry and jobs through our National Reconstruction Fund, an important part of ensuring st strong manufacturing jobs, high-vis jobs here in Australia. And isn't it interesting? Those, those who talk about jobs are about to oppose it. That's right. Are about to oppose it. So if you want to come in here, Senator, and talk about Australian jobs, we're very happy to talk about Australian jobs and all the jobs you're voting against. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. In all of her time as a minister in the Albanese government. How many coal projects across Australia has Ms Plibersek approved? Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, well, I, I am only aware uh, of this decision. Uh, I will take on notice uh, what other decisions uh, I am able to uh, 
that, uh, that have been made. Obviously, uh, my recollection is that ministers don't discuss what is before a minister until a final decision has been made, but I'm very happy, Senator, to take it on notice. Thank you, Minister. Senator Bebet. My question is to the minister representing the health minister, Minister Gallagher. Minister, in November 2022, I raised with you the issue of excess mortality as reported by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Now, the most recent full report from the ABS shows that for the first nine months of 2022, there were nearly 20,000 excess deaths, which is about 16% uh, about more than the baseline average. Now, of those 8,160 deaths were attributed to COVID-19, so where's the rest from? Now, Minister, can you please confirm if the Department of Health has investigated this large increase in excess, in, in excess mortality? And if they have, can you advise the Senate what is causing this spike in deaths? Thank you, Senator Babette. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Babette for the question and also for uh, the advance um, indication that he would be asking a question around excess deaths. I can say that uh, the Department of Health uh, would, as routine, uh, look at the reports that come out through the ABS. As uh, the senator indicated in his question, the reports that the ABS does into mortality statistics, um, the reports they do on the causes of death, and of course uh, the Department of Health would look at those and examine those to see uh, if there are any trends or issues of concern. Um, I think uh, I'm advised that it's important to note that increases in deaths from a range of uh, other causes not related to COVID-19, because there is an indication of ex excess deaths related to COVID-19, have also been observed in 2022. And examples include deaths due to dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, which were 25.6 per cent above the baseline average in June, and 21.8 per cent above the baseline average for the year uh, to June. Um, and while the number of COVID-19 cases and associated deaths has increased in 2022, I think it is important to understand that the proportion of COVID-19 associated deaths relative to the numbers of cases of COVID-19 has decreased overall, which highlights the positive impact of the health measures, of the changes in uh, transmission, the vaccination and the reduced severity of the Omicron variant, variant and subvariants when compared to earlier COVID-19 variants uh, such as Delta. Thank you, Minister. Senator Babette, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Now, you mentioned some causes of death there, but you didn't mention myocarditis and pericarditis. Now, this is an issue which is now in the mainstream media. Even Carl Stefanovic talked about it on Channel 9 recently. He said he wouldn't take more than two jabs because he had concerns relating to heart issues. Now, Minister, is the government confident, confident that none of this is because of the N mRNA injection? Minister. Um, President, I thank uh, Senator Bebek for this uh, supplementary. Uh, and uh, I would say that um, COVID-19 as a virus also impacts uh, the health and has those health consequences. So pericarditis, myocarditis is also, if you have a bad case, a severe case of COVID-19, that as, is, a, is a side effect, a consequence of that. And I would also say that uh, the data shows that for those who are unvaccinated, so haven't had a vaccine, primarily an mRNA vaccine, um, they are much more likely to end up in ICU or passing away. So those who are, are not vaccinated or not up to date with their vaccination. And for people in my age group, it's 32 times more likely to end up in hospital if you're not vaccinated. So um, the answer to the question is yes, we are confident. The, the government and the approving authorities are confident that the mRNA vaccine is safe you, and we urge the people to be vaccinated. Has expired. Senator Babette, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Now, Minister, given that you're so confident... Order! Order! Minister, given that you're so confident that mRNA is so safe and is so effective, when is the government going to release the data to support this claim? 
When are you going to talk to Atagi and tell them to give us the information? Are you going to do this, Minister? Thank you, Senator Bibbett. Minister. Well, the, thank you. And I would say the safety of the vaccine is, is uh, whilst Atagi has a role about the uh, provision of the vaccine, who should be provided the dose, the approving authority is the TGA, and they do publish adverse events. Uh, through um, quite frequent reporting. I think it's either weekly or monthly reporting of adverse events, events relating to vaccination status. I would also say that, of course, people are entitled to get advice from their health professional about whether the vaccine is safe for them and take that advice. But I would also urge people, with the fifth dose becoming available, to please remain up to date with your vaccinations. It's not just an individual decision. This is the thing. It's not just about an individual's decision and keeping yourself safe. It's keeping other people safe from, these vac from this uh, virus, people who aren't able to be as protected as some of us. So it's actually a community responsibility to be vaccinated. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Order across the chamber. Senator Billick. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. Minister, the Albanese Labor government finalised a trade agreement with India late last year, which is now benefiting Australian businesses, including in my home state of Tasmania. Can the minister outline some of the opportunities this agreement has created for local businesses and jobs? Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, President, and can I thank uh, Senator Billett for her wonderful interest, uh, not only in trade but tourism, uh, in her wonderful home state of Tasmania, which I'll be visiting tomorrow. Oh, terrific! Uh, hopefully with her um, and some of our other great uh, um, Tasmanian senators. But look, this is a very important question that she's asked, and the, um, the Albanese Labor government is getting on with the job of diversifying our trade in important markets like uh, India. On 1 January 2020, uh, 2023, the second tariff cut under the Australian-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement took effect. And in the month of January, Australian businesses benefited from the tariff cuts on over $2.5 billion worth of exports into—I'll repeat that figure—$2.5 billion worth of exports into India. This means more opportunities for our seafood, our meat, our fruits, our wine and our critical mineral exporters. And it means cheaper products for Australian households like groceries, like fruit, like nuts and clothing. This deal has been a long time coming. Former Prime Minister Julia Gillard kicked off the trade negotiations in India over 10 years ago. And under the Anthony Albanese no, Labor yeah. government, we finished That's the right. job by bringing an Indian. Yes, we, we, we did the job. We did the job that you failed to do or couldn't do. And uh, we finished the job by bringing an Indian trade deal into force. More trade means more and higher paying jobs for Australian workers. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Um, Senator Billick, first supplementary. Thank you. Does the minister have any specific examples of businesses that have started to use the provisions under the agreement to grow and expand trade with India? Thank you, Senator Billick. Minister. Thank you, President. Well, Senator Billick, thanks again for that question. As a matter of fact, I do. Um, <laughs> There are, some, there are many great examples in the senator's home state of Tasmania, which I'm looking forward to visiting tomorrow. For example, for example, you'd be welcome. Senator Colbeck would be welcome. Anything, anything to rest, restore the damage that you have done. For example, Hobart-based fisheries company Australian Longline, who have benefited from tariff cuts on exports to India. Or the Western Australian Geraldton Fishermen's Cooperative, who recently secured an Indian distributor to supply fresh lobsters uh, because of our free trade agreement. Of course, they're getting into uh, China as well. One in four Australian jobs relate to trade, and our trade diversification agenda is delivering more high-paying jobs to Australians. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Um, Senator Billick, second supplementary. Thank you very much. The trade agreement is part of the government's plans to diversify trading opportunities. 
What other actions is the government taking to diversify trading relationships and how will local businesses benefit? Minister. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank you again, uh, Senator Billock, for your question. And you're exactly right um, about, about, about our diversification policies. The Albanese Labor government is getting started on our trade diversification agenda with this important economic partner. Next month, uh, I will travel to India uh, with the Prime Minister and a business delegation to seize the opportunity under our existing free trade deal and advance negotiations on a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement. We are supporting Australian businesses to diversify their trade um, and deliver secure, high-paying jobs for Australian workers and Tasmanian workers. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Uh, President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Senator Watt, is the current rate of real wages growth positive or negative? Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. And it is my, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to advise the Chamber that under the Albanese government, wages are increasing at a level we have not seen for a very long time. Now, we, over a decade, in fact, uh, over the whole decade that the Morrison government was in power, it did not reach the level of wage growth that is occurring in our country. Now, we know, we know uh, that inflation is continuing to have an effect uh, on Australians' cost of living. Uh, and that's exactly why we've taken the steps that we have to address cost of living, such as the ones that Senator Gallagher was talking about. Cheaper medicines, cheaper childcare, fee-free TAFE places, uh, and of course, most importantly, the energy price relief that the Albanese government delivered late last year, which was opposed by every single member opposite. So that's what the Albanese government is doing on cost of living. But we recognise that this job is not done, uh, and we recognise that Australians are doing it tough at the moment. Uh, and that's why we will continue to take action on cost of living, and that's why we'll continue to take action on wage growth as well. Because let's not forget uh, that, unlike the coalition government, this government made a submission to the Fair Work Commission supporting a pay rise for aged care workers. Uh, unlike the former, commission, uh, the former government, this government made a, made a submission supporting uh, a, a decent increase to the minimum wage. And of course, late last year, this government, against the opposition of the coalition, passed legislation which is designed to get wages moving again uh, by giving um, him. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Birmingham. And President, I raise a point of order on the standing order related to the direct relevance of an answer. And I raise this point of order particularly about the direct relevance. Now, this chamber, early in my career, made a change to standing orders that went from requiring relevancy to requiring direct relevancy. Yep. Now, this question could not have been a more narrowly or precisely worded question. It was 11 words long and it asked the minister very clearly whether the current rate of real wages growth was positive or negative. I accept that he has been broadly relevant to the question, but I contest he is not being directly relevant to the question, and I invite you to draw him to the directly relevant question. Thank you, yeah. Senator Birmingham, and I will uh, draw the minister to the question. Thank you. Uh, I think it's an established fact uh, that uh, wages growth is not keeping up with inflation at the moment. That is not news. That is in every newspaper that you care to care to read. Uh, but that is uh, not something that this government wants to see go on. And as I say, nominal wages are growing at a higher rate than we ever saw under the coalition government. And that's because, unlike the coalition, we didn't have a low wages as a deliberate design feature of our economic strategy. Thank you, Minister White. Senator Birmingham, second, first supplementary. Thanks, uh, thanks President. Uh, on 3 June last year, the Albanese government made a submission to the Fair Work Commission, which the minister has referenced, uh, to the annual wage review that said, and I quote, the government recommends that the Fair Work Commission ensures that the real wages of Australia's low-paid workers do not go backwards. Minister, will the government make the same recommendation in its submission this year? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. And Minister Watt. Thank you, President, uh, and thank you, Senator Birmingham. Um, of course, I'm not in a position to reveal what will be in this government's submission uh, on the Order. next minimum wage case. Uh, 
Uh, but it is the government's policy to continue to make sure um, that we get wages moving again. Uh, and it, as I say, it stands in great contrast to the former government, who had a deliberate design feature of keeping wages low uh, and who never achieved the nominal wage growth that we've managed to achieve just in the last few months that we've been in office. Absolutely. Thank you, Minister Watt. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Well, during the lead-up to the election, Prime Minister Albanese consistently promised to ensure that the wages of Australians don't go backwards. The now Minister for Employment said the new government does not want to see Australian workers go backwards. Yep. This minister, this question time, has been able to rule in and out budget measures, and yet he won't give any indication as to what the Fair Work Commission submission will say. Minister, isn't it true that Australian workers are going backwards, that you won't promise to stop them from going even further backwards, and just like your Thank promises you, of lower Senator electricity Birmingham, prices, your you're breaking design. your promise? Minister Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Birmingham, for giving me another opportunity uh, to confirm how strongly the Albanese government is committed to getting wages moving again. And that's why we're taking action uh, to, to ensure that wages are increased by making submissions to the Fair Work Commission uh, that your Minister government Watt, was never prepared to please do. Please resume your seat. Order on my left. Order, despite the minister having quite a resonating loud voice in here, I am struggling to hear. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. I'll take that as a compliment. Um, the, this government, unlike the former government, this government is taking action to get wages moving again, passing laws uh, to do so, opposed by the No Alition, uh, making submissions to the Fair Work Commission uh, that the No Alition never was prepared to do, Order. and of course taking action on cost of living relief with cheaper medicines, cheaper childcare, and energy price relief Order. that was yet again opposed by guess who? The No Alition. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman. Um, my question is to Senator Wong, uh, the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, Energy. Could the minister update the Senate on how the Albanese government is working with Australia's biggest emitters to ensure they co contribute a fair share towards our climate target while supporting their economic growth? Thank you, Senator Payman. Minister Wong. Thank you. Thank you to Senator Payman for her question. Last month, this government released the proposed reforms to the safeguard mechanism. Based on extensive feedback over nearly six months of consultation, reforms carefully designed so Australia's heaviest emitters reduce their emissions and help us to meet help us to meet net zero, your target two, by 2050 commitments. Businesses in this country understand reducing emissions is essential to their long-term competitiveness. Oh, I hear them over there. Yeah. Here we go. The government's reforms will ensure that all large facilities, new or existing, are required to reduce their emissions. This sends a strong message a strong message that we are serious about our net zero commitments and serious about supporting business. These are reforms that will help businesses and regional communities transform their operations with a $600 million package as part of a larger $1.9 billion <clears throat> Powering the Regions Fund. But after a waste, waste a decade in government, what are we going to see from the other side? What are we going to see? We're going to see, yet again, the Leader of the Opposition, who wants to oppose our reforms because he wants to rehash tired, negative, scare campaigns. You know, as one respected commentator noted, Peter Dutton is like a microwave to Tony Abbott. Reheating pathetic scare tactics and fueling internal divisions. You see, the question for those opposite. The question for those opposite. Are you going to look to the future, or do you just say stuck in your own past? Stuck in your own past. There are those on the other side. And I note that Mr. Mr. Dutton's comments were in response to Senator Birmingham and Senator Bragg actually urging their colleagues to listen to what the electorate said. Thank you, Minister Wong. Um, Senator Payman, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on what has been the response to these critical reforms from business and industry? 
Thank you, Senator Payman, Minister Wong. I thank Senator Payman for the question and the opportunity to inform the Senate and particularly to remind those opposite who claim to be the party of business just how much support there is. Here's how much support there Senator is from you. the business community for our changes. The BCA, the AIG, the ACI and the MCA all, all see safeguards reforms as essential to long-term policy and investment that has been lacking after a decade of denial and dysfunction on the other side that we are still witnessing. Yep. Jennifer Westacott, Chief Executive of the Business Council, uh, said last week, what we need now is just to get on with it. What I think we don't need is major reversals. Oh, no, they don't like hearing this, do they? Their, 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 their constituency is walking away from you. Andrew McKellar from Aki urging Australians, uh, urging the parliament uh, to get on it, with it and urging for a bipartisan Thank you, Minister, approach. Minister, the time for answering has expired. Senator Payman, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on the Albanese government's plan, uh, plans to reward industrial facilities that reduce their emissions and when these reforms were first proposed? Minister Wong. Thank you, Pre President. The safeguard mechanism uh, crediting amendment bill will enable large industrial facilities to earn credits when they reduce their emissions below their baselines. In other words, you try and ensure that they also contribute to the net zero target, which, by the way, those opposite have signed up to. It's a balanced scheme, effective, equitable, efficient, simple, and reforms that were first proposed by Mr. Taylor. Oh. Mr. Taylor. And there were a recommendation of the 2020 expert panel, which your government accepted and consulted on. Mr. President, what I suggest is the uh, those opposite might listen, might listen Order. to their leader, Order. who said last year, Order. "When you lose elections, Order. it's important to listen and to understand the reasons why you lost." But you can't hear; you don't want to hear, do Senator you? Order. And I ask that Order. further questions be placed on notice. Order. Um, just before senators leave the chamber, could senators please remind any new staff or um, staff who may have forgotten the protocols about entering and leaving the chambers? There's been a couple of staff that have wandered around the wrong way today. Thank you. No, not any of yours. Please leave the chamber in a demure fashion. <laughs> Senator O'Sullivan. Mr. Deputy President, uh, I rise to uh, take note of the answers given to questions by all coalition senators today, and I. I I particularly want to, myself and my contribution, take note of the answers given to Senator Birmingham's questions uh, on relation to the cost of living by Senator Watt. Now, uh, what we heard from Senator Watt was just a lot of words, really, and a lot of plans to have a plan. You know, they said, we're, what are we doing to address cost of living? We're taking action. But there was actually no reference to anything they've actually done or anything specific that they're actually going to do that will tangibly deliver reduced cost of living pressure on Australians. Now, we all know out there in the real world, outside of this place, people are doing it tough. Interest rates have been going up. Uh, for, for the average mortgage holder, it's about $10,000 per year in interest, increase in interest costs. Uh, you go to the shopping centres and not only will you see that the uh, many, many cases the, the shelves are an empty and because there's supply chain issues, but there's also, of course, costs have gone up significantly. And it's impacting people's ability to be able to make ends meet. It is becoming increasingly difficult to just get by in this country. And all we're getting 
from this government is just words. Just words. There's no substance behind anything they're saying because they're just, it's just empty rhetoric. We heard that, uh, that one of the ways that they're addressing cost of living is, is, uh, is decreasing the, the cost of childcare. Well, that's all well and good if you actually have a childcare place, but what we know is that the empty impact of their policy, their, uh, of the legislation that they were able to get through this place, is that it doesn't actually deliver any new places. There's, no, there's not a single new place becoming available. Now, we know that there is a significant shortage of childcare places. We know that there's a significant issue of workforce. And there's nothing that this government is doing to address those issues. So how does an increase in a subsidy assist you if you can't even get access to a childcare place? The point that I'm making here is that they're just really good at putting together some words. But what Australians are starting to figure out, and you know, they've had a bit of a honeymoon, and I get that, and people have given them the benefit of the doubt, as, as good Australians will do, as sensible Australians will do. They will give, they'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But what we're starting to see, as the pressures are really mounting on household budgets, as the pressures are really mounting upon individuals trying to make ends meet, they're starting to figure out that this government, this government is all talk and very little action. And their action is just often symbolic. Their action is just often just talking points rather than actually delivering policies that will deliver real outcomes. One of the things that they said they'd do uh, before the election was that they would deliver a $275 decrease $275 decrease in the cost of energy, in the cost of electricity. Yet they've walked miles away from that. They brought in some policy just before, uh, just before Christmas, thinking it would be some big Christmas present. Uh, again, another sort of empty delivery of a promise, because we're not actually seeing electricity prices going down. In fact, all they're saying is, oh, they're, just gonna, they're, they're not going to go up as much as they could have gone up. Well, you know what? That's not going down. That's just maybe limiting it a little bit, and you're touching, playing around the edges. What Australians want to see is a reduction in the cost of making ends meet, and it's getting more and more difficult. And this government, week by week, and we're seeing just this week. I mean, their agenda is just—we're back on uh, filling in time when it comes to uh, uh, the you know, government business. We're just back onto the. Uh, address in reply from the Governor General speech because they don't actually have anything. They've, they've, they've done with the, the talking and they've found that just talking is not enough. Just filling in words and having all those nice, nice announcements and nice little talking points is not enough to actually address the issue that Australians are facing. They talked about real wages going up before the election. But guess what? Well, we're not hearing them. They won't even mention the word real anymore because we're not keeping up with inflation. And inflation is out of control, and it's out of control. And the, the Reserve Bank is having to take the measures they're taking because they're, they're seeing that this lot over here haven't got the capacity to be able to deliver real outcomes. Senator Sheldon. Well, isn't this amusing? You know, what, have, what has been happening in this chamber? Like, I've been here since the election. You've all been here since the election. And we've seen 60 bills go through this parliament. And let's just name a few of them. An increase in the minimum wage and pay rise for aged care workers. Let's mention a few more of them. That we turned around and decreased childcare and made it cheaper. We turned around and made changes to the Workplace Relations Bill, of course, which they opposed, because that dealt with cost of living. Because they didn't want to see real workers get wage increases to deal with the pressures of cost of living. They just wanted to make sure that a very small, minute percentage of this community at the very top end were actually protected so they could exploit Australian workers, because they wanted to keep wages low. It was part of their policy that has been clearly stated for the last and previous decade. They've kept the same mantra. So that's not doing anything, making wages bigger, giving people an opportunity minimum wage increases, an opportunity to negotiate better work arrangements to make sure that wages do actually increase. Also, those things that build better wages, improve skills, a very important initiative because there's been a dead hand put on the skills development in this country by those opposite. That's what they did for a decade, lost apprenticeships, 
lost skills, lost capacity, couldn't turn around and even support our universities during the biggest crisis this country and this world has seen in over 100 years. What do they do? They drain off the Australian community and, they pay, and we all, as a community, pay the price. Well, 60 bills and these changes that we've made have made a difference. Deliver the regional first home buyers guarantee. Another important increase and improvement in arrangements. Cheaper medicines. These are fundamental things that support and basically give a chance for those that are struggling to deal with the cost of living pressures that exist in our community. And to say and come in here and say that dealing with and containing prices, reducing the pressure on prices for electricity and gas, something they voted against because they didn't like the idea the market would get regulated. Now, actually, what they didn't like is that their mates were going to be regulated. The mates that actually turn around and support them were going to get regulated. That's the problem. They vote against workers' pay increases. They vote against the opportunity for workers to negotiate better arrangements with their employers across industries. They vote against containing uh, electricity prices. What do they do? They vote against making sure the cost of living and cost of living initiatives are put into this economy. And to hear a list of questions asked about fuel tax, I mean, I've only got to go to these are the people that turned around and did not even consult with the transport industry, 6 per cent of the Australian economy, a significant uh, place they play in making sure the Australian economy runs, many of them single owner operators small and medium-sized businesses, they turned around and got rid of the fuel tax credit system. Now, what they did as a result of that, that drivers were not able to get the fuel tax credit basis back as a result of the pricing that was put forward by clients within the industry. And when they took complaints and problems up to Freudenberg and to Morrison at the time, there was no answer. And of course, what those industry players said, the Transport Workers Union, of course, the largest small business road transport organisation and probably the small, largest small business organisation in this country by numbers. The Australian Road Transport Industry Organisation, a national road transport employer group representing small, medium and large operators. The National Road Freighters Association, a group of well-meaning owner-drivers that do largely long-distance work. And, of course, NatRoad, the National Road Transport Association, all said quite clearly what the previous government did was strangling road transport without consultation. And no matter how much they pleaded with Freudenberg, with Morrison, with those opposite, there wasn't a voice lifted, nor was there a voice lifted by Senator Mackenzie in support of those people in this chamber. Because we raised it on a number of occasions and it was dead silence on the opposite side. They did not support the transport industry. And of course, when that industry called out and asked for support and said, we need this to be fixed, and they spoke to the, to the um, government, the now government, the Albanese government, it was fixed. It was fixed because we listened to what that industry was saying. That fuel tax credit system has been re put back into place. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Deputy President. I've only been here a short time, and something I've learnt very quickly is governing is hard. And most of the people I hear come with great intentions. They are good people. They are here to make a better Australia. But it's impossible to get everything right. But when the game's on the line, champions want the ball. It's been nine months since this government has been in the office. That's enough for people who overly celebrated Labor's win or those who sought solace, those coalition supporters who sought solace in the arms of others to be decorating nurseries or planning deliveries or something else. But we still get everything bad is of the previous government and everything good is by them. And you can't take credit for things if you don't take responsibility for things. We've heard 60 bills have passed, but they haven't addressed the problems that face us now. It's a very narcissistic trait to project the faults upon others. It's a very narcissistic trait not to take ownership of your own situations. Now, we can stand here and we can say that wages are up, and they are. I'm not going to sit here and play points that they aren't. 
but real wages are not. And that was the question we had today. How are people going out there in the world? And as a group of people, I know we all have the Australians' interest in heart, and it's time for honesty on these things. What can we do about them? And so we look here and we're watching where the actions aren't matching the intentions, they're not matching the words. On our first question today, we're talking about uh, data and security of the nation, we're talking about cameras, we're talking about these things. I woke up and I saw this news article about Hikvision and uh, DAR devices out there. I think this is an interesting story. I then had the very personal self-reflection that about three weeks ago I had a number of Hikvision security cameras installed in my house and I realised that Senator Patterson's story is going to cost me about $5,000 to rectify. And we heard how these cameras were installed under our watch and it's our problem. But that ignores the fact that in November of last year, the United Kingdom and the United States identified that this was a problem. They announced that this was a problem. They announced that these were being withdrawn from use within their government buildings. Surely the government of the time should have seen that and said, let's have a look at it in Australia. Let's see what is going on here with that problem. But we didn't. Governing, governing is hard. There are millions of moving pieces. I've never seen a more complex thing in my life. But that is the ownership champions take. I have seen this. This has happened. I will do something. And Australians have been through too much. Since 2020, we have been locked down. We've been told what to put in our bodies, where to go, what not to go, everything like that. It is time for these people to have a life, to do things they enjoy, and for us to take the responsibility of having the ball, driving the game and winning the game for them. We shouldn't have to make them fear every little thing, everything about their wages, every bill, every mortgage payment, everything about climate change, the world's going to end, the Chinese are spying, my car's going to kill me. All of this, as a parliament, we are putting on them to, to scare them, to fear them, to manipulate them, and that is a thing we should be taking on. So, when we talk about ownership, we had the question about the diesel fuel rebate today. I, for one, would like to thank the government for clearing that up and giving clarity that that will not be changed going forward. There is no you know, hatred or anger on these things. When good decisions are made, they should be celebrated as much as pointed out the bad ones. Because there are farmers out near Moree, up near Tamworth, who are planning on spending hundreds of thousands of dollars each, millions of dollars in some cases, to plant crops. And they will sit there and they'll look at the cost of diesel, the cost of seed, the cost of fertiliser, the massive amount of money families will put out on a hope that it doesn't flood, that it doesn't drought, that it doesn't pesticide, that it doesn't mice plague. And that is some certainty that you have given today. So thank you for that. But I also ask on all these other points, on the wages, real wages, on security, if we are to be a government and a parliament that cares about our people, let us take that on, let us act with maturity, and let's give the people a break they deserve. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, my good friend, Senator Cadell over there, we've started Senate together, um, Senate school together, and it's great that you've pointed out a very important point, that it is impossible to get everything right. And you would imagine that people in government for almost a decade would at least get close to getting things right, but no. So the reason why we're having this debate is because it's very interesting to see the other side pretend to care now when the question earlier came up about why the Minister for Environment closed the central Queensland coal mine. And we're getting attacked for that as, as though we don't care about the environment or, as Senator O'Sullivan pointed out, that we're all talk but no action. But let me be clear that after a decade of no action promoting en uh, renewable energy, which the other side clearly failed and failed miserably, it's really interesting to see that when they see a responsible minister for environment in Tanya Plibersek, 
um, who is taking action to close the mine, and this may be the first time that a decision like this has been made in 22 years, that this decision was made on the premise of it having unacceptable impacts on the Great Barrier Reef, which is responsible for about $6 billion worth of economic activity every year and 64,000 jobs. Now, we're talking about job security. We're talking about creating more jobs for Australians out there. And there is, there's Clive Palmer who wants to challenge this decision. It is really shocking to know that those on the other side uh, are questioning this or are quite confused about why the minister would make such an important decision. Well, I'm proud of being part of a government who puts priority on the environment. Because when we went to the election, we heard each and every person in Western Australia and across Australia it implore to us on how important it is to save the environment, to prioritise it and to put it on the agenda as a matter of importance. Because at the end of the day, what, what are we fighting for here if we don't have a planet to live on? Um, and to, for those on the other side, just for a piece of clarity, that that mine was an export-only mine. There's no coal in it. It wouldn't be producing any coal into our energy grid. And after you know having all those policies during your time, 22 attempts according to the record, there was zero success rate. So you couldn't even land an energy policy. And if you really cared about the energy policy, why did you vote against us when, when we went into the election and we brought it to this chamber um, to reduce emissions by 2030 and, and put a target of 43 per cent? Why didn't you support us? And like in, in the light of all this talk of being mature, of being responsible and open and transparent. That's what this Albanese Labor government has been indicating from the day we've been elected. We're sick and tired of the delay and denial and the destruction we've seen, and Australians want to see action, and action is what they're seeing with this government. We really need to bring into attention that the government's policies are very clear. We've been honest with the Australian people. We've indicated how much of uh, bad policies have impacted the, the time that we're in government now and all the mess that we need to clean up. There's been, aside from the emissions reduction target um, and ensuring that we've got a clear path to net zero by 2050, um, that we've also committed to the policies of a $20 billion for rewiring the nation. $3 billion in the National Reconstruction Fund for Renewables and Low Emission Technologies, um, stronger laws to protect the ozone layer, signing the methane pledge. Like, these are things that are important to everyday Australians, and if those opposite really cared, you should talk to your constituents and listen. Be, even if you're on the other side, you still are part of this parliament and you need to listen because perhaps then you'll get a clearer understanding of what they're trying to say to you. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, in eight months, Australians are seeing that the Labor that they voted for is not the Labor that is governing. We see continued efforts by Labor to deflect answers at question time. They don't want to answer the question. They don't want to take responsibility for anything that they've done. They clearly don't want to take responsibility for their broken promises. And Senator Birmingham asked a very legitimate question, given the fact that during the lead-up to the election and the promises made by uh, the, uh, the then opposition leader, now Prime Minister, that he wanted to see real wages continuing to increase. And Australians have seen in just eight short months that that is not going to happen, and an admission by the government now that it won't happen. It's just like the promise that they made of $275 a year in reduction in energy prices, which now will not pass the lips of any Labor member of parliament. That promise is gone, 
And so the empty promises, the broken promises are now starting to pile up. In eight short months, the broken promises are starting to pile up. I don't know how many times I heard Mr Albanese saying that he had a plan for the economy. It's become increasingly apparent that he has no plan for the economy because every time something goes wrong, he says we have to go out and talk to people. He said he had a plan. There is no plan there to implement. Absolutely no plan to implement. And as has been said earlier, um, cheaper childcare is an important thing for the Australian economy. But not everyone has children and not everyone is um, reaping the benefit of that, but they are reaping the, the, the problem of increasing energy prices. And I have to say uh, what we're looking forward to, what's being predicted out of the gas markets, for example, is a continuing increase in the price of gas because there will be less gas because of the intervention of the Labor Party. And Mr Deputy President, only the Labor Party could spend a billion and a half dollars to put gas prices up when they promised to bring them down. Only the Labor Party could do that. But we're seeing the same thing starting to emerge. It's the same old Labor. Deflect the problem. Cute language. Blame somebody else. Blame the previous government. Never take responsibility for anything that you've done yourself. And of course, when the questions get really hard, descend into personal abuse. Start hurling abuse across the chamber, and we see that so many times. How does that work in a post-Jenkins world in this place? Not conducive to that sort of respect that the Prime Minister promised, a kind of parliament. Wasn't there a memo that went out? Did the Prime Minister, was, the, was the Prime Minister the only one that got the memo? Did the other ministers in his government get the memo as well? They don't seem to be following it. Or is it just when someone's asking the Prime Minister a question that the memo applies? I reckon that's the case. Don't ask the Prime Minister any hard questions. Don't ask him about him keeping his promises. Wages going up higher than inflation. Cheaper power prices. All we're seeing is the same old Labor. We all know particularly those of us on this side that Labor can't manage the economy. We've seen it time after time after time. We remember the pink bats. We remember the school halls. We remember the extraordinary spending that went on uh, during the global financial crisis. And we remember that Labor wanted us to spend $6 billion asking Australians to get vaccinated when all we had to do was give them a good reason to get vaccinated, and they did. They turned out in their droves. So here we have re-emerging the same old Labor and it's mostly the same people from 2007 to 2013, mostly the same people, and we're going to get the same results. We know that Labor can't handle the economy. They'll try and blame everybody else, they'll try and deflect, they'll try and abuse, and they'll try to put it off onto somebody else. But Labor, we know. 6,000 words we found out. They want to take economic policy back to the 1970s. They want to undo the reforms of Hawke and Keating that were so important in the last 30 years of economic prosperity in this country. It is the same old Labor. We shouldn't forget that. They won't keep their promises and they won't take responsibility for that and they won't own up. I put the question. Those the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the responses to the questions I asked of the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Well, at a time when Australians are labouring under a cost of living crisis, at a time when uh, food prices are skyrocketing, petrol prices, medicine, transport, rents, mortgages, electricity, insurance payments are all skyrocketing. It is a massive injustice that this government is even considering going ahead with a quarter of a trillion dollars worth of tax cuts for the super wealthy. Now, even the International Monetary Fund, one of the absolute architects and cheerleaders of neoliberalism around the planet, has suggested that these tax cuts should be reassessed. 
Yet this government, in its blind pursuit of lining the pockets of the already very wealthy people in this country, is ignoring the cries of working class people who are struggling to make ends meet. These stage three tax cuts used to be Mr Morrison's tax cuts. He conceived of them when he was Treasurer and he legislated for them when he was Prime Minister. But these are no longer Mr Morrison's tax cuts. These stage three tax cuts for the super wealthy are now Labor's tax cuts because Labor brought down a budget after the election that included these tax cuts and Labor have confirmed as recently as Senator Gallagher's answer to my questions this afternoon that these tax cuts are still Labor's policy. As uh, my colleague Senator Shoebridge says, they love the billionaires. Now, the important thing to know is that Labor has never been able to run an argument that these tax cuts are good policy. And of course, that's because Labor knows they're not good policy. So why does Labor support them? Well, because in their own self-interest they decided prior to the election that they had to support them. Labor's position boils down to this. They're going to support policy that they know is wrong. And they're doing it because they promised to do something that they knew was wrong. And we're in the middle of an inflation spike in this country at the moment. You've got the RBA basically going rogue, using a sledgehammer to crack a walnut, trying to use old style um, uh, interest rate rises, which work well when it's a demand side driven price spiral, but don't work when it's a supply side price spiral, which is what we're in now. And the reason the RBA feels it has to do that is because Dr Chalmers, the Treasurer, has abandoned the field. He's run for cover. He won't use the powers that he's got in the Reserve Bank of Australia Act to actually override the RBA on interest rates. He won't pull any of the massive taxation levers he's got at his disposal. So when you consider Labor's political cowardice on the stage three tax cuts with Dr Chalmers cowardice in refusing to implement anti-inflationary tax policy and refusing to use the power that he has to override the RBA, we're left with a situation now where we're going to get super inflationary stage three tax cuts, a quarter of a trillion dollars of pump priming the economy in the most inflationary way conceivable at a time when they come into play when, according to the Reserve Bank, inflation will still be above the target band. Now, the Treasurer says Labor's got a plan for inflation. It is inconceivable that that plan includes putting $9,000 a year into the pockets of billionaires. These are Labor's tax cuts. They have to own them and they should walk away from them. I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye, against, no. The ayes have it. Yeah, I'm aware. I'm, I was in, in anticipation. Senator McKim. Senator McKim, you, you have the call. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. I appreciate that. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the presentation of a, of a report of the Environment and Communications References Committee. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. President, I move that the time for the presentation of the report of the Environment and Communications References Committee on oil and gas exploration in the Beetaloo Basin be extended to the 21st of March 2023. There are no contributions. I intend to put the question. I put the question. Those the question say aye, against, no, the ayes have it. We now come to the table in consideration of committee reports and government responses. Senator Urquhart. 
Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present Human Rights um, Scrutiny Report 1 of 2023. I'll keep going. Please keep, uh, on please behalf keep of the Chair of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, Senator Mario Smith, I present the report of the Committee on the 2022-23 Budget Estimates. And on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I pre present the 204th and 205th reports of the committee. That's it. Thank you. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. On behalf of the Chair of the Rural and Regional, Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee, my good friend Senator Canavan, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the adequacy of Australia's biosecurity measures and response preparedness. Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Deputy President. Yeah. Deputy President. I present government responses to the 194th report of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties and the 2021 General Issues Report of the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme. In accordance with the usual practice, I seek to have the documents incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. We now come to the consideration of documents. The Senate will now proceed to consideration of documents which are listed on pages 7 to 16 of the notice paper. Any document to which no senator rises will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. I'll go to the whips first and I'll come to you in a moment, Senator Shoebridge. Uh, yeah, and Senator Billick, I know that you know that you've got the wish to oh. call. We'll go to Senator Scar first. We'll, we'll. I'd, I'd be happy to cede to Senator Billick, but uh, no. Oh, actually, I am. Yeah, at the annual report. Yep. So, Mr. Scar, uh, Deputy get on with it. President, <laughs> if I can uh, make reference to uh, uh, documents two, three, four, which is the report for Ackley, six, ten, thirteen, fifteen, twenty one, twenty six, twenty nine, forty four. 45, 72, 75, 80, 99, 102, 102, 105. Just there with 99, uh, then 102, yes, and 105, and 125. Leave granted. Leave is granted. I'll just go to Senator. Do you, do you want to do the government's? They have none. So I'll go to Senator Shoebridge first, and I come to Senator Billy. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thanks, Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note of documents one, three, five, six, seven, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen. 42, 50, 61, 99, 108, and 112. Excuse me, Senator Shuri, 61. I'm a little bit slow on the. Yeah, there was a jump from 61. Yeah. We then leapt ahead to 99. Thank you. Then 108, and finished on 112, Deputy President. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Yeah. So, to the extent that, they ha uh, that uh, it has already been held in the list, the, rem the remainder of it, you seek leave to continue your remarks. Is leave okay. granted? Leave is granted. Senator Billick. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I mean, sorry, Deputy President. <laughs> I rise to speak to document for the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity Annual Report 2021-22. I rise to speak on that report 
The Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, of which I am chair and of which Senator Scar has previously been deputy chair, and I thank him for his support through all that time. Um, oh, actually, you were chair. Sorry, I was deputy chair at that time. Thank you. Anyway, um, has a statutory role to examine each annual report prepared by the Integrity Commissioner under the Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner Act 2006. As part of this examination, the committee held a public hearing yesterday to speak with ACLE about its performance over the reporting period. While the committee will table a report in due course, and I do not wish to preempt that report, I do wish to note some highlights from the report and the hearing. Providing context for the annual report, the committee heard from the Integrity Commissioner that 2021-22 was a year of further maturing and development for ACLE. The work undertaken in 2021 to bring the five new agencies into ACLE's jurisdiction, that is the ATO, ACCC, ASIC, APRA and the Office of the Special Investigator, was embedded. The year ended with ACLE's first prosecution before the courts of corruption offences involving an ATO officer in Operation Barker, which was a significant bribery investigation. During the year, the first biennial stakeholder survey was conducted of jurisdictional agencies with pleasing results showing an overall satisfaction rate of 89 per cent. Areas for improvement include timelines such as the triage of ACLE's assessment work. The committee heard that a major focus for the reporting period was recruitment and it currently has 112 staff. ACLE now has a deputy commissioner as recommended by the parliamentary committee and opened an office in Melbourne during the reporting period. The hearing also canvassed topical issues such as preparation for the establishment of the National Anti-Corruption Commission or the NAC. The Integrity Commissioner told the committee that ACLE has three key priorities for the remainder of its time as ACLE. To complete the legislative requirements for ACLE, to finish ACLE well, meaning ACLE is in the fortunate position of knowing it is coming to an end and will take opportunities over the next few months to celebrate what ACLE has achieved, and to work with the Attorney-General's Department on the establishment of the NAC. The work with the Attorney-General's Department has involved dedicating one of their senior lawyers to work with the AGD on the drafting of the legislation, leading a project with the department to build a new ICT platform for the NAC, undertaking property projects for new leases for the NAC, building an intake and assessment process capable of dealing with the number of matters that might come to the NAC, engaging in an organisational design process and continued recruitment. At the hearing, the committee thanked the Integrity Commissioner and staff for their work over the reporting period, and particularly for their work in relation to the establishment of the NAC. In this contribution, I would like to add my personal thanks to the Commissioner and staff for a job well done. Their work on the transition to the NAC in particular will help ensure that the Australian Government delivers on our promise that, by mid-next year or this year, Australians will have a powerful, independent and transparent anti-corruption commission with the powers of a standing royal commission able to investi investigate serious or systemic corrupt conduct across the entire federal public service. While the NAC is an important re reform for returning integrity and trust to parliament after numerous scandals, I acknowledge that ACLE has done an exceptional job within the bounds of their jurisdiction. They have served Australia well, including during my time as chair and deputy chair, overall about 14 years, I think, of the ACLE committee, and I consider it a privilege to have witnessed their work from the perspective of a committee member. I look forward to the opportunity of making another contribution on the report of the inquiry when it is tabled, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is Le you wish to speak on it, Senator Scar? I'll, I'll leave it to Senator Scar to hold the matter in the list. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting. Sorry, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I caught your disease in the belly, uh, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I just rise very briefly to associate myself with Senator Billick's remarks and to give my personal expression of gratitude to all the staff of Ackley and the leadership under Commissioner. Uh, Ms Jala Hinchcliffe, who I think has done an absolutely outstanding job. But finally, I just wanted to uh, put on the record uh, my personal appreciation of Senator Billick, uh, who I think has performed an outstanding role, an outstanding job over many years as, as both Deputy Chair and Chair of the Ackley Oversight Committee. And I'll add a personal touch to that uh, to, uh, to thank 
Senator Billick for uh, inviting me for a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, after I first became chair and um, uh, conveying her wisdom to me and uh, her, uh, uh, her uh, very civil and collegiate uh, sense of um, assistance which she gave me throughout my period of chair, which I, I think is in the best traditions of this place. Uh, could you seek leave to I continue? Uh, Senator Stirl. Um, on a different subject, Mr Deputy yes, President. Yes, I think yeah, we've okay. concluded that one. Yep. I think. Uh, oh, you did too. You sought leave. Sorry. Yeah. First day back. Sorry. Uh, look, Mr, De uh, Mr Deputy President, I seek leave to make a contribution to a, a Senator Canavan uh, had put up a, uh, a response or a report. Can I seek leave to is comment leave on granted? that? Leave is granted. Please yes, proceed. thank you, Deputy President. Just quickly about the foot and mouth. Our outbreak in, in Indonesia and how just how scary that could have been, and I just want to share my thoughts with the uh, committee here, because with the uh, with the uh, Senate, because I've just returned from Indonesia, and our committee is going up to Indonesia in a couple of months to uh, talk about this even more, the, the scariness of lumpy skin disease and foot and mouth. But just to let fellow senators know, you know, if we go back, uh, oh, May last year, I think was the when it was first reported, the outbreak in Indonesia. I think the first case came out in about April. But since then, colleagues, uh, I'm pleased to say since that first reported outbreak in, in May 22, um, uh, uh, let me see, There's, uh, the disease has been detected in 27 of Indonesia's 37 provinces. I'm not pleased to say that. That's quite alarming. But as of 11am uh, on the 9th of February, the Indonesian government has reported a total of no less than 599,822 foot and mouth cases in Indonesia alone. So Indonesia is reporting that 11,849,455 doses of foot and mouth disease vaccine has been used, and it's great to say that Australia has been a significant contributor to that. And I'm uh, glad to hear that infections are predominantly in the western islands of Sumatra and Java. The highest number of infections have been reported in the provinces of East Java, West Nusa Tenggara, West Java and Central Java. Now, Australia has a strong existing requirements in place for foot and mouth uh, disease preparedness. And we have been on our toes on this for many, many years because we do know the damage that this could do to our $80 billion beef and meat industry. Now, since the outbreak in Indonesia, we've strengthened our response at the borders, enhanced our collaboration with states and territories, and provided support to Indonesia. Now, the Rural, Regional Affairs and Transport Committee has been investigating this as well when a uh, reference was put through the chamber here, and all members of the committee were very keen to roll our sleeves up, get together and start working on this to see just how vulnerable we could be, but what are things that we need to be absolutely uh, clear that uh, you know, uh, issues that have to be taken to task to make sure that this dreaded disease does not get into our country, because we know once it's in, that's no secret here, once it's in, we can't stop it. And that's before we start talking about feral pig numbers and all sorts of things out there, the camels and all sorts that we have no idea. So the Australian government has recently committed to long-term sustainable funding for biosecurity through new investments worth $134 million, which will bolster Australia's strongest ever response to this terrible threat. Now, following the first reports of lumpy skin disease and foot and mouth disease in Indonesia, border control measures were immediately enhanced and all risk pathways were reviewed. And I know there was a lot of scaremongering going out there, but uh, I have to say it is great to be part of a government and through Minister Watt in consultation very closely with the industry to move so quickly as he did, as he led the charge, working hand in hand. And I can't find and uh, an agriculture or biosecurity representative body who hasn't had anything good, anything but good, I should say, to say about Minister Watt's uh, magnificent response and the department and this government to working so closely to make sure that we do everything we can to mitigate any outbreak in this nation. So after the official confirmation with, from Indonesian authorities that foot and mouth had spread to Bali in July of last year, the department implemented additional measures to further strengthen the border and protect Australia from foot and mouth. 
And this is due, as we all know, to the high number of people who travel between Bali and Australia. I think the latest count was some 30,000 a week. It's great to see Bali back open for business. It's great to see Australians pour into our favourite island. And I know as a West Aussie, I'm a uh, real Bali tragic, and I'm so wrapped that uh, I was able to get back to Bali this year after a three, three-year hiatus. And it was just so fantastic also, if I may digress, to see the joy in the Balinese people's faces that tourism has returned to that island to the island of the gods. Not to the point that it's going to save a lot of families, because those of us who travel Bali and travel Bali regularly, we know only too well the terrible impact that the pandemic had on those beautiful people. Because unlike us, there is no free health care. Unlike here in Australia, and it sickens me when I hear Australians whinge about our health, our health system, and it sickens me when I hear Australians refer to our health system as a third world uh, health system. They need to get off their backsides and go see what's happening just over the other side of the Arafura Sea. But to be back with our Balinese friends again, who are so grateful, so grateful to see Aussies back in again, so grateful to have the opportunity, I was talking to some people the other day, to get their $3 a day wage. And when I see Aussies trying to barter down Balinese for a lousy singlet, it makes me feel even more embarrassed at times. But anyway, I digress. And it's so important that we work closely with our Balinese friends and, of course, all our Indonesian friends. So biosecurity bio response zones were established at all first point of entry for vessels um, and at all international airports that receive direct flights from Indonesia. Uh, the response zones enable additional powers to be exercised by biosecurity officers at the border, including the ability to direct arriving travellers to walk over sanitation foot mats. These mats are deployed for all aircrafts, or all arrivals of aircraft and cruise vessels from Indonesia, and since July 2022, over 800,000 arriving travellers have walked over them. I know I walked over them the other night, me and my mates, and it's no big deal, something as simple as a saturation mat. In fact, you don't even, it doesn't even get your thongs wet on the top, which is an even bigger plus. These sanitation foot baths uh, are also in use for commercial vessels arriving from Indonesia when crew disembark at Australian ports. So congratulations, Minister, and your department. They've got that covered uh, brilliantly as well. Biosecurity officers are boarding all aircraft arriving from Indonesia to make an announcement about the foot and mouth disease risk and reminding travellers of their obligations to declare any risk goods they are carrying, including soiled footwear when entering Australia. <coughs> Excuse me, that's not a reading point. That's what actually what I witnessed when I arrived back into Australia on Friday night, which was great to see. Intervention at international airports has increased, and I say that you know we've all sat there and for those of us that have the pleasure of sitting through uh, rural regional affairs and transport uh, um, um, estimates. You've heard me bleat on about. We all, some, a lot of us sit there on a Sunday night and watch, you know, airport security, and we all sit there with our fist in our mouth, thinking, "How the hell did they get away with this? How the hell can people come into this country not declare stuff, uh, hiding food in their pockets, in their wrapped up in their clothes, in their suitcases, paltry little fines?" I'm very pleased to say, and it came out of Senate estimates. Last round, and we'll be going into Senate estimates again on Tuesday. I think is agriculture or Monday, whatever. That uh, that's all old footage. Thank goodness. The sooner Channel Seven get the new footage out and start showing that you don't get a slap on the wrist when you're trying to import 17 kilos of raw pork into this nation, like what we've seen on tally, to say that um, a young Spanish fella, I'm not sure which airport it was, could have been Perth for all I know, uh, tried to sneak into the country just recently, a couple of weeks ago. Thought he was clever, not you know, not declaring some things he had in his suitcase, raw pork, but it was prosciutto. They tell me, but uh, raw pork. Well, I'm happy to say, not only did he get turned around and sent straight back out, but he copped a three thousand three hundred dollar fine. So I'm happy to say that on Channel Seven, I can't wait to see the new series of border security, because then I don't have to put up with my mates at my golf club calling me everything under the sun for letting these people sneak in with all this food and. I mean, I've even seen buffalo penises dried out and for food, and I kid you not. So anyway, that's on a bright note. But just, but just saying, but just saying, 
But just saying seriously, the threat to this nation, to this great industry, our, our, our meat industry, it is very, very serious. And it's not very often that I congratulate governments, and I'm well known for that, but I think the way that we've moved so quickly, Minister Watt, you've done a magnificent job. And I tell you what, it gives me a lift under my wings when I sit with um, representatives, as I said, from biosecurity and the uh, agricultural industry and the horticultural industry here in Australia, who sing as one. How uh, fantastic it's been to be able to sit down, work with government and get serious and not play stupid petty politics that you would expect at the university fight club or drink club on a Friday night or whatever they do at university. I don't know. So well done, uh, Minister Watt. Well done, Australia. But it's great to work together with the industry. And on saying that, as I said very clearly, we must do whatever we can, not only to keep this disease out of Australia, but to also to support our very dear friends in Indonesia, who I can tell you now value the support that comes from Australia. They really do. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson, I understand you wish to also speak on the same matter, so can I ask you to ask for leave? I seek leave to make a short contribution on the same matter in is relation leave. to Senator Canavan's additional information. Thank you. Uh, is leave uh, granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Chair. And, um, I uh, lend my support to most of Senator Stirl's comments, um, having also been on the inquiry into the biosecurity measures. Um, and uh, the Senate, hopefully, the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee will be visiting Indonesia uh, some stage the first half of this year to follow up on uh, measures in place up there uh, in relation to foot and mouth disease. But I'd like to make a short contribution on the other um, side of this inquiry and this information, which was into an incursion uh, of varroa mite, or in particular varroa destructor, uh, into Australia. Um, varroa mite is the most serious global threat to European honeybees uh, and um, has, poses a very serious threat now uh, in Australia. Um, although we have detected uh, ver uh, varroa mite previously in uh, European honeybees at ports, uh, we've never had a, a known outbreak in this country. And sadly, in the last uh, 18 months, uh, that's exactly what's happened. Um, having sat on a number of Senate inquiries in the last decade through rural and region affairs into uh, the honey industry, um, they've always been concerned about an outbreak of varroa mite, and it's happened. It's here. Um, we travelled uh, around the country taking evidence on this, and of course, um, we've never seen a response uh, in this country like the one that's underway, uh, being run th uh, through the New South Wales DPI and the federal government in a joint declaration of an emergency to try and uh, contain and uh, ultimately eradicate varroa mite. And I just wanted to say today, um, we did hear from some witnesses uh, in Newcastle, for example, um, experienced uh, beekeepers who uh, were industry advocates who said they don't believe it is possible in this country to eradicate varroa mite, now that it's here. Um, but the New South Wales Department and the Federal Department are still confident we can eradicate varroa mite, and I certainly hope uh, that is the case. Um, we hadn't heard much news, which was good news, uh, until just a few days ago uh, when new cases were recorded um, in, the, uh, in, in, in the red zones uh, around uh, Newcastle. Um, so uh, it may be a function of uh, more surveillance and more work being done, hence more infestations of these mites are being found or it could be that there are new vectors uh, and that uh, it is spreading. But either way, um, this, uh, this fight, this battle against this most serious of biosecurity breaches, it will continue. Um, and the Greens are pleased to have been on this inquiry. We asked that Varroa might be included in the terms of reference to this inquiry. Originally, this inquiry was going to be on just on foot and mouth disease, uh, and then it became lumpy skin disease, and we said, look, uh, can we also include varroa mite? Uh, and I know that there are many people still concerned um, in the bee industry, whether they offer pollination services or in the honey uh, part of the industry. Um, they're very concerned about a nationally coordinated uh, program to stop the spread of varroa mite uh, and the fact that, for example, bees are now uh, being opened up to be tr uh, allowed to be used uh, and transported across borders when the eradication or containment uh, lines are still being uh, 
are still being uh, resourced, and we haven't actually managed to eradicate this pest. So, um, more work to do. Uh, we must be vigilant, uh, and uh, we'll certainly look at forward to following up any updates at Senate estimates next week. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you. We we'll now return to. Oh, sorry, uh, Senator White. I'd also like to seek leave to make some additional comments in okay. uh, to make some comments in relation to the additional comments of um, Senator Canavan, if I might. Uh, is, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, can I just take a, a few minutes to talk about the report into uh, the Australia biosecurity, uh, Australia's biosecurity preparedness? Um, uh, this report came at an unprecedented time for Australia, you know, as you've heard from pre uh, two previous speakers. Um, we have got two major threats uh, on our doorstep, and as uh, Senator Wish Wilson uh, indicated, we also have now uh, varroa mite uh, in in uh, New South Wales. This, has not, this situation has not uh, happened in Australia ever before, and it certainly uh, has tested uh, everyone who has been affected, uh, both in prevention and also, as has been discussed, uh, in attempting to eradicate the varroa mite. The biosecurity uh, inquiry that um, I was privileged to uh, be a, a member of um, was uh, really a great opportunity for many, many organisations to contribute submissions and take time to come to hearings. Um, it was, many of them, those uh, organisations, particularly uh, in the bee industry, uh, w have, have a volunteer base with no full-time staff, but they wholeheartedly contributed to the processes. Um, as even some larger organisations only had one uh, full-time employee. But I can say without a shadow of a doubt that the contributions were thoughtful and considered, and everyone involved took the inquiry extremely seriously because, uh, as we all know, biosecurity matters. Uh, it, it matters to the value and quality of our agricultural products, which we rely on uh, for a whole range of things, for the economic windfall that comes from, from our exports, but for the livelihoods of people in rural, rural and regional Australia, but also for the f food security and for our international reputation and standing. Uh, I want to join with uh, previous speakers to commend uh, Minister Watt and the Prime Minister, who uh, acted extremely swiftly in this space um, to, uh, to do all that our country could do to, to uh, implement measures to uh, protect our borders from the threat of uh, FMD and lumpy skin. I saw firsthand their work ethic, their dedication and the, the rapid pace they, they uh, worked at. For, uh, to, to make our borders safe and to uh, activate the industries uh, that are so vital to Australia. Um, and it's certainly it's worth remembering that, that uh, because of this, um, this quick action, our country remains foot, uh, free of foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease, um, as our Senate report notes. Uh, it is also, I think, Incredibly important to understand the great hand that was, the hands that were extended to our neighbours, as uh, Senator Stirl has mentioned, to help them in their their fight because it is such a threat, uh, partic particularly lump of skin, but also FMD uh, such threats to other uh, na our neighbours' agriculture industries, and not only is it in our interest to, uh, because we want to have strong borders, but it is. It is our duty to assist them, uh, which uh, this government has been doing. I, I want to give you an example of how uh, what I've seen firsthand when I travelled recently to Tatura, which is in, in Victoria in dairy country, uh, and I, where I had the privilege to, on behalf of the minister, address the International Dairy Week about these issues. Can I say uh, agriculture is not my strong suit, but I was extremely pri privileged to speak to um, a, a very large room full of farmers, breeders and uh, processors about uh, what we're doing in biosecurity and what the report said. Th this group takes biosecurity extremely seriously. Uh, under the auspice of their uh, peak body, 
They have, been, they con they have convened uh, a range of education um, opportunities for their members and also, again, put a submission into this uh, inquiry, which was thoughtful, considered and consultative because they talked absolutely to their industry and they are uh, still currently mobilising their industry to ensure that they do everything possible to ensure to uh, have having their industry the best biosecurity strategy that's possible. And talking about best biosecurity strategies, uh, Minister Watt released uh, the national biosecurity strategy last August, uh, and it is the nation's first such strategy. It cha charts the next 10 years of Australia's biosecurity policy develop development. Importantly, it bears the signature, signature of every state and territory agriculture minister. That's what we saw at this inquiry, the unity of purpose and the, the absolute determinedness to, to bring biosecurity uh, to the forefront in our industries. This strategy recognises that our biosecurity system is larger than the sum of its parts and that our federation requires both Commonwealth leadership and better collaboration between state and territory governments in uh, the, this area of complex policy. However, the Senate report also uh, acknowledges that the threats to biosecurity are persistent and that it is impossible to operate in a risk-free environment when it comes to biosecurity. We know we mu must be prepared for threats to emerge, not just as isolated events, but to present themselves concurrently, as I've described the current situa the situation that was faced last year. And in that light, the Senate inquiry also heard evidence about where we need to do better, better co cooperation. We need to reinvest in preparedness and detection capabilities. We need Animal Health Australia and Plant Health Australia to broaden their consultations to include all stakeholders from across the supply chain. And importantly, we need a sustainable biosecurity funding model. These recommendations did not fall on deaf ears, and one of the strategies of the new Labor government is to approach our nation, nation's policy challenge with challenges with an eye to the long term. For industries which face such significant biosecurity threats, this means committing to sustainable funding, which will guarantee the ongoing protection of our agriculture sector. Finding a funding model that works and is sustainable is something the government takes seriously and is committed to. That's why the centrepiece of our agriculture budget was an investment of $134.1 million to bolster Australia's biosecurity system, including low stock traceability frontline preparedness, measures like detector dogs and handlers and funding for Animal Health Australia. This is a substantial down payment on the election commitment to fund biosecurity properly and sustainably in Australia. We will all reap the benefits of a strong biosecurity system, and that system is only, strong, is only as strong as its weakest link or its most confused state border. Um, those New South Wales bees fly over the border, not realising there is one, unfortunately. <laughs> Taken together, the Senate Biosecurity Inquiry Report and the National Biosecurity Strategy set out a strong manifesto for how the new Australian government intends to operate in the biosecurity and agricultural space. The 29 recommendations made in the Senate Biosecurity Inquiry Report, which I personally support, are currently being considered by the government. And the six priority areas to achieve greater cooperation and preparedness laid out in the national strategy echo the tone of these recommendations. Good policy is the result of listening. And to that end, we will be, the government will be consultative, partnering with the industry, the community and state and territory governments to make sure the harmful impact of biosecurity threats are closely monitored and to make sure we can develop a sustainable and forward-looking biosecurity policy for the agricultural sector. As a new senator, I am, as I said, it's not my strong suit, agriculture and biosecurity, but I valued the, op the immense opportunity to uh, learn firsthand from the experts that we saw and the industry people who live through this threat on a daily basis. It was a privilege. It caused me to think about issues that I know nothing about, but also that I saw firsthand the vital industries uh, that are the backbone of Australia. Um, but biosecurity is everybody's issue. Uh, it's important that people read this report 
and also talk to those people in the industry. And I know that Minister Watt will continue to do that. Uh, and I look forward to having the opportunity again to work with great colleagues on the, uh, this uh, RAP committee. Entertaining, interesting, and incredibly important. I thank the Senate. Senator White, noting everyone's interest in this report, would you like to seek leave to continue your remarks? No? Okay. Yes, I do. So no. I can say yes. Yes, <laughs> I can do that. Okay. Uh, we now move on to committee reports and government responses. Senator Cadell. Madam Deputy President, I'd like to uh, take note of items two and three on page 16 and seek to continue our remarks. Thank you, Senator Cadell. Senator Jordan Steele John. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Press. Um, I'd like to uh, move to take note of uh, committee reports, page uh, 17, item 1. Um, and okay. Are, are you, that's listed under Auditor General's reports. Are there any committee reports and government responses you're speaking to at this stage? Oh, no, Auditor General's. Okay, I'll let the Senate know. We're moving from committee reports and government responses now on to Auditor General's reports, and I give the call to Senator Jordan Steele John. Thank you very much. The COVID 19 pandemic has brought the importance of telehealth services into sharp focus. As we continue to navigate through the pandemic as a community, it is clear that expanding telehealth services must be a priority in our efforts to rebuild a stronger and more resilient health system. Telehealth is a game changer for so many people. It enables people in regional areas to access health care that would otherwise be out of reach. Telehealth removes so many barriers for disabled people uh, to have access to health care. It enables many members of our community to seek, our medical, uh, seek out medical supports uh, in their lunch breaks without having, for instance, to lose a day's wages for a short GP appointment. Now, we've been hearing very clearly uh, from the community um, in relation to the future of telehealth. And this report, which shares the findings um, of the Auditor General's inspection into the expansion um, of telehealth services during the pandemic, highlights the work that still needs to be done to maximise the positive benefits and impacts that telehealth can provide. For a telehealth system that best services our community, we must ensure that there is a continual focus on listening to feedback from the community using the service and implementing changes when required. This report tells us uh, no First Nations organisations, for instance, were involved in meetings where telehealth policy settings were discussed, a massive oversight. We cannot expect to have a culturally relevant or appropriate platform for as long as this remains the case. Additionally, the Department of Health did not establish performance measures for telehealth expansion. Um, instead, it assumed that the usage and billing behaviours, for instance, were sufficient indicators of success. Usage me measures do not tell us anything, for instance, about the quality of the care received. We could have been measuring that if a person felt that their needs were met by the consultation, how easy it was to access telehealth services, or the broader benefits uh, to the individual and community uh, received by being able to access health care in this way. And it just highlights how much more effective community services are when they are co-designed by those who are affected by and utilise those services. We have an opportunity moving forward to strengthen what could be a truly transformational service, uh, to make it accessible and relevant to everyone in this country and to make sure that we have, as a community, a way of collectively measuring the success of this service in a way that is genuinely meaningful and helpful. The government must commit to ongoing support and development of the telehealth service uh, and the implementation of these recommendations more broadly, because every single person in this country deserves to have access to high-quality health care. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. That concludes committee reports and government responses. And 
Any report or response to which no senator has risen will be taken to be discharged from the notice paper. Okay. Senator McAllister. On behalf of the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence, Mr Miles, I table a ministerial statement on securing Australia's sovereignty. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Does anyone want to take note of that? Senator Ayres. Madam Acting Deputy President, well, uh, today the Deputy Prime Minister outlined Australia's sovereignty principles in a statement uh, oh. to the House. Sorry. My apologies, Senator Eyre. You need to move to, make, to take note of the statement before you uh, make your remarks, and I should have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, sort of three years in, and there's still plenty of procedural errors at uh, at my end, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Apparently I, uh, mine too. I um, well, this afternoon the Deputy Prime Minister uh, did make a statement in the House about Australia's sovereignty principles. I uh, commend the statement. Um, in, in the proper tradition of those kinds of statements being made, it is indeed a statement of the government's position, but it's also an opportunity to consider uh, and reflect uh, upon these issues. Um, sovereignty, if it has any meaning uh, in this context, is about Australia's capacity and Australians' capacity to shape our own future and not allow others to shape it for us. Uh, and the Deputy Prime Minister's speech outlined uh, the situation that Australia is in, a, a, a clear-eyed view of the world as it is, uh, not as we would hope it to be. And indeed, our strategic circumstances uh, in the region uh, and the global level are very complex and challenging indeed. Uh, the world that Australia confronts and the region that we confront today is the most challenging since World War II. We no longer uh, live in a benign uh, environment. Uh, complacency is no longer viable. Uh, and that's why Australia must have a clear conversation, a clear doctrine about our approach to uh, sovereignty, uh, but also that we must work in tandem with like-minded countries. Uh, and partners who share our democratic values and our aspiration for, in particular in the region, uh, a sense of regional uh, independence, uh, a sovereignty and self-determination. That can only be managed through robust policy frameworks and principles that maintain and protect our sovereignty. And today's statement by the Deputy Prime Minister uh, is, an important, is an important juncture in this approach. I have to say uh, clarification of the framework is helpful. Uh, it's helpful to me in the, in, in the work that I do uh, in the two junior portfolios that I have in terms of trade and manufacturing. And those principles do inform that work. Uh, Senator Farrell, Minister Farrell, set out today again in question time uh, his approach, diversifying our markets, diversifying our products uh, and uh, leaning in hard to multilateralism and world, uh, you know, functional trading rules around the world. It matters also for our approach to issues like rebuilding industry capability in my own area of manufacturing. Uh, it's not just, not just an economic prospect. Uh, industry capability is core to any meaningful approach to national sovereignty. Now, uh, a number of principles were set out by the Deputy Prime Minister. Alliances matter. Alliances with partners who share, in an enduring way, our interests and values uh, and, and uh, are prepared to take collective action to uh, protect those interests and values. The Albanese government will, of course, continue to work with our uh, US ally and our key partners to advance our interests because, as the Deputy Prime Minister stated, our sovereignty is stronger when we work with others towards shared goals 
in ways that respect each other's national interests. He said it is more important than ever that we work with the countries of the region to continue to reduce tensions and maintain the peace and security that has underpinned economic prosperity. And like in the United States, where President Biden has begun the process of revitalising American manufacturing, so too will Australia. In the United States, President Biden, through the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, together with House and Senate Republicans and Democrats alike, has grasped that industrial capability, sovereignty, national security, democratic cohesion, that these are all interrelated and require renewal. The Albanese government's package of reforms in my portfolio area, manufacturing, speaks to the same vital objectives that are mobilising American institutions, workers in their unions, American firms and financial institutions. The US industrial revival is gathering steam. The Albanese government's National Reconstruction Fund is our opportunity to shape our own industrial future. It is modern, it is mission focused and it's utterly relevant to the sectors critical to our national future, to our future national development and to our national security. Our friends, partners and others in the region are watching to see whether we grasp this national moment for industrial capability and manufacturing revival. Uh, there are very significant opportunities uh, in the region in security terms, climate and energy terms, food security terms, manufacturing terms, to have a shared approach to achieving these objectives. It's a mystery to me why some people in this place oppose these objectives, even worse, refuse to engage with it, abrogate their national responsibility. It's an economic measure, yes, the National Reconstruction Fund, but it is a national security measure too, consistent uh, with any sensible conception of what our national interest is. Australia's future industrial capability is too important to play politics with. We have to put headway here over headlines and substance before slogans. If President Biden, in the fractured, polarised world of Washington politics, could unite Republicans and Democrats around these objectives, surely we can do better in this place and back the National Reconstruction Fund. As the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defence said in his ministerial statement, Australia's front line will always be diplomacy. Our primary effort is to use our diplomacy to reduce tensions and to create pathways for peace. And of course, our international security and our shared sense of a global peaceful future is undermined by those who seek to resolve disputes by power and size rather than by international rules and norms. Russia's illegal and unjustified invasion of Ukraine and its nuclear brinkmanship is a salutary example of this. We remain deeply committed in Australia to working constructively with our partners, notwithstanding our occasional differences, our inevitable differences as sovereign nations, to make the world safe, peaceful and ultimately more prosperous. Uh, it's vital, of course, uh, that, that the Australian public and the parliament have confidence that when enhancing our defence capability, we never trade away our sovereignty. As the Deputy Prime Minister said, we will not trade sovereignty for capability. To do so would be illusory, for the only point of increased capability is to strengthen sovereignty. So I just say to the Senate, it, it is well worthwhile uh, reading the speech, reading the statement, considering what it means for our approach here, our capacity to shape our own future, to pursue the policy objectives that we might differ upon in, in this place, is going to be very much determined by how we approach these questions of sovereignty and national security in the coming decades and how we lay the foundation for a strong, stable, credible Australian approach to these issues. Enhanced diplomacy, intelligence, economic statecraft, 
development assistance, trade, democratic resilience and our approach on questions like foreign interference are core to our capacity to keep Australians safe, maintain our national sovereignty and pursue the policy objectives uh, that we think are relevant. And I just say in closing that I did see in the last parliament a recklessness about the consequences of hyper-politicisation of some of these issues, uh, of some crass partisan politics uh, undermining the core asset, the core national asset we have as Australians of bipartisanship on these national security questions. Uh, and I hope that colleagues in this place and in the other place have reflected upon the consequences of hyperpartisanship and undermining that bipartisan national asset. Uh, it does damage the national interest. Uh, I hope that that reflection has caused a fresh approach and that people are seized with these issues with the same sense of mission and urgency that the Albanese Labor government is. Senator, oh, sorry, Senator Jordan Steele John. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in, in contributing to this uh, debate today in relation and response um, to the Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister's statement in relation to AUKUS, um, it has been a, it's been a fascinating journey to read through this ministerial statement in the current context, because what we have here is one of the most tortured political statements I have read in a very, very long time. Now, the Australian community more broadly were stunned, absolutely stunned, uh, by the announcement uh, in the dying days of the former government of this so-called AUKUS Pact. We woke up one morning to a bunch of articles about us acquiring nuclear submarines and sections of a uh, kind of Zoom-facilitated press conference with President Biden, the then UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Scott Morrison on TV. And we spent, most of the community spent about a day hearing about this term, AUKUS, 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 and then that was it. It, it kind of, the mainstream media coverage kind of ceased at what would we be getting? What kind of submarine would it be? What kind of capability would it have? And what le was left totally unexamined was why these three men had taken the particular moment that they had to introduce the idea onto the global stage. Left unanalyzed, unengaged with, was the question of why these three people at this particular moment in time would take this opportunity to announce such a shared project. Well, let's examine it a bit together. You had uh, Scott Morrison, who knew in his heart of hearts that he was on the way to losing government desperately trying to find a way to differentiate himself from an opposition that had decided that it would accept nearly anything that the Liberal government proposed in order to get back in power. You had President Biden, who had just endured week after week of scenes showing testament to the world of the absolute lack of judgment that has been displayed by the United States in the last 20 years in relation to foreign policy and in relation to global diplomacy and in relation to war, as its misguided intervention into Afghanistan came crashing down. And we all watched those horrific scenes as Kabul airport was evacuated. And the weakness and the intellectual limitations of the United States were on display as never before. And then, of course, you had Boris Johnson, who, fresh from being foiled in his attempts to prorogue his own parliament, facing complete rebellion inside his own government, would have rather been on the front lines in Kiev than in the Houses of Parliament facing his own colleagues. And so these three men took the opportunity to try to change the conversation by making this announcement, something that they had been cooking up in the background with their defence departments, who had purposely been circumventing the State Department of the United States, the Foreign Affairs Department of Australia and the Commonwealth, 
and the foreign ministries of the United Kingdom. This has all been kept very, very close to the chest. And so all that was really given to the Australian people was, hello everybody, we're going to develop a nuclear-powered submarine in the face of decades of steadfast opposition of the Australian public to the nuclearisation of our waters. We're just going to do this now. We have no idea how we're going to achieve it. We've got no idea how long it will take. We've got absolutely no idea how much it will cost. We'll figure that out. But just follow the shiny announcement over here. And what we have seen in the more than 12 months since that statement is that the detail of this agreement have not been ironed out and that the principal impact of such a shared project to bring into the world such a, a despicable weapon would be to fundamentally compromise the independence of Australia, the ability of us as a nation to make the decisions in line with our Australian community's expectations. Now, this is a baseline expectation of the Australian community, that its government that it elects will make decisions that reflect its interest. And yet we have a project which would seek to bind us up with the United States for the next one, two, three decades in pursuit of a, of a technology type with which we have no experience, no capability, and therefore must be wholly reliant on the United States and the United Kingdom in that development process, putting us completely in the power of two nations which after over the last two decades have demonstrated some of the poorest decision making in relation to war and foreign policy that has been seen since the second world war this minister's statement re references uh, the united nations charter and the absolute importance of upholding that charter and confronting nations when they violate it particularly when they act in relation to wars of aggression, and rightly condemns Russia for doing so, as the Australian Greens have done on multiple occasions. The torture in this statement comes in when you realise the fact that this minister is making this speech less than a month out from the 20th anniversary of the United States violating that charter, and the Australian government joining with the United States in the violation of that charter through the illegal and immoral invasion of the sovereign nation of Iraq. The irony in that almost beggar's belief and 20 years on with Iraq still in ruins, with, in, with Afghanistan falling apart this Labour government, this Labour government would ask the Australian people to put their faith in the United States not only for the next 10 years, not only for the next 20, but the next 30 or more years, gifting to them in the process multiple billions in public funds. Now, there will be some that say, oh, they're only just lending us a piece of technology. They've done that in the past. To make such a statement is to demonstrate such a profound level of duplicity in this discussion as to be unworthy of this place. Every member on the Labour side, every member of this government understands, truly they understand, that this technological, technology acquisition is fundamentally different. This is not a propeller. This is not a new version of troop carrier. This is a nuclear-powered submarine reliant on an industry we have purposely never developed in this country, a capability that we have actively chosen not to develop.
because of the risk that it poses to triggering an arm race in our region, the very region the minister says he seeks to stabilise. Now, in putting this forward, they suggest to us that we would be able to co-build this capability, having no ability to sustain it ourselves for decades, and yet utilise it solely in our national interest. Well, I ask you to consider whether that really sounds right. Do we really believe that the United States and the United Kingdom would gift us the opportunity to use their shipyards to build boats for us if they believed that we would ever utilise them against their national interests, against their strategic objectives? Pull the other one. Twenty years on from Iraq, in the aftermath of the collapse of Afghanistan, we must learn the lessons of this recent past. We must strike out on our own. We must have an independent and peaceful foreign policy. Uh, Senator Coney. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to obviously take note of the Deputy Prime Minister's ministerial statement as the Minister for Defence on uh, sovereignty given early today in the other place. Um, in that statement, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Richard Miles outlined Australia's sovereignty principles and explained how cooperation with our friends and partners enables us to pursue our national interests and enhance that sovereignty. The strategic circumstances that we find ourselves in what are the most complex and challenging since the Second World War. It's hard to pick up a newspaper without reading about escalating tensions in our region or indeed active conflict on the European continent. This is the backdrop against which the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defence delivered the statement on sovereignty today and, of course, also in the context of much discussion about the AUKUS agreement. There has been some suggestion that the acquisition of nuclear propelled submarines through AUKUS would serve to undermine Australia's sovereignty. And we obviously heard the contributions just before uh, from Senator Stiljohn. Because the development of this new capability for the Royal Australian Navy will come through cooperation with our strongest and closest allies in the United States of America and the United Kingdom. Now, the suggestion that's been put uh, by those, particularly those from uh, the Greens, is wrong. Those who make it fundamentally uh, misunderstand the sovereignty. They misunderstand the strategic environment in which we are currently living in. In these challenging times, it is more important than ever that Australia works closely with our friends, with other like-minded states, to secure, to secure our collective security. And this is why we have the AUKUS arrangements. This cooperation is managed through robust policy frameworks and principles that maintain and protect our sovereignty here in Australia. Sovereignty that is at the heart of national security and Australia's way of life. Protecting this will always be the Albanese government's first priority. Australia's front line will always be diplomacy. And to quote the Deputy Prime Minister, our primary effort is to use our diplomacy to reduce tensions and create pathways for peace. But it is also prudent, Deputy President, in our uncertain strategic environment to strengthen our defence capabilities, which are a key factor in maintaining our sovereignty. So, as the Deputy Prime Minister highlighted, 
While defence capability does not define sovereignty, having high-end capability ready to deploy at our complete discretion allows us to determine our own circumstances without coercion. The geopolitical challenges that we face, we do not face alone. We stand shoulder to shoulder with our allies and like-minded states. And indeed, cooperation with others is integral in protecting our sovereignty, not detrimental to it, as some have wrongly suggested. This suggestion by some that Australia should be in isolation in some ways uh, is in our development of defence capability ignores the very fact that our relationship with other states in and of themselves are an essential part of our capability. Measuring our ability to defend our nation is not as simple as adding up all the equipment and defence force personnel. We must also consider how our allies can assist us should the worst ever happen, both in the development and the procurement of defence material and through direct cooperation in military operations. You only need to look at Ukraine at the moment to see this principle in action. Australia is one of the largest non-NATO contributors to defence against Russia's illegal invasion, its unprovoked illegal invasion of Ukraine. Therefore, Ukraine's relationship with Australia makes a direct contribution to the defence of Ukrainian sovereignty. When I was on board HMAS Canberra last year, a vessel whose hull was made in Spain, whose combat system was developed in the United States and whose fit-out was completed here in Australia, I really appreciated how, along with all our allies, that we can work together to improve each of our individual capabilities and therefore make significant uh, contribution to our own national sovereignty. To return to AUKUS specifically, the argument that nuclear propelled submarines acquired through the PAC cannot contribute to sovereign capability because we require support from our allies ignores the fact that we are currently working in a collaborative manner on several defence and intelligence operations. Australia jointly operates three facilities with the United States, the Joint Defence Facility Pine Gap, the Joint Geological and Geophysical Research Station and Learmouth Solar Observatory. Now, these facilities, very important facilities, provide critical functions that directly support not just our national security, but importantly, they also help to operate other facilities right around the world because they're all linked, interconnected and help our allies and friends when they need assistance. So importantly, we could not operate these facilities in isolation. And I think that is the point that some in this place seem to forget. These collaborations with the United States facilitate intelligence cooperation and communications that help ensure that Australia and our Five Eyes partners maintain an intelligence advantage. The insights and intelligence gained through Five Eyes partnership play a vital role in informing decisions that protect and strengthen our sovereignty, demonstrating once again that our strong international relationships are a vital asset. The Albanese government will continue to work with the US and our key partners to advance our interests because, as the Deputy Prime Minister stated, our sovereignty is stronger when we work with others towards shared goals in ways that respect each other's national interests. Of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, these shared goals are not just about improving our defence capabilities, but we must also work together in efforts to reduce tensions and to maintain the peace and security that have underpinned our economic prosperity and way of life. And have we have seen recently um, Foreign Minister Penny Wong and uh, the Defence Minister Richard Miles and many other ministers have uh, obviously gone uh, abroad uh, to 
re-establish and, and reconnect with some of our closest friends, not just in the region, the Pacific, uh, but in Asia and in Europe and the United States, because it is so important, so important to have very strong uh, friendships when it comes uh, to those that we have you know, been shoulder to shoulder with uh, in times of war and real times of, of need. And again, as we have done with our friends in Ukraine, and uh, the solidarity that we have shown them and the support we have given them is so vitally important. Now, by recognising that we have shared goals with allies and collaborating in an effort to achieve these goals, we achieve more in our own interest than we ever could if we acted in isolation. It is entirely appropriate that the Australian public and the parliament have confidence that when we enhance our defence capability, we never trade away our sovereignty. And the Deputy Prime Minister was very much on point today, stating that we will not trade sovereignty for capability because the only point of increased capability is to strengthen our sovereignty. Thank you. I shall put the question. The question is that the Minister's statement be, uh, be noted. Uh, all those that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Much. I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning the Commonwealth's credit rating and the 2022 APS census. No Minister. Is it the message? Oh, no. Okay, no, it's up to you, yes. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Customs Legislation Amendment, Controlled Trials and Other Measures Bill 2022, Paid Parental Leave Amendments, Improvements for Families and Gender Equality Bill 2022, and Work, and Work Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2022. Minister. Thank you. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read at first time. The question is that the bills uh, proceed without formalities and be taken together and read the first time. All those that opinion say aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Clark. Customs Legislation Amendment, Controlled Trials and Other Measures Bill 2022, Paid Parental Leave Amendment, Improvements for Families and Gender Equality Bill 2022, and Work Health and Safety Amendment Bill 2022. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. I move that these bills be listed as separate orders of the day. Thanks. Uh, put the question. The question is that the motion by the minister be agreed. All those that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Do I now read this? The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of members to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the National Anti-Corruption Commission. The President has received letters requesting changes in memberships of committees. Minister. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the memberships of committees. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. I put the question. All those that have opinion say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The clerk. General business notice of motion 155 in the name of Senator Waters regarding maternity and repu uh, re reproductive health services. Right. Senator Waters, thank you. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And uh, I move general business notice of motion number 155, standing in my name, relating to maternity and reproductive health services. You don't need to look very far to find a recent story about the healthcare crisis. Wait times for appointments, lack of access to basic health services, 
cost of services, forcing families to make a decision about whether to go to the doctor or whether to pay the rent, the availability of medicines and burnout amongst healthcare staff. All of these things are felt even more acutely in rural and remote areas. It's a crisis affecting all areas of healthcare and all areas of the country, but today I'd like to focus on the impacts on maternity and reproductive healthcare services in my home state of Queensland. Last year, the Greens initiated an inquiry into barriers to, uh, to access to sexual maternity and reproductive health services and education across Australia. And that inquiry has received uh, about 2,000 submissions, which is a testament to the importance of this issue to so many. When the hearings kick off in a few weeks' time, I look forward to hearing more about the experiences that people are having across this country and finding solutions and then begging the government to implement them. Two key principles of the national consensus framework for rural maternity services were that women should have access to safe maternity care as close as possible to where they live and that any decisions about the development, sustainability, downgrading or closure of rural maternity services must be evidence-based, transparent, subject to independent impact assessment and taken in consultation with the local community. It sounds good, but none of those principles are being achieved in Queensland. In June of 2019, a Queensland Rural Maternity Task Force highlighted the need for action in workforce planning and resourcing to address barriers to access. And the report opens with this observation, and I quote, every day in Queensland, rural and remote women leave family and business, travel long distances on rough roads, often without the security of mobile phone coverage, and endure financial, social and emotional hardship just to access the maternity care that urban people have on their doorstep." End quote. Now, that task force made a series of recommendations, but the president of the Rural Doctors' Association of Queensland, Dr Matt Maysell, has said that not only has there been little progress, in fact, the inequity confronting rural and remote women has only worsened. Maternity units remain under considerable strain across my state. The Biloela and Gladstone Hospital maternity wards have been on bypass for many months, forcing families to travel a significant distance to Rockhampton just to have their babies. My Gladstone-based colleague, Senator Alman Payne, is going to talk a lot more about that situation and the devastating impact that it's having on families. And despite the desperate pleas to the Queensland Department of Health, it looks like women in the Gladstone community and in Biloela will be waiting at least until mid-year before they can give birth in their own town. Meanwhile, staffing issues threaten to derail plans to resume the delivery of babies at Cooktown Hospital uh, and to establish a birthing service at Weeper Hospital. Doctors are concerned that staff shortages could see restrictions on obstetrics at Innisfail Hospital. For many First Nations women in northern Queensland, these are familiar stories. All too often, far too many First Nations women and pregnant people are forced to travel to larger centres to give birth, away from country and away from family support. This crisis in maternity health care uh, access is replicated in access to reproductive health care. Too often, whether or not someone can get unbiased, timely advice about their options and if they choose an abortion, access to safe, supportive abortion care depends on their postcode. Abortion care is health care, and it should be accessible by all those who need it, no matter where they live or how much money they have in their bank account. In Townsville and Rockhampton, Mari Stopes had been the only provider of surgical abortions for many years, but in 2021 the service closed. Now They told me that it closed because they couldn't get the financial support they needed from the government to keep the doors open. Since then, women and pregnant people living in Townsville have to travel hundreds of kilometres to Brisbane generally, often at huge expense, to terminate an unwanted pregnancy. They've only got a small window in which they can do so legally. In October last year, the Queensland government gave $1 million to the Townsville Hospital and Health Services to restore surgical termination services to the region to try to refill that gap, but it was announced last week that those services will be delayed again until at least mid-March, while Townsville Hospital recruits the necessary staff. 
For pregnant people in the region that are nearing that 14-week limit for surgical abortions, that additional delay will mean the difference between accessing an abortion locally or having to travel to Brisbane and having the funds to do so. The additional stress, uncertainty, cost and risks that the lack of services is causing pregnant people in regional Queensland is unacceptable. We cannot have a situation where people facing an unwanted pregnancy can only access safe and supportive abortion care if they have the resources to travel. And likewise, we can't have a situation where people feel forced to elect a caesarean birth to minimise their risks. We shouldn't have a situation where families who have been supported by a midwife throughout pregnancy are forced to give birth in a distant hospital without continuing that midwife's support or where parents from First Nations and culturally diverse communities are separated from the families and into a daunting, unfamiliar and clinical environment at a time when they most need cultural support. We need immediate and long-term solutions to address maternity and reproductive health care access issues. We need a comprehensive and system-wide planning of rural maternity services, including workforce rotations, we need abortion in public hospitals. We need more recruitment and retention initiatives and incentives, better workflow management and funding to make it happen. We need to expand Medicare coverage for midwifery services and home births to give families more choice about how they birth. Bundled funding and continuity of care models have been recommended in the women-centred care strategy and by the participating midwives uh, task force in the previous MBS review, and we need to start listening. This government needs to start listening. We need more birthing on country initiatives led by Aboriginal community-controlled health organisations. Services need to be designated to meet the needs of diverse communities in consultation with the communities they serve. We also know that attracting doctors and midwives to regional areas is made harder by the lack of housing, the lack of schools and the lack of social infrastructure. Improving the lives of people in the regions demands a holistic approach. We need action. I know that this is an issue that the Minister for, for Women, um, Senator Gallagher, and the Assistant Minister for Health, um, the Hon. Jed Carney, all take seriously, and I look forward to working with them. Um, and to working with any member in this place to tackle those barriers that are preventing women from accessing the health care they need when and where they need it. Women have been waiting far too long to get access to basic health care. The situation is getting worse and we deserve better. Thank you. Uh, Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I listened carefully to the contribution there of uh, Senator Waters, and um, as a party that has uh, made quotas for the representation of women in Australia uh, just a, a part of doing business, I'm very pr proud to stand here as a member of the Labor Party with so many women in my caucus who discuss all of these issues at length and are here to represent women right across the country, and women with all a wide range of views on many, many matters. Um, Senator Waters indicated um, in the motion before the Senate that there are issues such as inadequate funding and a lack of workforce planning that has closed or restricted many maternity and reproductive health services around the country. She, she highlights particularly remote and regional areas. And, and I say to people who might be listening to this contribution as the Senate court draws to the close of its first week of work here that we have a mountain of work to do as an incoming government. We're approaching eight, nine months now, but we've got nine and nearly ten years of failed health policy to undo and to reconstruct a path forward for Australians in terms of giving them equitable access to health. And, um, I, I did undertake, uh, shortly after the arrival of the Abbott government, 52 hearings around the country for the Select Health Committee. Uh, there was a massive reduction in funding for national partnership health agreements that led, uh, through a flow-on effect through the community, to the massive erosion that followed of community health care. And I can remember in, a, in the region where I live, on the central coast, just an indicator of what was happening around the rest of the country, that uh, because the federal government had squibbed it, because 
Minister, uh, Prime Minister Abbott took money out. And that was just the beginning of the money uh, drain that was characteristic of this government, of the previous government. Because Minister, uh, Ab Prime Minister Abbott took the money out, the state governments made decisions to keep the hospitals open, but absolutely demolished community health. Now, as a woman, and happily as a woman who's been uh, able to have children and delights in my own motherhood of my now grown children, uh, I was in a position where there was no impact directly on me in terms of access to maternity services. But I know that on the Central Coast, one of the programs that was withdrawn and pulled apart was perinatal, so pre- and postnatal care for First Nations young women on the Central Coast. That was just one of the first casualties when the relationships between the state and federal government broke down by action of the former Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Abbott, when he was elected. Now that was just the start of the wrecking ball that Mr Abbott, then followed by Mr Turnbull, and what can we say of the man who brought up the end of the regime, uh, Mr Morrison, was a wrecking ball through health. And the consequences are with us now. Nine years long, nine months in, I want to put on the record an announcement that was, um, that was made, that was brought to fruition by this government that is doing what it said it would do for Australian people. And that is our um, declaration today from the uh, Minister Jason Clare, the Minister for Education, Minister Butler, the Minister for Health and Aged Care, and uh, my good friend Emma McBride, the Assistant Minister for Rural and Regional Health, about wiping the debt for rural and remote doctors and nurse practitioners. And that is going to have a very significant impact on access for women in regional and rural Australia. Now, this was uh, the Higher Education Support Amendment Measures No. 1 2022 bill. It doesn't sound like it's got much to do with the topic that we're discussing today, which is improved access to health care, and particularly with a focus on women. But this is uh, the reality of a good government doing the work of government in the national interest. It responds to concerns raised by Senator Waters about the need for uh, mid, uh, immediate and long-term strategies and funding to address the crisis that we have in terms of workforce. And essentially, what happened today and what became law in Australia that a doctor or a nurse practitioner who lives and works in rural and remote Australia will have their help debt wiped, wiped under legislation that passed today as a result of the action of the Albanese government fulfilling our commitments made to the Australian people prior to the last election that we would begin the task of redressing the terrible, terrible state in which the former government left the health services of this nation. So for those who are listening, you may know a doctor, you may know a nurse, or you may know somebody who's engaged in study or wanting to engage in study. This is an important program because doctors and nurse practitioners who choose to live and work in the places that need them, particularly in rural and regional settings, will have um, their help debt, most of their help debt, wiped or reduced. Now, the help debt reduction for a doctor or a nurse practitioner will depend on the length of their course of study and the amount of outstanding help debt that they have when they commence providing eligible services in an eligible location. Now, there will be a significant investment uh, of Australian taxpayers' dollars in this redress of a massive failure by the previous government. So the fact is that some doctors who live and work in rural and remote parts of Australia could save on average $70,000 and a nurse practitioner could save up to $20,000. So if, uh, if, if they work in a remote or a very remote town for a time period, of half the length of their course uh, would have to their entire help debt wiped. And I know communities, I've been to communities in remote and very remote towns, not just in New South Wales, particularly uh, in the seat of parks. And I'm talking about places like uh, Lightning Ridge, Burke, Wilcannia, out in Broken Hill, where there is incredible challenge in attracting and retaining health professionals, but also in uh, 
Western Australia, you know, visiting communities around Broome and as far over as Halls Creek in the west and the east in Kimberley. The access to services is so diabolical with a workforce that is just flown in and flown out that First Nations representatives who gave evidence to the committee, and I'm very mindful of the great work done there with my uh, fellow Greens senator, former senator uh, Rachel Seward, many, many uh, of the pieces, people who came forward and gave evidence just described health professionals as white Toyotas. That was their generic term. White Toyotas, they called them, because that's all they knew about them. They'd see white Toyotas arriving and white Toyotas leaving and no continuity of care. Now, I know, as a woman, how much of my life plan was built on the hope that I might become a mother. And when I fell pregnant, I was absolutely delighted to be able to access continuous health care for the course of my pregnancy, to be confident that in my early maternity that my child would be cared for and that I would be able to get access to services. This is no longer the lived reality of people, whether they're in remote and regional towns or even if you're an hour and a half out of major cities. So broken, so broken is the health system after nine years of Liberal National Party wrecking that people cannot even get in to see the doctor. So programs like I'm reporting to the Senate today that relieve people of a help debt are going to make a very big difference to the way in which young people might consider how they would build a professional future in medicine to provide not just maternity care but child care as well and around the edges of that I dare say a little bit of aged care as well. If uh, a doctor or a nurse practitioner decides to move to a large, medium or small rural town for a time period equal to the whole length of their course, they'd also have their help, entire help debt waived. Um, and an eligible place for a period of time equivalent to half the time required is el eligible to half the applicable debt reduction. Now, how many doctors is ex this expected to attract? Well, I'm pleased to report to the Senate and to Senator Waters, who I'm sure is very interested in the outcomes, not just the description of the problem, uh, this will attract about 850 doc doctors. That's what's anticipated, and nurse practitioners every single year. And this has got to be music to the ears of people in regional and rural Australia. They know things are absolutely desperate. I've spoken to many, many women in in hospitals, staff in hospitals talking about their families, people that I've met in the seat of parks, in the seat of Farrah, in the seat of the Riverina, but particularly up in parks where they need to move into a hotel accommodation in Dubbo up to a month before their delivery date to actually be able to be ready to get into the care that they need. Now, by the time I had my third child, I was a little more comfortable about the whole process. But let me tell you, for every woman who's uh, blessed to have a first pregnancy, the care that you receive is something you will never forget. And being able to access that care is a critical part of the survival of your child and also for your mental health and well-being and what can be a tumultuous part of your life. People have needed access to health services for a very, very long time. What's shocking is that the government of Australia between 2010, uh, 2013 and 2022 took away the rights of Australians to access the health care that they deserve. Our tax dollars, every time we pay our tax, is an investment in our country and in our future of our country. And we have a right to expect that basic things would not be eroded by the government we, we elect. Yet that is exactly what happened under the former government. I'm delighted that this particular piece of legislation went through today um, and, and we'll move on to assent. And this is a fantastic outcome. And as, as, I, as I said before, this is a sign of the government showing up to do its day job. 
Australians are out working, living, doing all the things that they do as great citizens of this country. They expect the government to come in and do things that will make their lives better and not make their lives worse. Now we know that this particular incentive to bring 850 doctors and nurse practitioners into the workforce in regional and rural Australia is a signature uh, long, long, immediate and long-term um, policy decision enacted with the will of this parliament led by Mr Albanese and Minister uh, Butler, Minister McBride and Minister Clare. They got together. They figured it out. They figured out what would help Australians, not what would harm Australians. And I dare say that as a result of this, my fellow uh, sisters across the nation, the women of Australia will significantly benefit from this particular initiative. I think it's really important as we speak about uh, sexual and reproductive health and the rights for all Australians being a key priority for the Australian government that for women uh, access to an abortion has been an issue that's captured much of the public uh, space and column inches. I also want to stand, though, as a woman of faith alongside other women of multiple faiths who might have a different view about abortion. Access to abortion for all Australian women in our civil society is a very important thing, but for people who might not hold that view, for people who desperately want assistance to maintain their pregnancy, that is an important consideration that must be part of what the government undertakes and, and what the senators undertake as we move forward. We live in a multicultural, multi-faith, vibrant, pluralist democracy. There are multiple views about reproductive health and to which we should always be sensitive, because that reflects our rich diversity. So as a woman, a Catholic woman of faith, I urge that committee to look at access to pregnancy care in the fullest sense of that. Every single possible permutation needs to be given fair and proper consideration. So I close by um, thanking Senator Waters for bringing this matter for discussion today. Um, I'm very glad that as a member of a government I'm able to stand here and, unlike so often it has been the case in the last nine years, not make excuses about failures but to put on the record a legislative success that is about building a better workforce to give Australians everywhere, including regional Australia, a much better chance to access the health care that they deserve. Thanks, Senator O'Neill. Uh, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, um, I too today um, stand to talk um, to the motion that's been moved by Senator Waters uh, and, um, and thank her um, for moving a motion um, about rural and regional Australia and the health and care that uh, rural and regional Australian women particularly um, deserve. Because um, I'm sure that you will agree, Senator Waters, that access to health care and other services should not be determined by the postcode in which you're born into or you choose to live. In Australia, we pride ourselves about equity. But unfortunately, we know um, that there are challenges in rural and regional Australia that make um, health care service delivery much more challenging. We know there are fewer resources that are applied out there um, as a result of the, the, the sparser populations. We know that that results in limited availability of the healthcare professionals that are so needed, and that includes people like our obstetricians and our gynaecologists, uh, our paediatricians, our midwives, and all the other amazing healthcare workers that support those um, health professionals in assisting Australian women who live outside of the metropolitan area um, through their pregnancy and through the birth of their children. Um, sadly, we do also know that there is a poorer health status and outcomes for people living in rural and regional Australia, and of course, um, when they do need to get um, uh, additional levels of care, uh, they have to travel great distances. So, we know that it is extraordinarily important that we apply innovation to any of the decisions that we make to meet the needs of rural, regional, and remote Australians, to meet the needs of rural, remote, and regional women. Um, because the application of a one-size-fits-all model 
uh, whether it be in health care, whether it be in aged care, um, is not going to work in rural and regional Australia. So we must stop focusing on city-centric models of care and we must make sure that we understand the nuances that exist in rural, regional and remote Australia. Um, and not the least of which the challenges that are faced, some facing many of our Indigenous communities, because we know they too um, are struggling with um, access to the kind of maternity services uh, and health services that people in the city probably take for granted. Um, before moving on to the specifics of the motion that's before us, I'd also like to acknowledge um, uh, Senator Norrie <coughs> Newell's contribution and thank her um, for. Um, it, probably unwittingly um, acknowledging the good government uh, that was previously the government of this nation, the coalition government, because it was actually the coalition government <coughs> who put forward the waiving of hex debt uh, for those um, rural and regional um, doctors and, uh, and nurses um, as a part of our policy, which they copycat adopted. So uh, I think, Senator O'Neill, perhaps um, you probably should look back a little bit further than the last five minutes to realise <coughs> that uh, many of the initiatives that are currently being enacted by your government are actually just copycat initiatives mm -hmm. of those that were put forward by the previous government. But nonetheless, I'm sure the most important thing is that, that doctors and nurses in rural and regional Australia are being provided additional incentives for them to be able to go to rural and regional Australia because we absolutely know that so far there has been very little, if anything, in terms of assistance for rural and regional Australia in the healthcare sector. In fact, most of the initiatives that have been put in place by this government so far have actually had a detrimental impact on rural and regional Australia. And, um, for the context, I'll pro provide some examples of that. Um, the very first decision that I became aware of as the new health minister was a decision um, to expand the distribution priority areas that previously had been focused on rural and regional Australia to allow them to move to what was referred to as MNN2 areas, which means that we now have the requirements for, these, uh, for overseas trained doctors or international medical graduates, as they are currently called, uh, uh, to, they no longer are required to do a stint in rural, regional or remote Australia before they mm. are able to move back into metropolitan areas because they can now move immediately straight to uh, our metropolitan areas and start practising. This has not only meant that the, any new um, IMGs or medical graduates that are coming into the country no longer have to go to rural and regional Australia, but those that are already in rural and regional Australia can move to the city. And sadly, we have found time and time again that doctors that were previously operating and practising in rural and regional areas have taken the, the easy option and moved into the outer metropolitan areas and often leaving their communities with no doctor at all. Um, and uh, next week in estimates, we'll prosecute a number of these areas where we have seen um, that happen. Because the reality is that Rural, regional and remote Australia is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to challenges um, in many areas, not the least of which is health care. Right now we know that workforce shortages are the most significant issue that is impacting our care sector, whether it be health care, aged care or disability right the way across the country. And it is hitting hardest in rural, regional and remote Australia. So what we are saying to this government is it is absolutely essential that you address the cause of the problem. We need some urgency put into addressing the, the workforce shortages that we're seeing because we know that unless we deal with the issue of workforce shortages, we are not going to be able to deal with many of the other issues that are currently before our health system. Um, and to that end, it was extraordinarily distressing uh, to find out that whether by, um, by design or, whether in, or by incompetence that the Minister for Immigration um, failed to list the 887 skilled regional migration visas on the priority list. Um, we welcomed the government's decision to prioritise, as we had, um, healthcare workers, whether they be doctors, whether they be nurses, whether they be care workers and education workers, most predominantly teachers, when they chose to fast-track the visa applications of these people coming into the country, because we knew that we had challenges as a result of COVID, because, of course, um, we didn't have migration for a, a, a many, many months, in fact, for a couple of years, and so we welcomed the fast-tracking of these visa applications. But to then find that, by, as I say, by 
by uh, accident or by design that 887 regional skilled visas were excluded from the priority list, um, basically relegating um, doctors, nurses and teachers and care workers who would otherwise have chosen to go to rural and regional and remote Australia to undertake their caring responsibilities. They have been put to the bottom of the visa pile. I know in my own hometown I had many representations from people in my community who are frustrated by the fact that it is like taking on average 27 months to be able to get access uh, and approval process through for an 887 visa. I mean, this is absolutely unacceptable that this government should have relegated rural regional Australia to the bottom of the pile when we know that it is rural regional and remote Australia that is often most hardly hit when it comes to these sorts of services. But it hasn't just been in my hometown of, uh, um, or home area of the Riverland. I mean, I've spoken right the way across the country and spoken to doctors, spoken to nurses, spoken to um, health institutions, only to hear the same story over and over and over again, that rural, regional or remote Australia are ignored, they're treated as the poor cousin, and we do need to make sure that we have got the appropriate incentives so that equity of health care is something that all Australians can actually rely on instead of just talking about it. Um, and so that's why we're saying the government really needs to come up with real solutions, real and tangible measures that will deal with workforce crisis so that we can see the whole of our care sector being able to be adequately supported. Because right now all we're seeing is that all of the healthcare workers in rural, regional, remote Australia are being sucked into the city because of greater ability of those institutions to be able to afford it and measures that have been put in place by this government that are actually encouraging those people that are currently in rural and regional Australia to move into city areas. Um, and this is not just rural, regional or remote when we think we're talking about you know, small towns and small communities very far away from capital cities, which of course are being most hardly hit. It is even applying to places like Geelong. We've seen just in the last few weeks uh, an announcement by the Epworth Private Hospital in Geelong that it is intending to close its maternity services in March. And the reason that they have stated is workforce shortages. And despite the fact that we have got a massive hospital, a hospital that was um, delivering five to six hundred babies a year, is, has made the decision to it can no longer safely deliver its maternity services because it cannot get access to workforce, is a very sad reflection that despite this government coming into a government on the promise that it was going to support workforce, it was going to deal with the issues that we all knew that COVID had delivered our health care sector, they were going to um, assist. We have seen nothing when it comes to addressing the workforce challenges, and we have a massive glaring example of that uh, in Victoria with the Epworth Hospital's recent decision. But, um, we need to also understand that there are other measures that can assist rural and regional Australia um, in dealing with the challenges before us, and another one of those is telehealth. We saw this government rip 70 telehealth services out of the um, Medicare support network, uh, and we're fearful that there is um, possibly um, moves afoot that more telehealth services will be removed from the, uh, the, the Medicare rebate or the MBS system. Because we know that it's people who live in rural, regional and remote Australia who are more likely um, to be accessing telehealth simply because they either can't get into a doctor because of the massive workforce shortages or they live so far away from where a doctor is that sometimes the only opportunity for them to be able to get access to healthcare is over the phone. So I think we need to start um, changing the way we are looking at addressing some of these challenges and stop admiring the problems, stop talking it down, stop uh, talking about the negatives of the situation. Eight and a half months into government, we'd like to see the government actually putting some real measures on the table. Um, actually deliver on your urgent care clinics. Don't come in here and keep talking about your urgent care clinics. Actually deliver them. And we know that some three months out from the date that this government promised that we would have urgent care clinics up and running by the middle of May, that not one urgent care clinic is up and running, and all we have is seven ex um, clinics with expressions of interest out. We don't know where they're going to be. Um, and um, you know, equally, um, you know, we've seen just measure after measure after measure, promise after promise after promise, um, not delivered. Went to the election to strengthen Medicare, Medicare's weakened. Went to the election promising to put care back into aged care, 
the aged care sector is in crisis at the moment because of the undeliverable mandated requirements of those opposite. Of course we want to see um, our aged care facilities have, provide the best possible care for our older Australians, but you can't mandate the impossible. You can't mandate the impossible, right. and that's exactly what you've done. And you will see rural, regional and remote nursing homes closed because they right. just won't be able to meet Over these requirements. Yep. And so what are you going to say going? to those older Australians who will either have to move hundreds of miles away from their loved ones because you have mandated a requirement that is impossible to deliver? But as I said, the greatest challenge before us is workforce. The greatest challenge is to put that confidence of Australians back into general practice, neither of which have been done by this government. In fact, the exact opposite has occurred. No issues to address workforce, issues that have actually had a detrimental effect on rural and regional Australian health workforce through the changes to DPA and the refusal to accept 887 visas as being a priority class. But at the same time, we have a minister that constantly talks about all of the negatives in the health system, always saying that there's a crisis, always saying there's a problem, admiring the problem day in, day out, day in, day out, doing nothing to support our GPs. We have not seen him say a word about the fact that the states and territories have been threatening to add a greater payroll burden on our general practice clinics right at a time when there is a crisis. We're seeing bulk billing rates falling like flies. Um, you know, we've seen a massive drop in bulk billing rates. And yet what this minister has done is actually do nothing apart from to reduce the level of confidence that we have, uh, that, that, that GPs have, that this government is actually going to do anything about it. And we'd certainly say to the state and territory governments, have a serious think about the decisions that you may be making in relation to enforcing a payroll tax, an additional financial burden on general practice right at a time when they need our help and they need our, uh, our understanding to make sure that we are able to build confidence back up in our health care system and particularly into to general practice. And I, I want to shout out, I mean, we've heard so much um, about the negativity of general practice, but I want to shout out to our general practitioners who on the whole are the most amazing, hardworking, frontline people. They are the people that are the absolute the centre of our care in Australia. And if we don't have a strong general practice um, um, sector in this country, our health sector is in big trouble. So we need to address the issues that are the ones that are most burning at the moment. We need to address the issues that are fundamental, that are the cause of the problems that are facing our health care sector. They are workforce and they are confidence in general practice. And so as we stand here today, we know that rural, regional and remote Australia is the place where these issues are felt the most. We know from the, the, um, the motion moved by Senator Waters uh, that women who live in rural, regional and remote Australia often have some of the poorer health outcomes and they are, um, have some of the, the lowest quality care um, because of an inability to be able to access maternity, paediatric uh, and um, obstetric services. So uh, it is very sad that we should be here today debating um, this particular motion. Um, but I commend Senator Waters for raising the issue of rural, regional and remote access to health care uh, and certainly want to put Thank on the record my Senator Rustin. Uh, Senator Norman Payne. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I want to highlight the experiences of some of the expectant mothers in my community who have shared their stories. I'm currently 23 weeks pregnant with my fourth child. All three of my kids were born in Gladstone, my last being only nine months old, born in April 2022. The situation we currently face of not having a place to birth here in town worries me every day. I have three kids to think about as well as my health and my baby's health when it comes time to give birth. I have quick labours of around one to two hours, so a trip to Rockhampton isn't an option for me. Neither is staying there weeks before my due date as I have no help to get my kids to school and watched while I may need to be gone. The cost of having to stay in some hotel and the stress of not being in your own home at 38 weeks pregnant is daunting. Birth is already such an uncertain and unplanned thing, so having this major uncertainty about where I can birth is keeping me up at night. Another person said, the bypass hasn't just been hard on expecting mothers, it's also hard on partners as well, watching and listening to the extra stress and worry who are about to take on one of the hardest challenges the human body will go through. They shouldn't have to worry about whether they're going to make the one and a half hour drive to another town to give birth. 
Gladstone is an industrious town where a lot of the population work long hours, some working more than 12 hours a day in hot and physical jobs. These people are then asked to drive their labouring partner over an hour on a road that is always littered with potholes and rough bitumen. This is unsafe and dangerous. Even with an ambulance transfer, the partners still have to drive themselves or risk not being able to support their partner and missing this precious moment. Things need to change, things need to happen, and it needs to be sooner rather than later. Thank you, Senator Ormond Payne. <clears throat> I propose that the Senate now adjourn and I call Senator Grogan. Thank you, President. Um, I rise today to speak on the recent cost of living hearings uh, that myself and my colleague Senator Stewart uh, from this side of the chamber participated in. We heard a lot through those three days of what Australians already know. Inflationary pressures from external global factors, a decade of policy and action are making household budgets tighter and placing pressure on people in this country to afford the basics. We heard about the effects of wage stagnation, the importance of the Labor government's plan to provide savings for households in the long run. We also heard from industry and the community about various aspects of the Albanese Labor government's policy agenda that will provide a positive plan to reduce the cost of living. Our comprehensive and proactive policy approach on energy, on climate, on sustainability will reduce cost of living pressures and it will ensure savings for Australian households. The current cost of living crisis reveals the consequences not just of global factors but also the, the former government's decade-long neglect of effective climate and energy policy, not to mention their failure on housing, and the audacity to try and blame an eight-month-old government for a lack of housing supply is mind-boggling. Housing supply takes a lot longer than eight months. Australian families have been left to deal with this and the consequences of 22 failed energy policy by those opposite. The environment has also been left to suffer by the former government's failure to reduce emissions. My colleagues and I on this side of the chamber will not leave Australian families behind. We will deliver an ambitious climate and energy policy. We will build the housing of the future and we will ensure that Australia is recognised as a world leader. Our plan will also facilitate a secure and resilient economy to ensure that Australian families are not left to deal with the consequences of this cost of living crisis into the future. We will have a plan, a plan that is transparent, that is clear and that supports those in need. Our policy agenda, agenda, which includes the climate change bill which was passed in this chamber last year, puts Australia back on track to net zero for 2050. And what does that do? That opens up investment. It gives us opportunities. It gives us a way forward into the future so we're not left behind as a laggard on the international stage. Our plan also includes a $20 billion investment in upgrading and expanding Australia's energy grid, unlocking new renewables, increasing the security of the grid and driving down power prices for Australian households. I spoke to the Whaler Council this afternoon about the abundance of clean energy and hydrogen opportunities in that region and the significant interest that they are hearing from investors to build that region into a region for the future, to provide more jobs, provide better housing, more available housing, <laughs> to help them build their future in that region. But the opposition continues to oppose investments into renewables, despite the evidence from experts such as the Energy Consumers Australia, the Australian Energy Market Operator and the CSIRO, that renewables are the cheapest form of energy. At the recent cost of living hearings, again, we heard from the Energy Consumers Policy Director, Jacqueline Crawshaw, who highlighted the need for a balanced approach that addresses both clean energy and affordability. Yet we hear from those opposite that they want to invest in nuclear, nuclear power, which is evidenced by CSIRO as the most 
expensive form of power. And if we go to the most expensive form of power, we naturally go to the point where we say, well, that's got to be the most expensive when it is then passed on, the costs are passed down to householders. That is not a complicated pathway to follow. You invest in the most expensive energy, you will get the most expensive power bills. You invest in cheaper energy, in the energy that we know and that the evidence shows us is cheaper, you will get cheaper power bills. It's not that complicated. So, and the abundance of jobs that we will get with these investments. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Your time has expired, Senator Hume. Thank you, uh, Madam President. This year, indeed, will be a tough for many, many Australian households. Earlier this week, the Reserve Bank raised interest rates for the ninth consecutive month, taking interest rates to their highest level since September 2012. And the RBA has signalled that there's still more to come. And I quote. The board expects that further increases in interest rates will be needed over the months ahead to ensure that inflation returns to target. Now, why does the RBA hold these expectations? Because there is no economic plan in sight from the Albanese government to get inflation under control. Just yesterday morning, the Treasurer said that it is the job of the RBA to get on top of this inflation challenge and that it was his job to do what he could to take some of the pressure off around the country for people who are doing it tough. Well, that must be news to the Minister for Finance, who said on Tuesday that dealing with inflation was in fact the defining economic challenge facing the country. We have been very clear about that, she said. It's alarming that uh, no one's told the Treasurer that his job is actually to do both. He needs to deliver an economic plan to deal with inflation and address the cost of living crisis. He's in government. He needs to act like it. The Treasurer is responsible for fiscal policy. The RBA is responsible for monetary policy. But both are needed to ensure that we tackle inflation and keep the impact to a minimum. Right now, only the RBA is using its levers. Treasurer Chalmers thinks that it's all right to leave the RBA to do all of that heavy lifting, leaving Australian mortgage holders to bear the brunt of this Labor government's inaction on inflation. At the Cost of Living Committee last week, we heard that 800,000 mortgages will come off fixed rates in 2023. Now, that's up to 800,000 households who are going to be feeling even more pressure on their budgets at the same time that they're dealing with higher grocery prices and higher energy prices. The main takeaway from those hearings was that higher prices and higher mortgages are leaving Australian families struggling to put food on the table. Mr Tony Burke said on the June 15 last year that people will be seeing in their bank accounts what the change of government means. Well, he certainly, he certainly was right, because Labor's cost of living crisis is very real. The Salvation Army said that one third of people that are walking through their doors name the cost of living as why they need help. As a result of the increased demand from charities, Woolworths have increased their food donations by 20 per cent. And the Australian Energy Regulator revealed that there has been a 12 per cent increase in people struggling to pay their power bills. So Australians are crying out for their government to help them with the impact of inflation, with rising interest rates and with rising energy prices. This was a government that was elected on the basis of promises around the cost of living for Australians. And on 97 times, 97 occasions, they promised a $275 reduction in electricity bills. Well, now no one from Labor will even say the words $275. And last week, the Cost of Living Committee heard that it would be impossible for Labor to deliver on its $275 promise. Not only that, but that Australians will be paying higher electricity prices this year. The energy regulators on top of that confirmed that prices would increase not just throughout this year, despite Labor's proposed response, their ham-fisted market intervention, but they would also discourage long-term investment, meaning less supply and even higher prices in the long term. 
We need to have a government that's focused on managing fiscal policy so that Reserve Bank doesn't have to do all that heavy lifting. In January, the Prime Minister said, my New Year's resolution is to continue to deal with cost of living pressures. Well, Prime Minister, it's February and uh, you haven't, you've failed. There's nothing has been done. You haven't got an economic plan for the 800,000 households who will see higher mortgages. You haven't got an economic plan for the millions of families who will pay more to keep the lights on. You haven't got an economic plan for the Australians who are struggling to put food on the table tonight because they can't afford it. But worst of all, you failed because you and your treasurer are not doing your jobs. You're not doing your jobs to tackle inflation. You're not doing your jobs to tackle the cost of living crisis. You're leaving it all to the RBA to do the heavy lifting, to raise interest rates, and you are doing nothing about it. This is a blight on your government, and it's time to step up and do the right thing with fiscal policy, not just leave it to the RBA. Thank you, Senator Hume. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you. Uh, in less than an hour's time, the new NRL pre-season kicks off with the Warriors playing the Tigers in Auckland. Around Australia, and especially in my old neck of the woods in the Southern Shire, rugby league is a massive part of people's lives. For those who don't know, NRL players, through their union, are currently negotiating with the NRL for a new collective bargaining agreement. This happens every five years. Everyone sits down and negotiates the salary cap, the minimum wage and the support funds for injured and retired players. It's just like the enterprise bargaining that takes place in workplaces around Australia every day. But what isn't normal and what we should never accept in any workplace is the NRL secretly recording conversations between players. Last Friday, an NRL official was caught secretly recording a conversation between players, their union and NRL CEO Andrew Abdode. As the Rugby League Players Association said in the letter to the NRL, the deliberate and covert nature of the recording is breathtaking. It is immoral, unethical and illegal." End quote. These are the sort of tactics that Amazon uses to intimidate their workers and to target anyone speaking out about working together on workplace issues. Amazon monitors their workers every second that they are at work, including how long they spend in the bathrooms, including who they meet with and what they talk about in the break rooms, and even what they say on their private social media accounts. We don't need companies importing Amazon surveillance tactics here in Australia especially a national institution like the NRL. I also want to speak in support of what the players and the players' union are actually fighting for in these negotiations. Some have dismissed this dispute as being about highly paid footy players wanting more money. But what it's really about is safety. It's about fairness. And to quote Canberra Raiders prop Joseph Tarpini, it's just about having a voice at the table and actually having a say. We just want our voices heard because we are a big part of the NRL brand. We just want a seat at the table." End quote. What Joseph is talking about there is that players should be consulted when the NRL changes their employment conditions during the course of this five-year agreement. Sounds pretty reasonable to me for any worker in Australia to have that right. The players and their union also want increased support for players dealing with injuries after they retire. The average first grader career lasts just 45 games. As Raiders prop Josh Papali says, said, we sacrifice our bodies to entertain the public. It's a short career and most players have to go to work after it. And they're going to have to work with injuries that were caused by playing footy. Now again, it sounds pretty reasonable for the NRL to look after the people who actually play the game. And last, but certainly not least, the men's players are standing in solidarity with female players in the NRLW. Unlike the men's game, the NRLW does not have a collective bargaining agreement, which means they've got no security about their pay or conditions whatsoever. The players and the union are demanding that the women get their own agreement, which would include the first pregnancy and parental leave policy in the rugby league. 
And to quote Melbourne Storm prop Christian Welch, I'm really passionate about improving the conditions of players and not just the men but the women. And at the moment, they can't sign contracts, they're not training. They're really in limbo, to be honest. It's hard for them to take action, so a part of our unity, the men stand, need to stand up. And that's what they're doing. I want to commend the NRL players standing in solidarity with NRLW players. It's about more than entertainment. It's about being a good sport. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Polly. I rise to speak about secure jobs and the strong economy the government is focused on nurturing because we know strong jobs growth helps Australians to manage the cost of living. The Albanese government is putting jobs and skills at the top of the government's agenda because we know the importance of a job to every individual. Because of the federal election, Labor committed uh, establishment of the Jobs and Skills Australia in its first 100 days because we know how important it is in building our economy and it will inform and drive policy on skills and labour shortages. It will boost national productivity and get wages moving. Migration will play an important role in filling some of the skills gaps, but we must ensure all Australians have the skills to be able to apply for the jobs and vacancies now and into the future. Government must be informed by the sectors which drive our economy and our country's productivity and prosperity. And I am in contact with local businesses, understanding their work shortages and the business capacity and their annual turnover. There is a consensus that you need synergy between education outcomes and job vacancies because graduates are not graduating necessarily with the correct skills for the job vacancies within the community. Government must take the concerns and aspirations of business seriously. This is why the Albanese government is continuing the government's commitment to consultation. Jobs and Skills Australia will provide independent advice on a range of current and emerging future workforce skills and training issues. Its advice to the government will help inform the policies and programs that ensure Australians' training systems deliver the skills and the workforce for the industries that are needed to ensure the growth and the prosperity within the Australian economy. Job security is number one. Without job security, people can't apply for home loans. They can't get a car loan. So we know the value of having a job and a secure jobs. Jobs and Skills Australia will also play an important role in helping to strengthen Australia's economy. It will deliver this by leading research and analysis, undertaking workforce forecasting and analysis, and preparing capacity studies for the emerging and growing industries. This will provide a greater understanding of the current uh, emerging and future Australian workforce skill needs in order to strengthen Australian skills and the system policies and program settings. So vitally important. After nearly a decade of inaction under the previous government, made worse by the decision to abandon migrant workers during the pandemic lockdowns, it, will, it is so vital we get a better understanding of the skills that we need now and into the future to drive the national skills policy. The Albanese government has a clear agenda to create secure local jobs, bringing manufacturing back to our shores, ensuring we have enough jobs and we have the skills to ensure the growth of our economy. It is so vitally important to my home state of Tasmania. That's why the Albanese government is committed to Tasmanians' interest in ensuring that we have the skills and the opportunities to fulfil the workplace and the work shortages and the opportunities for the future. Investing in jobs and skills, investing in tourism infrastructure, investing in our agriculture industry, our agriculture and our food bowl. These are so critical to my home state, ensuring every Tasmania has the opportunity to secure a well-paid job that they can rely on. 
to ensure access to better health care that they need. Labor will never leave any Australians on their own without ensuring that we do everything possible to make sure we have a strong economy, that we skill and we educate the workforces uh, for the future. That's why we're investing in TAFE. Unlike those opposite, we value TAFE, we value the skills that they provide to our economy, we support our university sector, but we have to give people opportunities. A job, a secure job with well-trained workforce will improve productivity and the outcomes for the Australian economy will be Thank so you, much Polly, better. Thank you, Senator time has expired. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday, the 6th of March at 10 a.m. I know. I take no prisoners, Jean. You know that.